Story number one, Against the Odds, written by a glass of whiskey. The Acnics attacked. We had the south and they had the north part of the hemisphere, as this godforsaken rock. Apparently, they were not happy with this arrangement and had carefully weighed the pros and cons of the ten times larger garrison before deciding to move in and take our largest board. Our one and only hope was the alliance of the humans. A full army, or perhaps a special squad of supermarines, had been requested, and the humans had responded. They had sent one man. He looked as if he was about to collapse at any moment, and as old as time itself. Right, I am assuming command. His voice hit like a sledgehammer. The man must be all lungs, judging by his voice. Move out immediately. We are going to attack the enemy. Ah, the human had sent a commander. He thought to himself, and he started to prepare for moving out. His body continued with the preparations as his thoughts tried to catch up to it. Attack the enemy, are we? Outnumbered ten to one. Just going to drive out and say hi to the fortified enemy position. His brain had mixed feelings about this. His body had strong feelings about this. It felt that whatever happened, it did not want to get screamed in the face by the new commander and carried on with his tasks. The sheer chalk of the command seemed to have had a similar effect on everyone else, as they were now mostly ready except for the supplies that had always took a bit longer. Leave them! He heard the new commander shout. We will just use the enemy supplies instead! Ah, thought to himself, going to attack the enemy that outnumbers us and is fortified, but now without such things as extra bullets or food... Wonderful. There were not a well-equipped garrison. Transport vehicles, but not much else, drove out to begin the journey. Snow was beginning to fall and glimmered in the morning light. It was quite far to the port, and even at full speed would take almost a day. He wondered what the plan was. Sneaking in and attacking at dawn, perhaps. Or more likely, the commander had some secret weapon he hadn't shown. Some new death beam. He thoughts continued in the fashion for most of the journey, except for the occasional breaks to refuel the vehicles, with what little fuel they had without the extra supplies. As they started to get closer, his thoughts became more and more imaginative. He had just embarked on this idea of a stealth super dreadnought descending from orbit and blasting the Atnix into bits, and they were there just to witness and didn't need to do anything. When he started to hear orders getting out, there couldn't be much gas left. One of them must have run out, he thought to himself. The earlier light snowfall had developed into a full-on snowstorm. Blistering wind and snow kept visibility to a minimum. Yet, he could hear the commander shout orders, Right! Dismount! We're continuing on foot! Of course they were. Just what he had hoped for. As they pulsed through the now thick snow against the wind, his fantastical thoughts started to fall to bits, and he wondered more and more if he was just walking to his death. What was actually the plan? They continued on, although no word of a plan reached his ears, even as they now must be getting very close to the Acnics. What would happen? Some other people were also deep in thought. The Acnic scouts had found that the entire enemy force had moved dangerously close, apparently to attack them. Close scrutiny had showed that they had not received seemingly any reinforcements from the humans. General alarm was sound, and men filled the trenches preparing for an unlikely attack. While confused, commanders desperately tried to make sense of it all. For the young officer on the other side, things were no less confusing. The enemy had discovered them. No more sneak attack if that were ever the plan. The human commander just looked into the snow-filled wind with a strange face and bellowed out an order. Right! Prepare for attack! He could only just look at him in stunned disbelief. This was the plan, was it? For once, his head won over his body and his lips moved to speak his words. Commander! Commander! He shouted to get his attention. Yes, what is it? Uh, this can't be right. Are we just supposed to charge them straight on? That's correct! Uh, um, but... Huh? So, we're going to charge them, are we? During a snowstorm, and an enemy that outnumber us ten to one. 
is dug in and fortified, and that knows where we are here. Oh, also, we are without vehicles, extra ammunition, and food. Don't worry! Oh, good. He had some kind of top secret plan. Perhaps some hidden tech. That hidden dread. They got all the vehicles, ammunition, and food we need, he said, and pointed in the direction of the enemy held port. At this, he turned around and continued to watch the snow filled wind with interest. Right. Desertion it is then. He just had to walk through the blizzard to the vehicles without gas, then continue to walk all the way to base. That took almost a day at full speed with vehicles, without food. Right. Perhaps the commander had a point with what the port had everything they needed. A shame, really, that it also happened to be where the enemy troops were. But how, how are we going to be able to see who is a friend and who is an enemy? He was grasping at straws here. But when all you have is strolls, you make a straw man. Oh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Ah, another don't worry answer. When there seemingly was so much to be worried about. Remember, they outnumber us ten to one, so odds of it being an enemy is about ten to eleven. At this, the commander smiled at his own unfunny joke. Enough of the chit-chat. The preparations are ready. He could see the chest build up like a balloon as the commander prepared to shout with every fiber, speaking, CHARGE! And that, that, the commander disappeared forward into the snow. Well, here goes nothing. He could see expressions similar to his own thoughts on the men running forward closest to him. Thankfully, the wind had turned so the snow didn't blow directly into his face. At the very moment, he thought, here it comes, the explosions, dying. But nothing happened. They continued forward until they could literally see the enemy trenches, despite the dwindling light and snow. As they opened fire at close point by that range and rushed into the trenches, he could only see confusion and shock and how his now dead enemy eyes. Trench after trench was taken in the same fashion as the first. Stunned soldiers who had most managed to shoot a bit into the blinding blizzard before being overwhelmed. It wasn't long before they were at the port itself and had apparently been taken already when he arrived there. Prisoners of war had been herded into the corner of the large hangar bay, and the old human commander stood on a box in the middle. It looked like almost everyone was here. Their losses must have been minimal. And that is how you dance the tango! The commander smiled at his own unfunny joke. But this time, he smiled with him. He was alive. They had taken the port against all odds. Nothing could stop them now. End of story. Story number two. It's in the name, written by Hidden Fox. The sound of whirring motors and hissing pneumatics could barely be heard over the roar of the engines. Then suddenly, silence. The dropship roared out of the ship into dead silence of space. All right, you've all heard the brief. Remember, this is a Class H genocidal movement of the xenophobic superiority class we cannot, said Brenda. We don't have that option. Jack Corey surveyed his troops. The six-pointed star under the core banner stood out in the stark light of the dropship. Jack Stephen was met with a grim acceptance. The soldiers in the dropship all knew the dangers of the core when they signed up. But they knew why. The stereotype of the core being mainly human would be both right and wrong. Historically, the core was made up of almost only humans. Of course, that was when no one really knew about the core. Awareness of the core grew after their response to an attempted coup that threw an entire planet into civil war. Taking down the rebels, addressing the major issues, and repairing the majority of the planet's infrastructure before leaving put the core on the radar. But stopping a terrorist attack on the capital station of Kahar, that skyrocketed them to galaxy-wide fame when it was broadcast live. Nowadays, non-human species were plentiful among the core. Humans were still a large part of the core, but that was mainly due to the long history with it. To list the sentient species that had members in the core would take a long time. In fact, it would be easier to write a list of every sentient species that didn't have a member, and that would be a waste of paper, because the list would be empty. Every sentient species had members in the core, and even a few non-sentient species were a part of the core. The dropship breached the upper atmosphere of the target planet, screaming through the thickening atmosphere. Hundreds 
a dropship swallow. Strapped in, Jack made sure his soldiers were too. From the pack hunters of the Fenishi to the plant-like Romo, they were all had grim determination on their faces or face analogues. The dropship bucked and twisted as it maneuvered to avoid incoming anti-air ordnance. It deployed flares and countermeasures after. The ground attack fighters rushed past, charging with impulsive determination to destroy their targets. They loosed missile after missile, firing molten plasma from their nose-mounted weapons. Orbital bombardment streaked through the air at the edges of the formation, precisely destroying important assets. The dropship began to pull up, the force being exerted on the crew inside. It soared the last few kilometers to the dropship. The soldiers inside began to unstrap themselves from the ship. As they primed their weapons, flicking off the safeties, the dropship began to slow. The rear door slid open, hovering a few feet above the ground. The soldiers could see countless other dropships doing the same. Jack was the first to jump out. The first galactic peacekeeping call boots hit the ground, ready to do their duty. After all, it's in the name. End of story. Story number one. They counsel me. They understand. Written by Echoing Cascade. Captain Solomon was watching a movie with the Colin delegation. And as the credits began to roll, he dreaded the inevitable deluge questions that would follow. If I get my hands on the numbskull who perfect memento of all things to show the aliens, I'm gonna kill him. Slowly. Selene of the floating clouds approached the human captain, head tilted and right index finger under her blue head. I wonder what she's going to ask first, about the fact the movie is shown out of order, the fact that the main character can't retain information, how he tells his own story without knowing it's about him. Selene, why did no one try to exercise the man with the deficient memory? Okay, what the hell? Captain Sullivan raised a hand and opened his mouth, just to close it right away, words fading him. Sullivan, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, what? The man kept hearing the demon's voice in his head when trying to figure things out. The captain's confusion increased. What is she talking about? Wait, she couldn't mean... Do you mean his inner monologue when he heard his own voice in his head? Selene. The captain relaxed. Oh, that's normal. That's just the voice you hear in your head when thinking. Selene looked rather worried and took a few steps away from the captain. Do you have such a voice in your head? Yes. Selene lifted her hand and her bodyguards grabbed the captain by the arms. I have the rituals for exorcism. We will require half of one of your hours and an empty room. The crew watching the scene went from snickering at the discomfort of the captain to getting ready for a fight. The captain tried to defuse the strange situation. What does this exorcism entail? A series of chants followed by a hymn that must be performed live. The captain gave his crew a look that screamed, I'll be fine, let's humor them. And the crew sat down, still worried, but they had their orders. Half an hour later, the captain left the cargo room and had been hastily repurposed by the colon for the impromptu exorcism. Annie, the captain's second in command, was waiting outside the room, and when the door opened, what she saw worried her. Captain Solomon walked out in a daze, his eyes unfocused. What the hell happened to him? What did you do? She moved to grab Celine, but the captain snapped out of the fast enough to stop her. It's okay. I'm okay, or I will be, I, I think. Maybe. Sir, what happened? Are you sure you're okay? I, I... I can't hear it anymore. Hear what, sir? She had an idea of what he meant, but she couldn't bring herself to say it out loud. The, the voice in my head. When I think now, it's like a series of slides or scrolling text in my head. It's strange, but it feels right, you know. Ambassador Selene, is he all right? Selene nodded solemnly. We excised the demon that had been subtly twisting his thoughts. Annie looked at her captain, who was looking more and more like his old self with every passing second. 
Salik continued. These entities are parasites that enjoy inflicting pain, real or imagined on sentient beings. The ritual to erase them is well known to our people. Hearing voices in your head, especially your own, is a clear sign of possession. Annie's mind was a mess. Nothing she had heard in the last few minutes made any sort of sense. It's BS! She's obviously lying! Kill her! She pushed the thought aside with some effort and spoke. But all humans have an inner monologue. Celine looked shocked and her bodyguards moved between her and Annie. Annie stepped back, her mind racing. This can't be right. She messed with the captain's mind. She's trying to mess with mine. I have to kill them now. Annie shook her head. Are you saying that our entire species is possessed? I am afraid so, yes. Annie looked at the captain, who shrugged, and looked at her with a yeah, seems like it, at which point the human race was as a whole heard the same thing. Crap! They found out! Beckett, all know what to do! The rituals to rid humanity of their demons took years to complete. Reaching all individuals was an arduous task, but the Kurlon were more than happy to help, and those who had been freed joined them after noticing their mental health greatly improving. But the biggest hurdle was what was heard in the mind of all humans still possessed. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. Never gonna make you cry. Never gonna say goodbye. Never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. Over and over again. Until freed from their demons. End of story. Story number two. I'd Rather Die. Written by Tyler of Tall Tales. I'd rather die than do nothing to help. A single statement as he disappeared into the sprinting, screaming crowd. My heart shattered into a million pieces when they wheeled his burnt and bloodied body from the boat on a stretcher. Have you ever been in love? No. Not the kind that makes you feel incense in your stomach. The kind that sends lightning through your bones and makes your heart beat like thunder. I was once with a stupid human. A beautiful, brave, stupid human. I could never forget him. Couldn't forget the way his platinum white hair flowed in the strong breeze. His eyes so full of that manic spark that made him love everyone so much more than he loved himself. You always think that you're safe when you're at a shop center. There's security everywhere you look, a menagerie of different species all milling around in a soft breeze. All it takes to disturb that is a single blaster shot. I didn't know what that was at first, but when I saw the look on James's face, I realized. James ran with me until we got outside the center. Then amongst the Russian crowd, he stopped. He turned, holding both my hands and looking softly into my eyes. I have to go back. I've got to stop them before they hurt any more people. I almost screamed my refusal. You're going to get yourself killed. Someone else will. There was a look in his eyes. One I only saw when he had those awful nightmares that made him wake up screaming and tearing at the sheets. He leaned in gently and pressed his lips on the tip of my beak, drawing me in for a hug as he whispered into my ear. I'd... Rather die, than do nothing to help. Then, like that, he let go of me and disappeared against the flow of the crowd, fought against the flow trying to follow him. But eventually, I let myself be carried away by the rest. Now, as I watch the news, they praise him as a hero. The footage from inside the mall played on loop. A full minute of heroism. I couldn't peel my blotchy eyes away as I sat on the couch in our home. His jacket around my shoulders like a ghostly hug. James burst into view in the main atrium. A dozen beings bound and held captive by four towering masked cloaked figures. There was a broken mop handle in his hands. The jagged broken end leveled at the closest masked figure's chest. He ran the being through with a yell, catching them by surprise he wrenched the mop handle free, greenish viscera, coating the jacket. 
The surprise didn't last long as the other three attacked him, two with the threatening-looking jagged blades, the third raised their laser rifle a few paces from James. Face, a death mask of calm, James took a bright blue bolt of light to the chest, flesh searing as he stabbed one of his blade-wielding assailants through the neck, kicking the other out of the back as he struggled to free the makeshift spear. The blaster bolt seared across his face, making him fall to his knees, clutching his burnt face. His knife-wielding assailant lunged on top of him, driving the blade deep between his ribs. James cried out in pain, hands scrabbling for something on the ground as his knife-wielding assailant pulled the knife out, aiming for another stab. James's hand swept up, jagged knife in hand. He drove it into the assailant's neck. Purple blood splattered his face as he kicked them away. Standing, he took a searing ball to the knee and stumbled. He fell to one knee as his master assailant stepped forward, pressing the muzzle of the laser rifle against James's face. A flash of rage crossed the unburned half of the face, and he lunged, grabbing and ripping the rifle from the masked being's hands before swinging it like a club and striking the last masked being over the head. The last assailant crumbled. James looked around at the hostages who stared at him like a monster. Hobbling to the nearest one, he cut the bonds holding their hands before passing them the jagged knife. He stumbled. Then he fell, tumbling onto his side. His eyes staring unseeingly as the freed hostage began freeing the others. I laid down and rolled over as the footage looped again. I couldn't watch him die anymore. I pulled his jacket tighter around me, and for a moment, I could feel his warmth arms around my shoulders again, hear him telling me it'll be all right, that he'd rather die than let anyone hurt me or some innocent bystander. It only made my broken heart crack a little more, knowing how much he meant by it. End of story. Tour de Dana, written by Old Phil. Major Henry looked at his terrified crew on the den and told them all quite forcibly to be quiet as he made what he hoped wouldn't be his final transmission. NASA Control, repeating situation, this is the den. A small asteroid has damaged the ship. We are venting atmosphere and have less than half an hour of oxygen remaining. This transmission will not reach you until we are dead. The crew and I have decided to attempt to use the engine from the experimental FTL probe to try and warp back to Earth. Engineer Yates believes there is a chance the probe's engine can get the ship close enough that the ISS could reach us in time to effect a spacewalk rescue. If the warp attempt is successful, we will be radioing the ISS directly soon, before this transmission reaches you. On behalf of the crew, please tell our families that we love. Engaging warp probe engine in one minute. Ending transmission. Henry turned to the scared crew and nodded. All right, let's go home. Fire up the engine, Yates. The engineer's eyes looked wild and scared as he finished the last check on the calculations at work and hit the button to fire up the FTL engine. It hadn't ever been tested properly. This mission's whole purpose was to fly out of Earth's gravitational influence and see if NASA's theoretical FTL engine could warp the released probe to Mars in what should be effectively instantaneous travel. The engine spun up and the crew double-checked their suits, prepared for the rescue. The countdown hit zero and the crew braced. There was a flash and then a moment of darkness. Captain, we are ready to begin the next attempt the young scientist stated. The captain, bored of the constant failures and not expecting much difference this time, grunted his acknowledgement as the young scientist engaged a program to project the space-time distortion. There was a bright flash off the bow of the large research vessel, and there it was, the dad, in one piece, still wildly venting atmosphere. They stared at the ship, now floating beside the vessel in shock. Then everyone stood up at once and started cheering. 
Captain, we got them. Scans show they are alive. And the captain shut his mouth slowly, awestruck by the momentous occasion, and recovered his composure. Get that ship to the bay now. We have guests to greet. Medical and security teams, you're with me. The captain rushed from the bridge towards the docking bay with a wake of far more people than he invited following him, as the tractor beam brought the Danu safely aboard the large vessel. Their vision and hearing came back as their heads swam. Major Henry looked around at his crew and the perplexed engineers staring out the window. Status Yates, can you see the ISS? Where are we? Well, did it, did it work? Yates never took his eyes off the portal, the window to space. As he slowly said, Uh, I don't, I don't think we're anywhere near the ISS, sir. Or, or Earth. What do you mean, Yates? What are you talking about? Major Henry unbuckled and glided over to the window beside the engineer. As the Major looked out the window, his jaw dropped too. Yates put his hands on Henry's shoulders and said, Three things I notice. The two big-ass stars over there lead me to believe that we're in another star system, and I'm pretty sure that that big-ass alien ship over there doesn't usually hang around Earth either. The whole crew rushed to look at the massive ship, clearly alien. A dull blue beam extended from the giant vessel and started dragging their ship, the Danu, towards them. A large hangar door opened on the side of the ship, as the Danu's crew could only watch, completely awestruck. Their ship was pulled into the hangar, and slowly, gravity was felt by the crew as they set their now weighted feet on the ground for the first time in months. Sir, I have a few more reasons to believe that we aren't anywhere near Earth. Yates pointed out another portal, where the Major saw a good twenty alien beings approaching Danu. Crew, I know you are scared, Hal. I'm terrified. But get on your game faces. We're about to make first contact with alien life. Let's make humanity proud. Henry opened the hatch and got a good look at the odd beings. They were surprisingly human-like, but certainly alien, with extra-large eyes, ears, and head. Their limbs were longer and stronger-looking, a little out of proportion, but they were all smiling in a very friendly way. Henry waved and slid out of the hatch, hoping that they were indeed friendly. The hatch to the Danu opened as the captain and his crew waited anxiously to greet the humans. The first human looked out, smiled, waved, and slid through the hatch to stand on the deck of the bay, and spoke. Hello! We are humans from the planet Earth. We are explorers seeking only peace and knowledge. The crew behind him exploded in cheers and shouts as the captain smiled at his crew and waved them to silence. You must be Major Henry. I am Captain Jacobson commander of the science vessel Arcades. Do any of your crew require medical attention? Major Henry shook his head. We are most excited to have you and your crew safely on board. Welcome back to space time. You must have many questions. Let's go to the conference room. We have a lot to talk about. The crew behind the captain cheered, shaking hands and hugging, stepping forward to greet the humans with excited handshakes. Everyone, Captain Jacobson shouted, Please let our honored guests through. If you will follow me, please, crew of the Danu. The captain walked out the bay into a hallway with the Danu's crew scrambling behind, asking questions excitedly. The alien captain led the Danu's crew into a small conference room and invited everyone to sit down. Now, captain, what is going on? Where are we? Can you help us get home? How do you speak perfect English? Major Henry asked without preamble. We were going to launch an experimental warp travel probe and... And had you used the probe's engine to try and save yourselves, yes. We are quite aware. We've been trying to rescue you for a long time, Major. A very long time. The alien captain took a deep breath and let out as a sad sounding sigh. Ah, your story is very well known. And I am afraid I must deliver you some news that you will find shocking. Your attempt to use the probe's engine to quickly return to Earth was not exactly successful, obviously. The probe's engine did successfully pull you out of a three-dimensional space, but your science's limited understanding of interdimensional travel meant that you were pulled out of time as well, with no way to return to it. The captain looked truly sad as he spoke to the crew of the Dan. 
You stopped existing in what you understand as space-time. You were lost. You were lost for a very long time, I'm afraid. The Danis crew all looked at each other in shock. What are you saying, Captain? You were the first humans to leave the three spatial dimension. Getting you back was thought impossible, and you were lost for all that time. We've never stopped trying, though, Major. I'm afraid you and your crew have been lost to time and space for 10,000 Earth years. Hold on. Are you telling us that everything we know, everyone we know, are... gone? Yes. My most sincere condolences and apologies. The technology to rescue you just simply didn't exist until now. We're all still quite surprised that it even worked, rescuing you. The alien captain waited in silence while the Danu's crew processed this. There was a long silence, lots of tears, and the Danu's crew realized their friends and family. Everything they knew died many millennia ago. The silence was broken by the Major. Who are you aliens? Friend to us humans, are you taking us to them? The alien captain looked sadly again as the Danu's crew. There haven't been any of what you'd call humans for nearly 8,000 years, Major. Your race died out. You are the only humans in the universe, and you are our race's ancestors. 9,000 years ago, humans began to edit their DNA as they expanded into the universe. Now, after the invention of the interdimensional drive, your ship helped to pioneer. They edited their DNA to force evolve themselves to survive on the planets and moons they colonize, and those colonizers ceased to be compatible with human DNA after only a few dozen generations. The subhuman races that now populate the universe are not even compatible with each other. We are as alien to each other as we are to you. We've never met any life form that didn't originate from Earth yet, but space is a very large place. My people and everyone on the ship live on our home planet Earth, and we are the closest to still being human-like. Even the humans on Earth chose to edit DNA to evolve. We made ourselves smarter, faster, stronger. Eventually, the original human race of Homo sapiens simply ceased to exist anymore. And I'm afraid due to their terraforming, Earth is no longer very habitable to your kind. So there's very really no much reason to go back there. You wouldn't recognize it anyway. The Danu's crew sat in silence for a few minutes before Henry said, Can, uh, can you give me and my crew a few moments alone? The not-so-alien after all, Captain nodded, and paused at the door before leaving to say, If you need anything, just call out. Know that you are heroes of legend to us, the pioneers of interdimensional travel. All this is thanks to you. You will be very welcome in the Universal Community. We also have many questions for you about ancient Earth. Crew, look, our mission failed. We have nothing and no one to go back to. We can probably live out their own lives on the vessels like this. Do the talk show circuits or whatever if they still have those. The crew all just stared at the hands as Henry spoke. This, this, this is all my fault. I'm so sorry. Yates started crying. If I hadn't done the stupid fecking idea, infect it all up. Uh, me, my wife, uh, everyone. Major Henry stood up angrily. You saved the lives of me and my crew, Yates. Don't you dare say anything like that again. You are a goddamn fecking hero in my book. Look, our mission is gone. But since I guess we're completely in charge of NASA now, being the last ones left, we can just make our own damn secondary mission. There's nothing holding us here. I say we keep exploring. Captain Jacobson brought the chief engineer with him per the request of the human crew, back into the conference room and greeted the humans with a smile. The world is out that your crew have been rescued. The entire universe is excited to see and meet real humans and the heroes of... The Major cut him off. We need you to help us fix our ship. We want to go back. Major, I understand your crew is upset, but you can't go back. Time is not something you can travel... You can only step outside of relative time for a while to effectively go forward. I know that, Captain, of course. When I was a kid, I knew that going from one place to another faster than light was impossible too. And yes, we do want to go back to our time. But I mean that we want to go back to where we were, 
frozen out of space and time. Say for another 10,000 years. Your descendants can get us back out again then, or whenever time travel is possible. My crew and I have decided unanimously. We apparently pioneered interdimensional travel. Why shouldn't we pioneer time travel as well? Major Henry stood up, and his crew stood up with him. Our home is just isn't here, Captain. Maybe it's 10,000 years from now, and we'll just end up settling there if time travel is indeed impossible. Maybe. Or maybe we'll just keep going forward just to be the ones to do it. Just to see what becomes of the universe. The captain stood up as well and turned to his engineer with a nod. Please give our friends any assistance they need. Back in space. Sir, the nano is ready. The program is locked in. The probe's engine is ready to fire. Waiting on your command. Yates and the rest of the crew sat expectantly, looking towards Major Henry. Major Henry buckled himself into the command chair and addressed his crew. To go where no one has gone before. I always loved that line from the show's over. But space is no longer the final frontier. So let's see what the future holds. Yates, engage. The bright flash of light echoed in their retinas as the crew shook off the feeling of vertigo. They had lost count of the number of times that they'd leapt forward in time and been rescued time and time again by increasingly strange-seeming aliens. But this time was different. There was no ship outside waiting for them. A glowing ball of light floated just outside of the Danu, pulsing as it spoke directly into their minds. Welcome back to space-time, crew of the Danu. You've been gone a very long time. We understand you would like to go home. Well, that is impossible. If you're brave enough to face the risks of some rather experimental technology involving the multiverse and infinite possibilities, we believe we can help. Epilogue The crew on the ISS were hard at work conducting experiments when there was a bright flash of light out of the starboard side. The commander looked out of the portal and grabbed the radio just as a familiar voice came over it, asking what year it was. End of story. Story number one. The Nuance of Language, written by Hicks Kemp. Terence Crawford stood at the center of the chamber. All around him, representatives of the many races of the Galactic Federation gazed down upon him. Taking a deep breath, he turned his eyes towards the solitary contingent. He spoke slowly and deliberately, speaking solitary. The solitary contingent attacked a civilian mining colony on Atrax multiple times, ignoring their pleas for peace. That colony was to extract ores that could be refined into stronger, lighter metals to improve space travel for all races. We would have shared it willingly had you been peaceful. We will accept your complete surrender as a recompense for all those lives lost. He concluded with a sharp gasp, having correctly spoken the language without taking breath. The solitary sneered down. No paltry hand for the people. The loss was acceptable to all parties. Crawford lowered his eyes for a moment and muttered, Pity. He turned to the Kuali delegates. Their language was, by human standards, truly bizarre, but he would try. He squatted and raised his hands above his head, spitting and grunting and flailing. The translators in the room were working overtime. Kuali has repeatedly allowed privateer vessels to attack non-combatant merchants in major space lanes, ignoring intergalactic regulations regarding the attack of vessels belonging to member races not involved in conflicts. Our people's ships were delivering food to the refugee moons filled with victims of your protracted war of conquest, and they were raided, enslaved, and sold to the highest bidder. Humanity demands the immediate release of all prisoners, immediate ceasefire on all fronts of your absurd war, and the three class eight habitable moons of Kuala for refugee resettlement. The Kuali didn't bother to raise their appendages as they spit laughed at the demands. Again, Crawford bowed his head and muttered, Diplomacy is all that separates civilization from a chaos. He turned once more, facing the garage. He adjusted his vocal post-processing device around his neck 
bringing his voice down several octaves. It rumbled through the halls as he spoke. The Garod's crimes against our people and those of the galaxy are too numerous to list here. We demand the complete annihilation of the Garadi military assets and withdrawal from every planet and outpost back to Garad Prime. Garad must no longer be allowed to take and consume entire systems with reckless abandon and without consideration for long-term viability of the galaxy to support life. The Garad representative laughed, his voice echoing crudely around the room. Crawford spoke again, this time in his own language. I have been sent here to make one last offer of peace to the members of the Galactic Federation. I call for a vote from all races present. Make your decision clear, here and now. Stand for peace in the galaxy, and let us work to rebuild it into a more equitable and prosperous place for all life. Cast your votes now. A large display overhead quickly tallied the incoming votes. The gathered delegates laughed in their various languages as the votes stacked up in the decline column. None of the member races were willing to admit their crimes against non-members, nor willing to make any concessions in pursuit of peace. Their laughter slowly faded, however, as they all realized that Terry Crawford was laughing louder than any of them. The Garrard representative stepped forward. For what reason do you express amusement, hue and filth? Crawford wiped a tear of mirth from his eye and smiled poorly. You see, gathered delegates, while you may laugh at my attempts to frame your many languages with my own voice, you forgot that the language humans are most fluent in. He tapped the plate on his chest, activating the concealed armor beneath the diplomatic regalia. The sleeve of his coat fell away, revealing a cybernetic weapon grafted to his arm. Is violence. End of story. Story number two. Stinky. Written by Ice Cream and Wine. Biograt, the Amendian ambassador, was enjoying his stroll down the main boulevard of the enormous structure that was the space station named Rendezvous. He had been invited to accompany Magdalena Kroll, the resident doctor at the closest thing to an xenobiologist on the station on her morning constitutional. The boulevard was a hive of activity, as always, with representatives of many species to be seen about their business. He never failed to be amazed at the beings with claws, tentacles, pseudopods, fawns that thronged the walkway. Whilst he took in all the sights, he kept a wary eye on Dr. Kroll's accompanying creature, a black and white Terran mammal, known to all and sundry on the station as uh, Stinky Ass. He personally had never had a problem with Stinky. It wasn't particularly friendly, but it wasn't particularly unfriendly either. He knew that it was classified as bad news because even the other humans on the station, with their fascination for pack bonding, were wary of Stinky, and left him well alone. He and Magdalena were comparing notes on the various species they saw. He knew more of them as his people had been amongst the stars for much longer than humans. Suddenly, he stopped and grabbed Magdalena's arm. Be careful, those are Saras. They are new addition to the space lanes, and still think that the laws of the station don't apply to them. Security has had trouble with them in the past, and they are voracious eaters. They look familiar, said Magdalena. They look like the pitcher plants we have on Terra. Look out, shouted the Bugrot, as the lead Sara picked up a stinky who had wandered over to Saras and swallowed him whole. We have to do something shouted Biograt. He's just ate Stinky. Stinky, said Magdalena. That's a bit harsh, don't you think? What? How can you be so calm? That thing just ate your pet, started Biograt. How? said Magdalena. Do you think the Sarah is going to let us cut him out? I, uh, I don't know, said Biograt. But we must try to do something. It's too late, said Magdalena. He's already dead. But, but... Eh, he's your pet. How can you write him off like that? Stammered Biograt. I don't understand. What? Said Magdalena. Oh, oh no, sorry, you misunderstand me, she said, looking at the group of Saras. 
With that, the Sara that had eaten Stinky started to convulse and fell to the deck, writhing in apparent agony. The Sara convolution ceased, and then what would call a stomach split opened, and a black and white face peered out of the hole. Then two paws followed, and then the rest of Stinky crawled out of the carcass. System, decontaminate, said Magdalena. With that, Stinky was lifted into the air, and beams of light played over him. He was then set on the deck and wandered back over to Magdalena and Biograt, apparently none the worse for his ordeal. How did he do that? squeaked Biograt, who backed away from Stinky at a pace. The files don't indicate that he could do that. What files? asked Magdalena. The Terran zoological files, gibbered Ziograt, backing away from Stinky as fast as he was able to. Show me, said the Magdalena. Biograt proffered his tablet. Magdalena took it, scanned it, and laughed. That doesn't even look like him, she said. I know. I thought it was just a mistranslation or a bad image, said Biograt. Magdalena cancelled the page, entered her own search term, and gave the tablet back to Biograt. He looked at what she had typed in on the search bar. The words, Honey Badger, leapt off the page at him. End of story. Story number three. Cheers, Glory Days. Written by You Sure I'm Not a Robot. In a bar a thousand light years away from Ireland, was the cold, dark outside, a human raised a glass. A toast, a toast to the cold winds that brought us here, to the dead behind us and the friends beside us. The patron shuffled uneasily. Humans weren't welcome here. If they had to be here, they should be silent. The universe would prefer never to hear from them again. So no friends here, no surprise. We aren't much loved anymore. But do you remember the glory days, when we were loved, when you welcomed us into your homes? I you remember? The bar droid moved to interrupt. His customers were becoming unhappy, not in a buy-expensive-drink way, more a break-stuff vibe. The human looked at the droid. Don't worry, I'm not starting a fight. It's a festival day for my people. I just wanted to remind you all of what we're still around. A dark-shelled creature, drinking quietly at the bar, spoke up. I remember. I even know the festival you speak of. A festival of peace. It's a long time since you humans practiced peace. The human stood, a small creature. Heavy gravity had compacted his species. And now you fear us. We answered the call. Save us, you all cried. We saw you're dead. We avenged you. Then we crushed the bastards that attacked you. Not a single one left. Another radian spoke. You killed them all. You became monsters. You refused to surrender. In our name, you shamed us. Darkness fell on the bar. No one wanted to remember. The fear, the humiliation, the loss. The failure of every species in the bar had surrendered in the war. Except one. They didn't need reminding. And here was the worst kind of reminder. A living human. My name is Luke. I grew up on Earth. I served in the campaigns you all want to forget. I liberated your worlds. I killed the slavers that owned you. Thank you and happy Christmas. The human finished his drink and picked up his jacket. A voice from the back called out. Wait, please. I remember. I remember the dead. I remember when your ships arrived. Let me get you a drink. Call it a, a Christmas present. The speaker rose from his seat. The human looked into the gloom. Peck me. I thought we killed you all. Not all of us. Your people saved me too. Prisoner of war. No one had ever heard of that before. You had rules. My kind didn't. In the end, the camp released us, left to live or die as we wished. The human glanced at the pardroid and nodded. He picked up his drink and moved towards the table. Many of the other customers began leaving in a hurry. No one wanted to get into the middle of this. If you were in a human camp, then you might remember this toast. He raised his glass. May you never forget what is worth remembering, or remember what is best forgotten. The two drank in silence, wrapped in memory. Outside, the snow fell. 
on a Christmas day. End of story. Story number one. The Children of Mankind. Written by I M O E Reset. It was done. The capital burns, the air is still, and the machines of the invader were, as their steel boots march across the ruined structures. We thought them, we thought that what we used against them was overkill. No, it merely served to fuel the war machine that is their entire race. To understand what happened here, we first have to look 100 years ago. We, the Tresson of the Tresson Ascendancy, thought ourselves to be the overlords of the galaxy and the universe. We thought that none can challenge our divine right to rule everything, and that anything that isn't us will be exterminated. Our rule was solid, unshakable even, until we met them, the humans. They were unassuming even by the others we exterminated. They could barely get out of their own gravity bar. They still use chemically propelled weapons. They are even divided in various regions. And even those regions are divided in philosophy, ideology, and religion. Pathetic fools! Thought. So we simply sent a trans-existential arbiter bomb to them. We thought that they would cease to exist, as their very collective unconscious would overload their minds and fry their thinking organs. No, we were wrong. We never bothered. Check. We never bothered to send another strike. We never bothered to even remember them. Who would have known that their collective unconscious was strong enough to make the boundaries of reality and fiction break? When the bomb hit them, it didn't wipe them off as we had thought it would. It gave them all a very, very... Mild headache. Yet, it also registered their popular fiction as part of their collective unconscious, and by some error or another, due to influences unknown, it made what they consider fiction real. It changed them entirely, and by that time, they knew of what we had done to them, and to say that they were all angry is a vast understatement. Humanity, at least according to their accounts, remains divided, even more than the pre-interstellar era. Yet, we see them united under what they call as the Human Alliance. Every advanced fictional government they had, from the corrupt to the efficient, started to exist across their home system. Multiple copies of Earth existed at all the same time, all the same orbit, just to house these newcomers to reality. There was a period of confusion, infighting, and panic. But by sheer charisma of who is now known as the God Emperor, pacified the confused humanity. Mankind planned to get back at us, to tear us apart for our transgressions against them, to make us yield under their might. So they planned, they researched, they developed, and they struck. When humanity ships first appeared upon our territories and sent an ultimatum of unconditional surrender, we scoffed, we laughed, we were angered by the sheer ignorance, thinking that they were mere fools and idiots trying to question our ineffable divine authority. Oh, how we were wrong. The fleets annihilated our name. Their armies burned down our worlds. The first few times we thought it was luck and a fluke, cursing the carelessness of ones in the military. The next few times made us suspicious. The next other few times made us baffled that they can win against us. And the next few times after that made us terrified. Throughout the war, Human nations such as the Imperium of Man, the Greater Terran Union, and the Systems Alliance, the Galactic Empire, the Terran Federation, the Terran Dominion, the United Earth Directorate, the Halfham Empire, the Antares Confederation, the United Federation of Planets, the Union of Soviet Specialist Republics, and the United Nations of Terra Origin would resound throughout our society. 
warriors such as the Doom Slayer, Commander Dante, Commander Shepard, Spartan John 117, Master Chief. Darth Vader, Jim Rayner, and many others would overturn our logic of ground warfare. Human units that would overcome all odds against them, such as the Imperial 501st Legion, the Spartan 2 Program Blue Team, the 203rd Air Mage Battalion, the Imperial 1st Chapter, and the Japanese 3rd Recon Team. Terrible weapons such as the Death Star, the Sword of Terror, the Yamamoto Cannon, Atomic incinerator torpedoes, psychic storm annihilators, and humanity's wrath antimatter quantum destabilizer warheads would be our nightmares. If only we knew of the devastation this race would cause our race. If only we bothered to check what they really are. If only we bothered to research their thinking, feats, and history. If only we didn't dismiss them. They fought in many weapons, in many doctrines, in many different armors and weapons, in many different worlds. From the World War II era and one grand popular in the combat mages of the Empire, to the various designs of Lair's Gun and Astra Militarum, to highly effective armor-piercing C-40 of the Dominion Marines, to the laser blasters of the Imperial Army, to the argent-powered halberds and sabers of the night sentinels, and many more terrible weapons unleashed against our kind. Some offered us a chance to surrender, some offered us a chance to escape, and some offered no chance at all. And now, in our camp, we failed to hold. We unleashed a monster upon the universe more terrible than anything the universe has disastered. They overcome all odds with them, with bullets, with guns, with steel. They did the impossible, mocking the very word in its face, and twisting and crushing it thoroughly until it ceased to exist all together. And now, our empire comes to an end. It is unlikely, but to anyone listening out there, in the vast void of the cosmos. Run! If you see humanity, do not contact them. If content, and do not let your territory be found. If found, do not provoke them at any cost. If provoked, try to appease their demand at any cost. If appeasement fails, then you can only hope for a quick end either under their blaster fire, bolter shredders, or chainsaws. May you never meet humanity. End of story. Story number two. A trick out of the old book, written by Rednull97. Why the hell is it so hot here? Asked Tenal, a five-foot-tall canine like Sakal. Well, because your federation decided to outlaw orbital warfare, we're stuck on this lovely little ocean-going aircraft carrier. And since your federation decided our patrol routes, we're stuck on this lovely little planet, which decided to orbit so close to its sun that temperatures regularly exceed 45 degrees Celsius. And since your federation decided that warships don't need to be designed to operate in temperatures higher than 30 degrees Celsius, our air conditioning system broke, answered Jack, one of the few humans on board. That was a rhetorical question, and yeah, sure, everything is our fault. This has nothing to do with the fact that your republic started a war with the Zob because they stole some piece of space junk, countered to Null. Voyager is not space drunk, and I very much advise you not to repeat that sentence to any other human. Fine. They stole some piece of uh, not space drunk script metal. Before the human could interject again, the Sakal continued. Anyway, why aren't we currently eating ice cream? That genius invention of your kind would very much help with this heat. The human decided to ignore the first part and answered. Well, the 2,000 other inhabitants of this vessel had a similar idea, so the ice cream machine decided to pull the McDonald's and stopped working. Crap. Isn't there anything else that we can do against the heat? 
Do you humans always seem to have a, uh, how do you call it, a trick out of the old book? Now would be the perfect situation for one. Jack thought for a moment before replying, Well, I do have one, and the book it's from isn't just old, it's, uh, practically ancient. If I remember correctly, it's from World War II, so about 2,500 years ago. That's before we even had nukes or spaceflight, but it would get you your ice cream. I don't care how old it is as long as it works. Oh, it will work, and I'm sure you'll love it. The Tunnel's face made a skeptical look. The sarcasm is not lost on me. However, if it means I get ice cream, I'm on board. Perfect. Then get your plane ready. I'll meet you on the flight deck in 30. My plane? By that. Well, obviously, because unlike you, I already had my mandatory practice flight for this week. Before Tadal could ask how this was relevant, or why he needed a plane in the first place, the human had already disappeared behind the next corner. Damned human. I'll better have my ice cream at the end of this. Thirty minutes later, on the flight deck, Tanal was performing the last pre-flight checks when he finally spotted the human walking towards him while pushing a bomb loader, on which, instead of a bomb, set a huge barrel. When the human reached the plane, he attached the said barrel in the bomb bay of the plane, before he told Tanal, All ready for takeoff. I'll give you your flight plan via radio. He wanted to ask what the hell the plan was, but the human has already vanished below deck. As soon as he had taken off, however, the human chimed in over the radio. Control to flight 028, call sign, good boy. The first thing I need you to do is to climb to 20,000 meters. Good boy to control, 20,000 meters confirmed. But why? And what was that in the barrel? The human answered. Because today you will train in some high altitude evasive maneuvers, and I have no idea what barrel you are talking about. This is just a routine weekly training flight. While not amused about the fact that the human seemingly made him break some kind of regulation, why else would he deny the existence of the barrel? Tunnel knew official flight control channel was not the place to discuss this, so he ignored his annoyance and continued to climb. Once he was at a target altitude, he keyed the radio. Good boy to control, now at 20,000. The answer came immediately. Control to good boy, 20,000 confirmed. Next. I always wanted to say this. Do a barrel roll. Control, please repeat. Control to good boy, I repeat. Do a barrel roll. While his anger towards the human crew by the minute, there was no sense in refusing to follow the human's command. It was the official flight plan, after all. It might as well have been a direct order by his superior. So it went on. Immelmann after Cuban 8, loop after Hammerhead, tail side after Herb's maneuver, after about 25 minutes, Tanal finally heard the message that he was waiting for. Control the good boy, that was a nice flying there. Now head back to the carrier and land. As soon as his tires touched the flight deck and his plane came to a stop, Tanal stepped out of the cockpit in order to confront Jack about the meaning behind the whole operation. When he saw him, the human was already working with the bomb loader to unload the barrel. What the hell was that about? Why that aerobatic show? Explain yourself. And where is the ice cream you promised me? The human gave him a very relaxed answer. Chill, man. The ice cream machine broke, but we still had lots of needed ingredients. We just needed a different way to freeze and mix it. Something which you accomplished very nicely, by the way. After he cracked open the barrel and the words, And the ice cream is all here. See? We happy? Tanel only stared at the giant barrel filled with ice cream. Yeah, what? Uh, yeah... Yeah, yeah, we were happy. End of story. Story number one. Children of Terror. Written by MWMN90. It had been nearly a millennium since the great and vast human empire collapsed, shattered into thousands of desperate nations. So much history had been lost to eons. Colonies had either been abandoned. Many of them either died or full struggled, barely surviving. Some thrived and made their own small empires. Some stagnated. To this day, many bold explorers venture into the unknown only to discover old and abandoned outposts of the former empire. Rarely, small isolated human populations are found, like contacted tribes living in their own little bubbles. Thousands of languages and cultures form. Many humans don't look alike, 
even though the time span in the evolutionary sense is minuscule. The presence exerted on humans living in less hospitable environments expedited the evolutionary process. In the wake of the chaos and as our great past faded from memory and from record, a handful of people made it their life goal to hoard as much information about our history, science, and culture as possible. Such as the goal of the young man we see today, the lone wolf who goes through the void making ends meet with small jobs he finds as he ventures throughout the void. His small ship is considered ancient by almost everyone, but the contents within are even more so. Other than digitized information which is held in the vessel's computers, he has physical copies of books, an object which is considered to be a relic of an age long past. From many engineering books depicting old machines which are comparatively primitive with the technology offered, turbines and steam engines, internal combustion engines and old building techniques, science books which detail theories and equations, some facts stood the test of time, some were debunked long ago. History books which detailed the history of the cradle of human civilization, Earth. The young man is far, far from Earth. It is questionable if he even saw the planet itself, as a vagabond who visited many worlds in spite of his young age. Few decide to take the pilgrimage to the old world. Some people straight up deny that Earth was our birthplace, thinking that mankind has always been in the stars. The man sits at the helm of a small ship he commandeered for so long, red lights blaring as he panics and tries desperately to fix whatever is going on. Glancing here and there to the back, where the wealth of knowledge stands, he knows that death is highly possible. He is in an unexplored part of the sector. Even if he admits a distress signal, it is highly unlikely that it will reach anyone in time. He is on his own. In his desperation, he finds a scan of the system he's in, and in a stroke of amazing luck, there is a planet which is hospitable for humans nearby. He sets calls for the planet using the little fuel he has left to at least land somewhere. The vessel creaks as the burning orange color of re-entry envelops the craft as it enters the blue atmosphere of this alien world. The young man fights with the controls as he tries to steer the vessel to land on solid ground. The clouds block his view, but he could see hints of ocean below. As he descends below the clouds, he can see the land in the distance, a heavily forestalled area with hills. He pushes an acceleration lever as far as it went to push the ship towards the land. The landing was not gentle. The trees eased the blow and damage that could have been catastrophic. The young man remained conscious throughout the ordeal, only slightly injuring himself during the not-so-graceful landing. When he opened his eyes, he was alive. He stood up from his seat to investigate the damage. He first checked the computers and storage room of the vessel. He saw that the majority of the books and information were intact. A miracle. He put his suit on in case the senses of the ship had been mistaken, then ventured outside to inspect the exterior damage. He could immediately see that the damage was irreparable. With the tools at his disposal, it would be impossible to repair the ship. Communication went down, and even if they were in function, it is unlikely anyone would pick them up. The forest around him was green and lush. Even from the inside of his helmet, he could hear the variety of sounds that the wildlife of this planet produced. He was cautious, observing his surroundings and that no predator has a jump on him. He's on the undocumented planet, after all. He grabbed a testing kit from his ship to confirm the atmosphere is breathable. Even though there is thick vegetation, it could all be poisonous for all he knew. As he clicked the small button on the device which tested the air around him, he could hear a shuffling from beyond the tree line. His gaze quickly came towards the general direction from which the sound came from. He inspected that area in detail. He couldn't see anything, but as soon as he thought it was just his imagination, the bushes started to move, and from them emerged a large animal. The animal was familiar to the young man. It was a native animal from another faraway planet. It was a horse. 
and on top of the beast was another being clad in chainmail and an iron halberd. Soon enough, the figure was joined by another two beings on horseback. The first being removed its helmet and revealed a face, a human face. Just as the young man wanted to say something, the small device in his hand beeped. Atmospheric scan complete, survivability 100%. The three men on horseback winced at the device. They spoke an unknown language, but the four quickly came to a mutual understanding. We go up beyond the treetop and look into the horizon, the great forest stretching far. In the distance, smoke could be seen, indicating that a settlement was not too far from the crash site. The day turns to night, then into day again, accelerating. The smoke remains stagnant, joined by more lines of smoke every so often. Soon, we can see as the trees start to be cut down. Houses are erected and roads built. Soon, those houses become larger buildings, smokestacks, reaching high and spewing black smoke. We see the forest become a town, farmland, spanning far and wide. Time slows down and we reach down to the place where the young explorer once crashed. A large building now stands here. The street outside is filled with activity. We see horse-drawn carts and wagons and even a few primitive cars rolling down the street. We enter the building, seeing the spacious interior with hallways in front of us, to the left and to the right. We go forward. We see countless works of art and artifacts dotting the hall. We look to the left and see thick glass panel. A plaque detailing the object held within is written in a familiar alphabet. The Latin alphabet. But it is an unholy new language, containing some letters completely foreign to the original script. But the nature of this object is self-evident. Once we set our eyes on it, a book, old and worn out, reading letters telling us its name, the Holy Bible. We continued down the hall to see multiple examples of similar glass panels holding ancient artifacts, some of them foreign and some familiar. But the hallway as its end. At the end of the wall, we come to a large circular room with a rounded roof. Painted in black with small white dots, it has the same look as a clear night sky. In the center of the room, it is a statue of a man in a spacesuit pointing towards the ceiling. In the center of the ceiling is a map of the continents of the Mother Planet. North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, Antarctica. There is a small plaque that only has one sentence written on it in two languages, one in the old tongue called English and one in the native tongue of those of this world. You stand on the shoulders of giants. Do not forget them, children of terror. End of story. Story number two, Ion Cannon, written by Pepulone. When we went into war with the humans, we quickly learned of their powers in battle resulting in a war that lasted barely one of our lunar cycles. In case you're wondering, our lunar cycle is roughly two-thirds of the humans. Sure, the scariest weapons in both combatants were the planet destroy weapons. Oh, wipe off that incredulity you're showing with your feathers. Every single species in the galaxy has a planet destroy weapon, but using one is a certain signing of one's own extermination, so they're used only as a weapon of last resort. For me, besides those ultimate weapons, there are two human weapons that for me are simply the scariest. Two kinds of ion cannons. The first one is the flying ion cannon. The three zerk long dreadnought built around a cannon that's about uh, almost two kilometers. Flying in space, firing ionized gas atoms at a fraction of the speed of light in a controlled, aimed, tight beam. In the vacuum of space, it is as devastating as relativistic projectiles, but within a planet's atmosphere, it plasmatizes the air around the beam, becoming pillars of fire that consume everything within one zerk around it, and it still hits with the devastating of a planet bombard projectile, only without a large crater, just a small one as the invariably military target's munition depot exploded. The second one, though, for me, is the scarier one. It does not fire relativistic atoms. It doesn't even launch any kind of projectiles. But it brought down the communications, stopping calculations and war strategies, and ultimately brought our defeat. It is a weapon designed to bring civilizations to its knees. 
When TCV Grace Hopper jumped in, we didn't pay it any particular attention. It looked just like other Terran cruisers, except with more escorts, probably carrying a high-ranking officer to oversee the combat. No, we didn't pay the ship any particular attention until it started patching into our interplanetary and interplanetary network. Within hours, we surrendered. Had the humans deployed the hacking tool, low-orbit ion cannon from the beginning, this would have been embarrassingly the shortest interspecies war ever. Hmm. I wonder, could it be that the humans purposely prolonged the war just to show off their weaponry, since after the war the humans' weapons became highly sought after? End of story. Story number one. Joyful. Written by Nora Naya Toast. Before the day in the forest, she had run only three times in her life. It was unseemly for a fane to run. They were supposed to espouse calm and authority, and being seen to move faster than a gentle glide was a betrayal of those qualities they had cultivated for generations. She thought it silly, and had questioned why diplomats had to act this way. But the word of her mother was the law in her household. Her question stopped not long after. The first time she ran was as a child caught up in excitement by something long forgotten. She had moved towards her mother with haste. In response, she was fixed with a cold glare and a hand on her shoulder. That was far too firm. We don't run, darling, her mother had hissed. Never let others see you act so inappropriately. The excitement deflated out of the child, and she spent the rest of the day with watery eyes. That day, running was shameful. The second time she ran was as an adult, and her homeworld was torched by raiders of the north. In the face of death, her calmness shattered. She sprinted away from the epicenter of the attack, screaming in fear as buildings shuddered and fell to their knees around her. She remembered little of that day, except how her legs and feet hurt for weeks after. That day, running saved her life. A human scout ship Visiting for respite and caught up in the fighting, spotted her in a field as she outran a wall of fire. They swooped down and rescued her. The captain pulled her into a hug as the ship exited the atmosphere. She stood, wooden, unable to hug back, cry, or say a single word. For two years, she did not speak. The human crew were friendly, banter flowed between them like water, and although the fane they rescued didn't respond with words, she smiled at their jokes and pulled faces instead. When her entire race vanished, the survivors of the torching packing themselves into starships and leaving without a trace, the humans kept her ground. Over time, they became closer than family, and over those two years as they visited world after world, and introduced her to ideas and ways of life that she could never have imagined, she eventually came to trust them with her life. The third time she ran was on Earth. The humans took her to see their homeworld, parking the ship in an area surrounded by woodland. Her and one of the humans found the captain's stash of alcohol and shared it with the crew. The entire crew was soon rolling around and giggling and making sport of throwing bottle caps at each other. Later, in the light of the full moon, the fane woman and three of the humans stumbled out of the ship towards the woodland. Hey! Hey, raise you to the clearing, one of the humans called, and took off into the thicket. One human followed, laughing, still holding a bottle of beer. The third looked at the fane woman, seeming to stare right at a soul with hazy eyes. Run with us, she said, just once. You don't have to keep up appearances here. Then she took off as well. The fane woman, tipsy and a little confused but eager to take part in the fun, started to walk following them, but her legs acted on their own accord, and suddenly she was running, following the humans by the sound of their laughter. And as she ran through the thicket, hair catching on branches and skin being snagged by the occasional thorn, she started to catch up to the rest. As she did, they whooped and hollered in encouragement. The wind picked up, casting dead leaves into a spiral, and she felt the kiss of the cold on her face. Her breath came fast but the world seemed to slow as adrenaline coursed through her veins. 
It was at that moment that he emerged into a clearing. She was fast, faster than she had realized, and she had beaten everyone else. As she looked to the sky, she saw the light of the full moon illuminating the clearing in a glow reminiscent of her homeworld. Her world tilted on its axis. She became hyper-aware of herself. The thrum of her heart, the air gasping in her lungs, the adrenaline in her veins throwing everything she saw into sharp relief. The static in her feet as they crunched towards the undergrowth. For a moment, she swore she could feel the planet itself breathing. She could almost see the threads of life and fate which had pulled everything together in this moment. It was as if the veil had been lifted from her eyes. She opened her mouth, and for the first time in two years, words tumbled out. Joy and love and grief, all tangled up into syllables. That night, the human celebrated and cried as she told them about her homeworld, about her mother, and about how much she had come to love her crewmates. That day, running was joyful, and from that day, the world felt a little more colorful. After that, she ran many, many times. The crew, while on a pit stop, entered her into a marathon on a planet known as the Sea of Lilies. She protested at first, but eventually acquiesced. The captain, having long forgiven her for stealing her alcohol, put her on a training regimen. She became strong and took over much of the physical labor of the ship. As it turned out, Fane became fearsomely strong when they trained and more than once she caught some of the crew staring at her in awe as she carried a box five times her weight. It dawned on her why her race had been so averse to his exertion. They had been afraid of frightening others, but she knew her friends were not afraid of her. Her being in a marathon was a source of curiosity and discussion. The Fane had not been seen in three years, and for one to reappear so suddenly, and in a marathon no less, was perturbing to Benny. Nevertheless, she attended, ignoring the attention trained on her by the other races. The memories of her past swiveled in her as she ran. The shame of running as a child. The fear as she ran for her life as the Fane homeworld burned. The joy of the wind in her face and the branches in her hair as she ran with the humans, with whom she now shared a bond of astonishing strength. She felt the burn in her legs and the gasping in her lungs but she continued, determined to show this world who she was. She won. Why did you enter? One reporter asked her in the aftermath, as she held the middle aloft and was lit up by a flash of cameras. The humans I travel with saved me, she replied. They saved my life. Ah, but they saved my sanity too. They taught me how joyful it is to just, uh, let go of everything and run she wiped a tear from her eye, then continued. Maybe my people will see what I've done someday. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe. Maybe they'll realize that they don't have to pretend to be something they're not. That evening, she received an encrypted message, its source unclear. I am proud of you. I was mistaken when I told you your actions were inappropriate. She would cherish that message for the rest of of her life. End of story. Story number two. The Lost Song, written by a glass of whiskey. In summary, the ordering of the planets forms a secret message, no doubt left behind by some immensely powerful ancient being. Today I've deciphered and shown that message to you. It had been a long presentation, but he felt he nailed the finish, although the last half an hour was more of a mixed result. Loud snoring from his only audience member was a large part of that. It had really screwed up his rhythm. Yes, yes, you're a nutcase, said his still slightly dazed audience. He had woken up to the sound of air horns, some kind of demonstration on how messages could be stored in short and long blasts of sound. Those long parts had really made an impression on him. The audience member continued, Already knew that. Got that memo and the presentation, unfortunately. You can stop with the sales pitch and the air horns. Just tell me, why are you here? There was some scraping of hooves. 
Uh, need to borrow your spaceship. No, you don't. Remember what happened the last time? Come on! Oh, that, that was one time. Wanted to watch a supernova, was it? Did a bit more than scratch the paint, frankly. I'm surprised you even survived. And now you want to do it again? No, no, didn't you listen to a word I said? Ancient civilization, secret message, come on! Right, and no murder bots this time. That hardly ever happens. Twice. It's happened twice. With a deep sigh, he took a look at his crazy friend, then reached deep within and found forgiveness, in the hope that he might get to witness his friend making a very large and silly fool of himself. Fine, I'll let you borrow my spaceship. Oh! It had been an unlikely victory, but a fine one. But I'm coming with you, and I'm playing what? But, but what if there are murder bots? Yeah, this time we checked before there is murder bots there. Not after landing and seeing them scramble all over the ship trying to get in. They walked to the spaceship and prepared the necessary supplies, such as snacks. All right, let's go. Where is this place anyway? I just showed you on this chart over here. Uh, look, it's here. Looks like a bit of black to me. Of course it does. It's in the middle of space. So most likely this is just a space trip to the middle of nowhere, where we will find nothing before going home. No way! Ancient beings, code. There's a 110% guaranteed chance. 110% guaranteed chance later. Right, now we are here and there is nothing. Uh, can we go home now? You need to reduce your velocity a little bit to the left. Okay, done. Now we are still in the middle of nowhere. Can we go home now? Wait just a minute. I think I'm starting to hear it. Hear yeah, what? The song! That's what we're looking for. The code talks about some strange song. Oh, you're just, uh... Hey. You're right. Yeah, you're, you're actually right. You don't need to sound so surprised about that. Shh. Let's just listen. End of story. Story number one. Home Away From Home, written by C-SPAN. The irritating thing about faster-than-line communication is that, in order for it to be truly effective, it has to be invented twice. Sure, it's as nifty to have lagless telecommunications across a whole planet or directly remote control over rovers on Mars, but that's nothing compared to interstellar communication. And the problem is, in order for there to be interstellar communication, there has to be someone to talk to on another star. Going to other stars solely to talk to the place you just left is a bit of a silly idea. So that leaves aliens. And since there's no practical way to talk with said aliens without a faster than light communication system, both ends of the conversation need to invent an entirely separately. When humanity first switched on its interstellar telephone for the first time, everyone was pleasantly surprised to find someone else already on the line. The aliens, who had been patiently sending out messages and waiting for a response for about 50 years, were overjoyed to finally have someone to talk to. Well, talk may be a strong word. For reasons that nobody without multiple doctorates could adequately explain, FDL communication was limited to binary on-off signals. This presented several challenges. Imagine for a moment. You are locked in a small room with nothing but a light switch. You are informed that you have a counterpart in another room who you have never met before and whose language you do not speak. Your light switch controls the light in their room. They have an identical light switch that controls the light in your room. Your task is to accurately convey complex messages to your counterpart and receive messages in return, using nothing but the light switch. This is roughly analogous to the challenge of two newly connected species faced. Fortunately for everyone involved, there were a whole bunch of very smart mathematicians, linguists, scientists, and experts of all fields on both sides of the line. And a viable communication standard was worked out. The fact that it took three decades was actually seen as a major accomplishment. Of course, a species doesn't get to the level of interstellar telecommunications by being content with things and everyone involved was eager to actually meet their new potential friends from across the very large pond. Unfortunately, while both species were located in the same galaxy, they were still multiple trillions of kilometers apart. 
Physics was just barely okay with sending massless particles faster than light, but decided to draw a hard line at sending mass. Any and all attempts either failed utterly or caused physics to throw a hissy fit and storm off in a half, resulting in regions of space where the laws of time no longer function properly. Or something. It's not like anyone was ever kind enough to return and tell everyone what was going on in there, so faster than light travel was off the table. Both species attempted to solve the distance barrier in different ways. The aliens, being the much more sensible of the two species, continued to try and develop faster than light travel, and also invested heavily in telepresence robotics to better emulate actual face-to-face -face conversations. The humans collectively decided that the aliens were taking a boring approach and opted to just pop by for a visit. Preparing ships for a journey that would last millennia is a difficult task. There are no gas stations in interstellar space, so each ship needs to be its own entirely self-contained ecosystem. It turns out that building a perfectly sealed ecosystem that would be able to sustain itself for millennia is hard. So hard, in fact, that it was deemed easier to take a pre-built ecosystem and just move that instead. Fortunately, there was a very handy pre-built ecosystem just laying around called uh, Earth. Moving an entire planet through interstellar space is a bad idea. There are many problems with the concept, not the least of which was that because interstellar space was really, really cold. The entire biosphere would freeze to a halt long before you reached your destination. This problem, and many others, were solved in the most over-the-top way possible. If the planet couldn't survive outside the solar system, the solar system itself should be moved. This was, obviously, insane. But humanity was mostly a race of mad bastards with too much confidence in their own abilities and an unhealthy degree of spite towards the very laws of nature themselves. And so, with the attitude that can largely be described as, well, I'll be damned if I let the universe tell me where I can park my solar system, humanity embarked on the largest engineering project ever. A stellar engine is a simple idea, that is extraordinarily hard to execute. If you can somehow build a thruster large enough to move the sun, everything orbiting the sun will trail along with it like debris in the wake of a speedboat. The challenge, of course, is moving the sun. The solution, as implemented, involved a lot of electromagnetic field manipulation, solar plasma extraction, nuclear fusion, and, somewhat counterintuitively, a thruster pointed back at the sun for counterbalance. It was the sort of thing that got a lot of engineers very, very excited, and everyone else very, very bored. Building a planet-sized megastructure designed to move a star is something that takes a long time and a lot of resources. As the largest infrastructure project ever, it was also great for the economy. The engine, affectionately nicknamed Thrusty McThrustface, was completed in a mere few centuries and was ceremonially activated on the 500th anniversary of Earth's contact. The journey itself would take much longer, and many more generations, but everyone agreed that it would be worth it to see the looks on the aliens' faces when we finally arrived. End of story. Story number two, Little Brother, written by Infernalism. His instinct had been to browbeat the quivering drone with a healthy dose of anger. Instead, he calmed the drone with a few perfectionary strokes of his antenna upon the drone's head before instructing him to repeat himself. The pirate says he's from vibrant life. It, uh, it, the hunter thought, not he. Our costs were no longer one of the people. A lie, a filthy untruth an obscene social habit picked up from socializing with non-people species, no doubt, but was such to be expected from the hiveless scum outcasts. Vibrant life was destroyed ten cycles ago by a rogue void star on their way to colonize a new system. Such was the truth, given down by the speakers of explanation as to why the whole hive had been lost. Even scattered as they were, they felt the expiration of a billion people and the speakers had addressed the issue after investigation. Yes, Hunter, but... Now came the burst of anger. Part thought, part sent, bathing the drone in its superior's fury. But, but what? 
He hasn't been shown. He has his antennae. That's not possible. His whole crew has their antennae. All of them. The report was simplicity itself. An alien craft had been captured by Warm Spring on their way to the new home system to colonize and spread. The ship was made of metal and alien materials that stunk of hydrocarbons and burned his eyes even at 50 marching units. The pirate captain stunk as well, but they'd set up an incense around him to stifle the stench. The pirate captain himself was strange, as the drone had reported. He had his antennae, so he wasn't an outcast, but he was cloaked in a strange material. A custom with some people that colonized colder worlds until their bodies adapted to the cold. It wasn't cold, but he still wore his drapings. Some were natural leather, crude hide and flesh from other species. Others were hunks of metal and strange smelling things that weren't unpleasant by default, but were disconcerting in their alienness. The captain stood when the hunter walked in and... To his everlasting shock, gave him an immaculate greeting, one warrior to another. I am Scout Longrunner, and I'm here to give my report. To Speaker Truthwalker from Hunter Sure Strike, Commander of Warm Spring, regarding vibrant life. I'm including the report of the hybrid person that identifies himself as Scout Longrunner of Vibrant Life. He and his crew of 40 were picked up last week and after vigorous interrogation, all of them gave the same standard report with negligible differences. You must forgive the report's strange word, as many of the words contained therein are no equivalent in the people's language. A glossary will follow the report to try and explain some of the terms. Either all of them are speaking the same non-truth while managing to mask both thoughts and smiles, an astonishing feat, or our speakers have lied to us. I leave this matter in your hands. We were ordered to a new system discovered by the seers some cycles earlier. They found a lush system with a number of habitable worlds and many rooms around a gas giant and a paradise class world as well. The seers report indicated that the system was occupied by a space-faring civilization that had colonized many of those moons and was largely concentrated around the paradise world. My crew and I were ordered in to study the system ahead of the Hive's arrival. They had picked up on the Hive's arrival. We ran into automated defenses at the very edge of the system. Nuclear homing mines, weapon platforms, nothing we hadn't seen before. We never saw any natives. They stayed ahead of us, evacuating to the paradise world. We got repeated transmissions from the species. Something our translator stated was a simple statement. Wait for little brother! Whatever that meant. Again, nothing we hadn't seen before. We disabled what we could, and our callers sent back detailed maps of the defense networks and continued scouting inward into the system. They never set up a single line of manned defense, just automated systems, minefields. By the time Vibrant Life arrived, we found the simplest and easiest path inward to the Paradise World, and we called back to the Hive with this pathing for them to take. The Hive had made little work of their defense networks and fields. Vibrant life was vast, a true Hive in every sense of the word. It dwarfed some of the moons of the system and carried enough firepower to decimate a world without pause. The species on this paradise had no idea what was coming for them. They had one last line of defense between their moon and the paradise itself. A vast, almost half-spherical network of weapon platforms and automated nuclear missile systems that appeared to be proximity-oriented. So, Vibrant Life simply moved around to the far side, negating this lethal defense entirely. Like many species, this one did not think in three dimensions, or so we assumed. Once the Hive had moved to the far side, they set off their singularity bomb, a focused, aimed singular, a void star that was placed in the Hive's flank catching the hive between the weapon network and the deadly grasp of the Void Star's gravity well. We watched as the hive was struck between the two, horrified, but then cheered as the hive righted itself and found a balance between the two. We sang the song of conquest as the hive's surface rippled and opened to show a thousand thousand plasma cannons coming to bear on the alien metal cities below. 
When the hive began to splinter, we had no idea what was happening. It began to burn and melt almost at random. The fields of cultivated plasma cannons melting and bubbling, the great cavernous hangar bays burning. Thousands of attack craft burning in their bays and birthing pits. I can still hear the screaming as they died. Chaos then. The speakers were shouting a dozen directives at once, their unity broken by the pain and burning of the hive. We, at the same time, were frantically trying to find out what was happening. One of my watchers screamed into the connection to switch to infrared. Heat vision. We had and nearly burned out all three of my eyes. It was coming from their star, or rather from a small world orbiting their star, lancing beams of concentrated light, a makeshift laser. Three of them, reaching out from that small burnt world, cutting into the hive, cutting it up like you would do an overripe bit of fruit. The hive was caught between a lethal weapon platform and the void star's raging gravity well. The only way forward was to crash into the planet itself. The other was to go back and go around and that meant exposure to those lethal lasers for the whole way. So we watched as they tried to brave the weapons platform and watched as our hive got torn apart. Billions died as they ejected from the hive in a survival craft and they burned them. In the visible spectrum, they simply exploded into carbon dust. Every part, every person trying to escape the hive was burned alive by those invisible beings like a great god wiping them away with a swipe of his claw. When the cannons were silent and no more pods emerged from the dying hive, a thousand thousand metal ships lifted off from the paradise world and descended onto the vibrant life. We fled and we've been running and fighting them ever since. I was a scout, but now I am the last remaining hunter, seer, and speaker of the vibrant life, and I bring you the bloody truth Bought at the cost of billions of lives. Stay away from the system. Death lives here. End of story. Story number one. The Caretakers, written by C-SPAN. From a distance, it was hard to tell the ship was in fact a ship at all. You could be forgiven for thinking that it was merely two asteroids tumbling through space. But if you looked closer, you could make out the glitter of radiators and solar panels, the seemingly randomly placed bell nozzles, and the occasional glint of starlight reflecting off the cables connecting the two bodies. To be fair, your initial impression would have been half right. One of the rocks was just that, simply counterbalance for spin gravity generation but the other was a spaceship, one designed to weather the harsh interstellar radiation and sustain itself across the centuries required to deliver its precious cargo. Buried deep within the heart of the ship were millions of gametes, more than enough to give humanity a fresh start under the light of a new star. There were also six people. These six people were probably the most detached from the human condition as it was possible to be. They were born on the ship, and they would die on the ship. To them, an open sky, sun, unprocessed air, nutrients that hadn't already passed through their bodies hundreds of times, and a social circle larger than six people, were utterly foreign concepts. They were caretakers of perhaps the single most important piece of cargo in human history. Their job was to maintain the ship, deal with the unexpected hazards, incubate and raise the next generation of caretakers, and die. And they had absolutely no say in the matter. When your entire universe consists of nine rooms with instant death a few meters away, your only two options are to perform the tasks you were trained to do from birth, or die horribly in an accident at doom, the human race in the process. Teenage Rebellion couldn't quite overcome the survival instinct. One of the few crew members of the ship was a man. This man had a name. He was of the opinion that it was rather a nice name, but that ultimately didn't matter. His name would be functionally lost to history, relegated to a list in a subsection of a footnote that nobody would ever bother to read. The names of the first generation would be remembered, 
they were the brave men and women who set out on a journey to another star. The names of the last generation, the ones who completed their centuries-long journey and set foot on a new world, they would be remembered too. But not the people in the middle. The man knew this and was a little disquieted by it. He consoled himself that he was critical to the mission and the long-term success or failure of the project may well depend entirely on him. That's what the previous generation told him, after all. Technically speaking, that was a lie. While the ship was designed with a crew of six in mind, as few as two people could theoretically operate the entire craft. Everyone was trained on every part of the ship's operation. It's true that the man was the only one who had maintained the delicate hydroponic systems that kept the crew fed. But this was simply because he was the best at it, not because he was the only one capable. The man knew all this too, but chose to ignore it to preserve his sanity. The man was, however, special in a way the other caretakers of the ship were not. He was special because he was going to push a button. Everyone on the ship had pushed thousands of buttons, of course, but this was a special button. It would only be pressed once, as it did one thing and one thing only. It opened the massive solar sail that would catch the light from the destination star and use it to slow the entire craft down. The force exerted by the light from this far away was minuscule, and the ship was going incredibly fast, so it would take several centuries to come to a stop. However, it was the only way to decelerate the ship without using the reaction mass, so it would have to do. Reaction mass was the single most precious commodity on the ship. As there was nowhere to get more, there aren't very many gas stations in interstellar space, after all. The button actually wasn't strictly necessary, as the ship's computer was capable of opening the sail at the precise microsecond it needed to but the ship's designers believed in nothing if not redundancy. So, there was a physical button that opened the sail, in the event that all four of the ship's computers failed. They hadn't, but the opening of the sail was the most significant event in the lives of the caretakers aboard the ship, and they were determined to do more than just stare at a computer screen. The slight error in opening time introduced by human reaction time was negligible this far out. The caretakers found out that one of them would get to push the button when they were children. Later that same day, they made a bet. The man won the bet, so 30 years later, he was the one standing at the control console while the other five looked on. Having all six crew members in the same room was a rare occurrence, as the staggered nature of the work schedule usually ensured that at least two of them were asleep at any given time. But none of them wanted to miss this. There was a small countdown timer displayed on a nearby screen, and the crew watched with bated breath as it slowly ticked down. The countdown reached zero. The man pushed the button, the sail opened, the crew cheered, and had a little celebration with some alcohol that they had fermented for the occasion a few months back. Then they went back to their assigned tasks, and the ship flew ever onward in a sea of endless night. End of story. Story number two. May your fortunes hold. Written by British T Company. Battle cruiser Kongu was leaving formation. She was a nameship of the Kongu class battle cruisers, one of the favorite warships of the Seoul Imperium Navy. Praised for their versatility in any operation, Kongu herself had served in many missions for over a decade, the ship and her crew having had many changes, upgrades, and awards over the past ten years. Though she was no longer the most advanced ship in the fleet, she was certainly still the most decorated. The Admiral may have threatened a court-martial, but this was going to be an honorable discharge. Battlecruiser Kongu's shields howled against the wave of alien fire. Her howl buckled as her generators fumed, but she held. She was as loyal as this crew, ready to do her duty in the line of battle. 
her primary guns, sent another volley, scratching another alien destroyer. The rain of torpedoes, which sent her shield strength down to 16%, did not dissuade her or her furious charge into the armada. The chief engineer reported his work was done. The admiral, ranting and threatening, had gone to a desperate plea. The captain smiled and rubbed his locket one last time. The shot glass was emptied next to it. There was one last thing about Battlecruiser Congo that only few people still knew, though none of the other Congo classes had this problem. It was discovered after the fact that the warp core of the Congo herself had a design flaw, which could potentially cause a hazardous breach in subspace if improperly handled, or in this case, properly handled. A well-aimed shot took the Congo's conning tower her hull began to groan as though she was dying, but she continued to drive. A last array of torpedoes was sent in defiance against the alien menace. The captain stared at his communications officer and gestured him to move over. He stared at the locket once more before caressing it to his heart. To the rest of the Imperium, he began as the countdown until subspace detonation began. And in the final moments, the captain thought of his father, the admiral of the fleet. He thought about his crew, their families. He thought about his, the woman in the locket. He thought about his enemy, the thousands of ships which he had plunged straight into the midst of. May your fortunes hold, for we will be watching in Valhalla. End of story. Story number one, A Bug Problem, written by Katani77. Kavor was three galactic standard days from leaving the military. He thumbed through some entries in his journal with his paws, pausing to stroke his worn claw across the hollow pick of his wife and three cubs. The Kirin were a proud and noble race, but they had their softer side. Not like the enemies they were chasing across this part of the galaxy. The Aranthos were a ruthless, insectoid race of bioengineered technology. What they couldn't destroy, they would infect with everything from logic plagues for the shipboard AI systems, a fancy way of saying programmed paradoxes, to actual biological warfare that would consume and dissolve all living tissue. Preventing boarding was a cable's job. Seven seconds to contact, the cold and comfortingly neutral voice of the ship's AI stated. Cavor and his squadron of shock troopers manned the main airlocks, waiting for the telltale thud of a boarding vessel latching to the side. Be ready, man. Bioshields and maximum. A thick smell of ozone filled the air as the personal shields energized to rout them giving each trooper a faint light blue glow. Dud! The ship shuddered as the boarding pond latched onto the airlock, extending its tendrils around the side of the ship. A metallic gnashing could be heard outside as the mandibles of the half-organic, half-machine began chewing its way through the airlock doors. Soon, the Aranthos would begin spewing out the maw of the boarding pod's orifice. Gnash! Crunch! Nash, crunch. Airlock integrity field failing, the AI chimed in, slightly more stilted than usual. The plague, Cable thought to himself. We'll all lose AI's control of the ship. Trooper to Dull, secure the shipboard AI. Cable looked over his shoulder to see a trooper enter the core room, and the second later, the confirmation of the AI had been deactivated. A new trick that they had learned in dealing with the Aranthos. Form up! Squad A on me! Squad B at Junction 3! The orders conveyed a confidence that k did not actually possess at that moment. The ship's automated system sounded off. Hellbridge! Emergency! Hellbridge! Far less tactful, those systems eh, Chieftain? One of the troopers quipped. Shut up and fire! k yelled as the first of the Aranthos soldier cast poured into the hallway, covered in a red exoskeleton and the signature three white stripes of their cast. The creature stood twice the height of the Karen and had to stoop slightly at the corridor. 
Immediately sensing the trap, the Aranthus lifted its wings, casing, and emitted a cloud of orange glass before a laser bolt ripped its head clean off. Masks, Kavor ordered. While the bioshields could prevent the usual bioweapons, he did nothing for the neurotoxins the soldiers could emit. The squad's armor automatically extended the breathing masks over the muzzles of the troopers as two more warriors entered the hallway, only to be ripped to shreds by the Karen's rifles. Squad B, cover us! The boarders were repelled one by one as Squad A advanced to the airlock. Kara, place the charge! A smaller of the troopers, but were much more agile than light armor, ran forward and threw a satchel into the mouth of the boarding pod. Seconds later, it abruptly began foaming at the throat. No! Kavor yelled. A structural force field erected itself across the airlock, just as the boarding pod fell off dead. Captain, the boarding pod is neutralized, Kavor said, as they began tossing parts of the Aranthos bodies through the field and into space. Good to hear, Chieftain, but we have some unidentified guests here. Get to tactical as soon as you can. This may get ugly for us. Kavor left his troops to do the jobs and sprinted on all falls to the tactical center of the bridge. What are they? Simeon, we think. Can't be sure. Very strong, though. The captain spoke as he pulled up a hollow image of a strange-looking ship entering the combat area. You only got half the boarding party visiting you because it looks like the Aranthos were already dealing with these creatures. He mentioned as the image zoomed out to show the majority of the Aranthos fleet, focusing his attention on the new ship and losing badly. The ship appeared to be roughly rectangular with a long row of cargo containers and tanks trailing behind. Several gun placements were rapidly tracking and destroying Aranthos ships all around. Suddenly, the communication system lit up. Dutho! Zaha! Came across the ship's comms. Engineer Girl to re-engage support AI as soon as the rogue logic plague processes are cleared, the captain said. Gold ran to the core room as fast as his legs could carry him. After a few moments, AI engaged, sir, came the reply. Ah, 69, are you online and functional? Captain asked in the ship's systems. Yes, sir. Performing battlefield analysis, new species discovered, does not patch any known records. Analyzing, complete. Species calls themselves humans and originate from a star projected to be near here as the human's vessel does not appear to be capable of warp travel. Negotiating with human communication systems, compatible radio wave systems detected at 27.185 MHz. Sending Linguistics Codex. Human vessel contains AI of similar capability. Negotiating. Negotiating. Success. Language exchange added to Universal Translator Matrix. The communications was repeated in Karen. This is Deep Space Hauler Snowman of the Soul System. We see that you got a bug problem. We'll have it cleared up in a few minutes. Then maybe we can grab a beer. Snowman out. End of story. Story number two, meeting the neighbors, a first contact conversation. Communications link online. Humanity, hi, we're humans, and we come from Earth. We're new to the galaxy and very excited to meet another intelligent race. Kabiski, yes, yes, we know. You've been shamelessly broadcasting attention-seeking transmissions all across the cosmos for centuries now. Oh, wow. So our messages were being received all along. Unfortunately. Now, um, if you'll excuse us, we're very busy. What? Wait. Don't go. We haven't even properly introduced ourselves yet. <sighs> Make it brief. Well, for a start, we just like to say how much of an honor it is to meet you. This is a really big moment for us and... Uh, get to the point. Oh, so, um, uh, how about we open lines of diplomacy and trade? Why the hell would we want to trade with you? Um, we have a vibrant culture and a booming industrial complex, and I'm sure we have something of value that you guys might want. Right? You guys don't even have miniaturized dark energy reactors, do you? Uh, no? It's amazing that you privates ever made it to space. Okay, look. I know you guys probably have a lot of amazing technology and stuff, but could you not be so condescending 
We're trying to be friendly here. I'd rather not be friends with a species of hairless monkeys that spends entire work days mindlessly checking their social network news feeds. All right, uh, I guess we're not exchanging Facebook friends requests, sir. Uh, but at the very least, can you let us observe you guys a little? We really are excited to meet you. And there's so much that we can learn from you. Uh, uh, please, we'll make sure to stay out of your way. Do whatever you want. Can we go now? Yeah, we promise that we won't be any trouble. It'll be like we don't even exist. If only... Ah! What the flying track foot is that? What? That? That thing you sent? What the weed-eating boot hole did you send? Oh, that. Oh, it, it, it's a Von Neumann probe. A what? You know, a, a self-replicating nanomachine. It absorbs material from the surrounding environments to duplicate itself. We figured that, since you're so far ahead of us, that we'd need to learn knowledge at an exponential rate in order to catch up. A self-replicating nanomachine? Are you insane? Do you have any idea how many levels of dangerous that is? No, 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 they're perfectly safe. Uh, they've only been programmed to absorb knowledge. They should stop replicating once they have enough probes to scan all your technology. Oh, God! They're devouring our moon! Uh, they, um... It might need a little more expansion than we thought. Uh, exactly how advanced are you guys? Sweet mother of the stars, they've eaten the entire population of Arianex. Oops. No, please, not the planet Skok. Oh, God, turn them off, turn them off, quickly. Uh, yeah, um, the off switch. Uh, see, uh, the, the, the thing is... Uh, hello, um... Is everything all right? You know, um, are you still there? Hey, if you're not all dead, could could you send us back our von Neumann probes? Uh, also, we're very sorry about the inconvenience. Uh, probably you should have said that first. You know what? You're probably busy, so we'll just leave you to it. Uh, call us back if you need anything. Communications link terminated. End of story. The Shriek, written by Calamity Comet. Psychic blinds glowed, and the appraiser felt the shield slip away over the edges of his ship. He focused on the blue and green terrestrial hothouse in his scopes, though from its sun. It was a hot one. The appraiser did its breathing exercises and held the world firmly in its mind's eye. He slipped the world's boundaries of the ship and leapt across the astral plane. He felt the black of space in his face. He felt the coolness of the immediate boundary layer through which all psychic energy flowed. His superiors had an interest in this blue marble. He was to probe its psychic defenses. He was to determine whether it could defend itself. And if it could not. The two men in suits parked their car. The walk into the Pentagon was a long one, and it was a hot summer. Jeffrey Bullock was sweating by the time he got inside. An aide handed him a bottled water and let him know his superiors wanted him downstairs, as soon as possible. What's this about, Jeff? asked Dan. Daniel Tran was a Space Force upper brass, not predisposed to useless questions or idle panic. Bullock shrugged. Uh, it's about the Kaifer Belt object. I know that much. Civilian agencies are still classifying it as a comet, as far as I know. The object had made a course correction outside the orbit of Neptune, and looked odd, unnatural. In addition to that, ever since it entered the current orbit, certain metrics had become altered. Data flowing into the Pentagon had become unexplainably strange. Bullock worked with metadata, and he desperately hoped there was an explanation for the data his people were getting. The appraiser shook his shaggy head again. I have detected no evidence of psychic awareness, no evidence of training, no evidence of organized application of basic psychic laws. Species E appears neither aware that the psychic realm exists, nor disciplined in their own mental processes. Of this I am certain. His superior twisted a neck around itself in a sign of agitation. Species E is turning many of our assumptions upside down. 
Your report claims in the preamble that they possess a great latent psychic power, and then two screens later you tell me what you are telling me now. How can they also have no psychic defenses? Latent capability is not the same thing as practical experience, Abrazer said. His five hands crossed his lap. Species E could not do so much as scratch our psychic shields without regimented training, not unless they have literally limitless psychic potential. Is there a danger of that? His superior asked nervously, cracking her digits. Could they have that much power? No praiser thought for a moment. It was strange. There was always a chance, but it was so unlikely that it approached impossible. He shook his head. No. I recommend we continue psychic bombardment. They will crack shortly, and then they will welcome our armies with smiles. The room was straight out of Dr. Strangelove. Beige walls, leather chairs, a map of the world with overlaid strategic options. Bullock looked around. The room was packed. Experts from two dozen fields jockeyed for space around the table. Most had to stand. Bullock had gathered three things from the introduction. One. Object KBO-2022 was not natural. Satellite time had confirmed it was a ship. 2. The recent spike in suicides, discontentment, crime and public complaints that had escalated through July was connected to some kind of signal the object was broadcasting in a way that could not be accurately measured. 3. The lobby snack machine was out of pretzels. Please ask the staff then they'll get you something as soon as the next shipment comes in. A short man in a blazer cleared his throat. Everyone looked at the man and stood up. My name is Terry Cantrell. I work with psychics. After the laughter had died down, he stayed standing. While many of you may find my field amusing, the government does not. And after today, I assure you that you will all change your minds. Terry then went on a blitz of a PowerPoint. MK Ultra, MK Often, the Montauk Project, the Edgewood Arsenal, Pleasant Prairie. It was all real, and Terry had been there. People around the table looked nervously at the politicians in attendance, but they simply nodded along. As scientists sunk deeper into the chairs, a chemist coughed. Are we sure any of this sort of science stuff is legit? Nobody so much as laughed. Terry continued. He went into the effects of psychological bombardment. He went into the child brain reading experiments at Pleasant Prairie. He described a recent spike connected to the Kiefer Belt object as consistent with what they would expect from a psychic attack. And then he reached the end of the slide titled Countermeasures. It was blank. Our experiments during the 70s and 80s were shot down for a reason. We developed a whole lot of theory, but not a lot of practical experience. We can tell you what the astral plane looks like, conceptually, but hell if we could actually go there. We can tell you what the psychic warfare would look like, Terry said, gesturing towards the radio image of the KBO spacecraft, but we didn't have the experimental ability to test it. Until now. A woman near the edge of the table pointed at Terry. So all that bad psychic juju we were beaming at the Soviet Union didn't do shit. Now the room laughed. A Russian agent who was attending as a guest crossed his arms and didn't say anything. Terry shook his head. Humans seem tremendously powerful at sending those kinds of signals. But we're no good at receiving them. We need both sides of the coin to develop these conceptual abilities. Those messages we sent the USSR, which were real, by the way, likely contributed zilch to their collapse. He nodded at the Russian agent. No offense. As the meeting adjourned, Terry motioned towards Bollock to follow him. Then, as a group of a few others diverged from the main group in the lobby and went down an elevator, eighty stories down, Terry looked at Bullock. You work with metadata? Bullock nodded stiffly. Good boy, do I have some slides for you? Appraiser was going crazy with boredom. Five standard cycles of psychic bombardment had come and gone. Target species E was exhibiting only the most minor of effects. 
Rates of crime and suicide creeped up with incredible slowness. De Preza snorted. He was a professional. This was weapons-grade psychic power. Why was Species E barely affected? How could a species with that much latent power be so damn bad at feeding the effects? Unless... The human experts crowded around a table in one of the Pentagon's secret observation rooms. A woman named Marlene was led in. She shook all of their hands, but she seemed like she was in a confused daze. This is Marlene. She works at a social media company, Harry said, gesturing at the others. I'm not allowed to release the details per her lawyer's orders. I, I think introductions are in order. As they all broke into small talk, Terry directed some lab techs setting up equipment in the other room. Tables, stands, and a lot of expensive-looking equipment that Bollock knew nothing about took shape in the other room. It was all behind a two-way mirror, set currently to function as a simple window. Despite his ignorance as to the details, Bullock gathered what was going on. They were going to try and contact the ship with a psychic response of some kind. Around that time, Terry cleared his throat. We in the government don't have a ton of options right now. We're being contacted by extraterrestrials in a medium we barely understand. Based on the effects of the messages, they appear hostile. He let the words sink in. We have decided to try and send a return message using equipment developed in the 80s. It's not foolproof. Most of our death subjects are long since deceased. Marlene here is a willing volunteer. Marlene swallowed. But detecting the tension in the room, she then smiled and gave a thumbs up. Hi, everybody, she said awkwardly. I've been told by the government I may possess the appropriate skills. So here I am. Bollock looked at Terry. And those appropriate skills are? I'm glad you asked, Jeff. He opened the door to the other room. Marlene, could you take a seat? I think it is time we begin. Appraiser urgently hailed his superiors. He demanded they raise the psychic shield to maximum power. He told them his theory. He believed that the resistance that they encountered from Species E was another symptom of their obliviousness to the psychic world. Their latent power was not just impressive, it must be off the charts. Due to the poor receptivity, they had to force everything through a psychic realm with incredible power just to get the smallest of emotional responses from their own kind. Perhaps their own inability to feel psychic energy had developed as an evolutionary response to protect them from their own psychic power. Whatever the reason was, it was bad news. It meant that they knew about the psychic realm and tried to send a message out into space. I want you to take three deep breaths, Marlene. Four seconds in. Hold for seven. Breathe out for eight. While Terry walked Marlene through the preliminary steps, the technicians explained the machinery to Bollock. This is the psychically enabled brain-to-computer intermediate boundary layer and symbol, the technician told him, as if the words made any sense. Marlene thinks into this. We gesture to the EKG tabs, and the signal goes up and out the Pentagon roof into space from here. He gestured at the machinery. We used these a lot in the 80s, and don't listen to Terry. They absolutely did contribute to the Soviet collapse. Terry sheepishly grinned. Maybe a little, he said, making a gesture with his forefinger and thumb. We used a lot of power in those experiments, but we'll be using only a fraction of that for this test. Bollock. Faulty stomach got up. Bollock watched Marlene as she was finishing up the breathing exercises. I still never got an answer. Why have they picked you to send out the first message? Marlene took a final deep breath. I, uh, I work for Facebook. The lawyer shook her head. I worked for an unspecified social media company. I was a content management analyst. And that means what exactly? Asked Bollock, shaking his head. I browsed the site, checking reported posts and comments to determine if they violated our standards. I saw a lot of crazy stuff. Cartel killings, smut films, all sorts of sexual stuff. 
the brick video, you name it. Nice sort. Worse than you can guess. Terry shook his head. And you are barely compensated. Sad state of affairs. But now we can use those memories for something productive. The aliens are hell-bent on sending us hostile psychic energy. Fine. Let's send a little back. He motioned towards Marlene to begin when ready. The technician escorted Bullock and the others out of the room. Terry poked Bullock. I hope you are writing this down, he said, gesturing at the monitors. Do we think this will have any effect? Bullock asked Terry, as the machinery powered up. No. Terry said bluntly, There is no reason an alien race that develops psychic warfare wouldn't be able to defend against one that hasn't. It's not like our latent powers are that high, right? This will barely scratch the paint on their mental shield. It's just to let them know that we know what's up. A technician spoke up over the intercom. When you're ready, Marlene, please recall the video or image that caused you distress during your past employment. Visualize it in your mind. On command, I want you to hold it on the top of your head. Take a deep breath and focus it at the EKG tabs on your scalp. Feel it pass into the machinery. Feel it exiting the room. Let it go. Let your discretion please begin. When the shriek hit the fleet, the brazer barely had time to feel the psychic shields collapse under the strain. It was instant. They had diverted power from weapons and engines. They diverted it from non-essential functions. Administrative AI focused everything on the psychic shields. Throngs of psychics demanded with their minds that the shields hold. The shriek had emanated from a blue-green world that hung in space. That blasted species E had sent it. A brazer had warned of the possibility. His superiors had taken precautions. It wasn't enough. The shriek roiled through the immediate boundary layer, traversing far faster than light. It practically boiled up through the mentalist shields. It melted minds. Every alien it killed became fuel for it to amplify its own signal. It became mimetic, aware of its own existence. The most dangerous kind of psychic weapon. Alarm spread. The astral plane went black. The energy jabbed violently at his third eye. Abraza screamed. He held out his arms. He fought it tooth and claw. He opposed it with all of his might. It was not stopped for even a second as it ate his mind up too. End of story. Story number one. Hero of Antelope's Run. In the corner of a bar sat a young man, harrowed beyond his years and with eyes that had seen terrible things out there in the depths of space. He drank, slept, and ate for free. If anyone asked the barman why they'd get told, he was the hero of Antelope's Run. If anyone asked the man in person, well, they got another story entirely. Tonight was one of those nights. A young Vulcrum asked him just why he was called that. I'm not a hero. Here, let me tell you why. Now, when I was younger, I wanted to join the Navy, except they didn't really care to hire me. So I ended up washed out, up at a bar, kind of like this one. On that night, bar was empty, but for me, and two other regulars. Oh, and the barman. So those two regulars, Captain Jeb, owned an old tramp freighter. Half dead it was, same as him. Never left the station. Then there was Molly, crack pilot once, then ended up getting hooked on Regalus. The man paused and looked at his drink. So there we were. Then everything went to hell. Entire station shook and groaned. Then we red alert went off. Unholy noise it was. Only thing worse was the silence after. Lights went out. Pretty sure that was life support went too. We'd all be dead except for Captain Jeb started yelling. The man paused to put on a slight accent, trying to impersonate a man long since gone. Stow to the bridge! Head for the antelope now! The accent was dropped. If he'd not been yelling well, told us the station reactor was going to explode. 
So him, Molly, and me ran for the docks. We got there, and there were more people than I'd ever seen in the bar. Jeb didn't miss a beat. Told them to get the void suits and get in the hold. Was gonna be cold, bumpy, and airless. But it was better than sitting on a station waiting for it to explode. The man stopped again to take a drink. He'd now acquired a small audience, several of the Vulcrum, and a few other species. And even a few of the larger races had pulled over barstools to listen. Well, then what? One of the crowd asked. Well, then, Jeb asked Molly, can you navigate? And asked him who was needed for the crew. Now, old Jeb said that it was just three that we needed. The captain, Molly, and me. Made me prouder than I'd ever been. We got her away just as the station went up. The old captain fired the main engines to get us away in time. Now that kind of force put some strain on you, and the captain lost a long war with his heart with that. We came to, and uh, we knew he'd not wake. Another pause, and the crowd looked at each other. Dying straits, indeed. So Molly took the helm and then the nav, and I took the carbon engineer board. Molly worked like a lunatic. Never seen anything like it. Jumped us three times, shaking like a leaf and going through DT. The man shook his head forlornly. Almost the entire bar was listening. Several had ordered new drinks for the speaker. She'd have been nothing short of a miracle in her heyday. So three jumps down, just one more left. Then the ship's alarms went off. The seals giving out after all the abuse, losing air fast. Well, the bridge only had one suit left. Well, luck is impartial. So I started a task of heads or tails. Didn't finish it. Molly knocked me out. Came to, was in the suit and Molly was strapped down, hands on the console, smiling like a lunatic. Ice on her face and in her hair. Instructions on screen on how to get home. And a message for old shipmates telling them that she died clean. So, I did as I was told. Made the jump like she said, everyone calling me a hero. Wasn't me, I just did what I was told. When they tell you of the hero of Antelope's run, you tell them the real heroes were Molly and Jeb. The man finished his story, and the bar was silent for a while. Unsure of how to respond, eventually the man finished his drink and stood Someone called out. So what's your name then? The man laughed. Doesn't matter, was all he said as the door swung shut behind him. End of story. Story number two. A Sliver of Humanity, written by British Tea Company. There are many names for the creatures that invaded our galaxies. The shadows for them black forms that came in from the stars. The World Eaters, for their habit of stripping every planet of its resources. Some call them demons, devils, all their bloodthirstiness and willingness to slaughter all those who get in their way. In recent times, we've called them the soulless ones. For under those opaque screens, we do not see their eyes, and we cannot look into their souls. The Faceless, or the Masked, are also popular names. Every attempt at communication has failed. Every attempt at contact has failed. We know not of the enemy, but the roars of their weapons as they descend upon our cities and the incomprehensible chatter across their channels. Many have attributed them to be the closest form to pure evil and life form can possibly achieve. Indeed, through the countless worlds, they have rendered lifeless. It is easy to see why that is. But can a race of pure evil exist in the vast universe? Is it possible for a society of something such as themselves to truly enter existence completely devoid of compassion, love, and filled with nothing but hatred possible? We thought not, and I have bright news, for it is not possible. The battle for Kovu City has taught us differently. Originally, we had many theories on the faceless. Through the recovered corpses of their soldiers, we see the heavy genetic tampering exists amongst their warriors. They wish to be stronger, faster, better. Perhaps a sign at once that their race was physically weak, 
requiring only mastery of knowledge and the sciences to survive on their world. That is a tangent that could be explored, but I only want to talk about the Faceless' aim on morality. Recall the footage of Kovu City and see that loop. Look closely. The Faceless soldier, designated as a Praetorian by our military strategists, is a gigantic specimen. Heavy genetic engineering has made them colossal in relation to most members of their kind, and we see them commonly used to devastate our lines with weapons that belong more on tanks than in the hands of a soldier. But it is one in particular I want to draw attention to. Let me slow down this footage. Watch as the detonation knocks the faceless down to the ground. Watch as the Praetorian breaks cover to aid his kin. That is not a weapon he's deployed. That's an energy shield that belongs on a vehicle, not in the gauntlet of a soldier. Does this footage prove something about the faceless? It surely does. Answer me this. For all the evil we attribute to their kind, why would one of them willingly leave the safety of cover to help an injured member of this race? To perform what any could hear could consider a selfless act. It requires compassion rather than fiendish bravery. It was brotherhood and kinship that motivated that act, not the typical bloodthirstiness and warmongering acts which we would dilute the faceless to. And, at the end of the day, they have faces. They have souls. Look at the way the injured soldier and his helmet removed by the Praetorian. Look at the way the faceless in white runs over and kneels down, accompanied by what is clearly bodyguards. Look as how the Praetorian shields begin to fail. The faceless in white continues to work diligently upon his injured squad mate. If they have kinship between themselves, then our theories that they have a hive mind or genetically weapons simply cannot be true. From what we've discovered so far, the faceless have a name for themselves. And I would like to see more than just a slight sliver of what it means to be Terran. End of story. Story number three. Another sliver of humanity. Written by British Tea Company. The Faceless never removed their helmets willingly. At least, that's what was known currently. From what a reconnaissance team was transmitting now, however, that clearly was no longer the case. There was a pair of faces a few hundred meters away, walking alone in the ruins of the city. The first one was a giant among its kind, wearing the notorious Praetorian armor. The other was Sean and Lee. Both wore the opaque face shields that gave them faceless their name. The reconnaissance team sent their footage. If there was any functioning form of recording, they had hoped it worked. Antares was a large man even before the countless enhancements he subjected himself throughout the years. The slash below his cheek had done little to wan his appearance of being a warrior. Mere presence alone was enough to quell all but the boldest as far as the Emperor of the Terran Empire was concerned. If it wasn't for the fact that the Emperor enjoyed toying with the pistol that never left his side, it was perhaps at this moment he was wearing enough armor to make most tank crews green with envy. And the plethora of ordnance he was carrying right now looked like it belonged more in artillery corps than on a single man. If Emperor and Terrence, however, had the capacity to make another man tremble throughout mere presence, it was his companion who would make any being go down to his knees with a flick of her finger. Brown Princess Andromeda at one point had her father's eyes, but brown pupils were now a piercing purple. Her hair, once brown like both parents, was bleached of all colors, leaving it a ghostly white. Perhaps, if it wasn't for the fact Andromeda never smiled or the ambient creep of dread upon any living being's psyche, she would be considered precious to many. Only one person truly valued her companionship, even if it meant to be an occasional bouts of physical pain. This is the spot, the Emperor began as he tossed his helmet down and knelt down on the area. His offspring looked at it with longing eyes 
as she stood on her toes to be able to rest herself against his shoulder. Terran bombardments had almost pounded this area into a flat wasteland, yet the spot remained. Perhaps as a reminder to the royal family what had been taken from them. It's when my mother died, Andromeda began. Her frown cut a bit deeper than usual as she knelt down at it. Yes, I feel it. Pain, sorrow, betrayal, loss, despair. She felt it here at the moment of her death, just like we both felt it when we heard the news. Nantaris twitched a little. He stood up and sighed. They ask me why I come to this galaxy to grind these aliens to dust. They ask me why I bring the hammer of terror down upon them. This is why, my wife, your mother, nothing more than a peaceful visitor to a foreign galaxy, murdered like some kind of criminal interloper. Such, such. It was at a loss of words, enough so that Andromeda raised a finger just enough to bring a minor amount of solace into his head. Father, Andromeda asked after knowing her father was placated. Can you make me a promise? What is it? Promise me that you will not leave like Mother did. Antares ever knelt to four people in his lifetime. His father, his mother, his wife, and now his child. I promise. Pain, loss, sorrow, anger. We know all too well now that the faceless are just like us. They are not souls. They are not demons. They act out of vengeance because they believe that they were wrong. We see a sliver again of what it's like to be a terror. To succumb to the emotions is natural for any creature. And it is in this that we should also see ourselves. It is time that we heal old wounds. Peace must be restored. End of story. Collective, written by underscore sky, underscore, underscore. Karol knew his information would shock the Galactic Assembly, but it was his duty to report his findings about this new species. But how he would do it would determine a lot about their future relations. There is no doubt in my uh, main processing unit that Terrans are the most peaceful civilization in the galaxy. But I do understand there are those who still find it hard to believe and consider the term peaceful civilization to be an oxymoron. Many individuals present in the crowd nodded with their head, but a majority stood still. After all, every civilization is forged through conflict and warfare without exception. Admittedly, mankind has a share of wars, but only minor skirmishes. We are still in the process of the first contact protocol, but their history data, backed by data collected by our scout drones, indicated the validity of their claims. Now, almost everyone in the audience looked surprised. It was not unusual for some new species to try and sell the story of being peaceful in order to have an element of surprise on their potential future opponents like nobody had tried that strategy before. Yes, my fellow sapient, it is true that you have heard about the Terran's homeworld. Not a single significant nuclear-scale war ever erupted there. Our gasps of surprise could be heard from the few aliens which were until then most vigorous skeptics in this whole peaceful civilization nonsense. Stealthily, one tall individual rose, a prominent general in his own species, his body genetically upgraded to perfection by himself, his mind adapted with the sole purpose of tactical, strategic reasoning. I refuse to believe such nonsense. It is obvious we are dealing with a ruse. Your senses have been deceived slash hacked, and the data corrupted. Commotion rushed through the assembled audience, sound of their voices rising, and many of them could not do anything but agree. The Karar held his calm, respectful general, his voice now strong, as that was the only way to communicate with such a person. I do understand your view on this matter, and if you have any doubts about collected data, I implore you to double-check it yourself. I most certainly will, and my race will fully prepare for the incoming war, as it is obvious these Terrans are planning to take us by surprise. And with those words, the general left the assembly. Few others followed, 
but Corral continued with his presentation nonetheless. Now I wish to talk more about the Terran history, but what will surprise you even more is that they ever had only two planetary wars, or as they call them, the World Wars. Truly unbelievable when you take into account that on average every spacefaring species needs at least average 33 of those conflicts to move on to the space warfare. Following those words, one of the prominent military historians rose up. He was an even more respected figure, as he only specialized into the history of wars he personally participated at. What made him historical expert in around 42 conflicts? Excuse me, if you may, sir. But what is the reason for such deviation from the norm? After all, my own species held the title of least amount of world wars until the space age, and we had 17 of them. Thus, I conclude there must have been some distinct geographical features to facilitate severe lack of world wars. Again, many in the assembly nodded with their head. There were the cases of species which only had a one medium-sized continent on their planet, or some empire was able to come on top early in their history. However, such empires, faced with no external threat, would always stagnate until they collapsed into the number of lesser states, which would then eventually engage in warfare. But it was theorized that there existed a chance of such empire lasting well into the space age. Ah, yes. I see most of you rushed here and probably had no time to go over the specific data regarding their homeworld. To continue, Kara activated the hologram in front of the assembly, which showed them the perfect representation of her. Now, as you see, there are no specific geographical features which prohibited or discourage a world war. The planet is filled with regular-sized continents, and thus... But before he could finish his words, the respectful historian interrupted him. This can't be... For reason's sake, just look at that continent there, riddled with pronunciates. It is like geographical quagmire created to agitate war and conflict. Garan didn't even have to look to know which of the continents the historian was referring to. Yes, respected member of the assembly, the continent you pointed to is called Europe, and has been the source of both world wars for their species experienced. For a few moments, everything was quiet. Nobody knew what to say. Then suddenly, Ridiculous! You insult my profession and my honor. To claim there is a sapient species which could not be forced into constant warfare in this geographical nightmare of a planet. Just look at it. I do understand your disbelief, but it is true. I was surprised as anyone else. However, facts are facts, and data is data. The historian then did the same as the general, but before walking out, he tossed a few violent complaints about Lunatic, who made him travel a few thousand light years for nothing. Supposedly, he wanted to see in person this historic event, only to find himself listening to a mentally ill individual. So, Kara went on. After all, he expected there would be incidents like this. So now, when we rushed over the geological landscape upon which Terran civilization developed, I wish to go over their biology. This time, nobody interrupted for a long time. As he went in details about their genetic makeup, internal structure, and aspects of their main processing unit, which obviously had an extreme effect on their psychology. He even got a few applause from a couple of hive mind representatives slash drones. Then, he went over their immune system, tissue composition, and specific environmental adaptation. The assembly found it interesting as Terrans were actually the first sapient species which possessed sweating type of heat dispersal system. A few biologists eventually went into serious questioning about sweat delivery system, its capacity, etc. Finally, as Kara was about to finish, one of the biologists rose up to ask an additional question. He asked respectful member of the assembly, there is something you would wish to ask? Well, yes. He nodded with his head. He actually had a head. You went into extreme details regarding their biology, functioning of the drones, and they seem to be extremely autonomous. They even reproduce amongst themselves. Truly amazing. Sounds of agreement could be heard from almost every biologist and hive mind representative drone in the room. The biologist continued. So is that how their queen manages to control billions of them with ease, 
as her body doesn't have to spend any energy on building up the population. Instead, it can focus solely on the aspects of ruling the hive. This question caught Karan off guard, even confused him for a bit. Excuse me, respected biologist, Karan spoke slowly, but what specifically are you talking about? His response was quick and fluid. Well, isn't it obvious? Most of the hive minds have a critical population limit, and upon breaching it, they often separate into two or more groups. What in the turn leads to a conflict and warfare? But here, you've presented a hive mind species whose biology somewhat bypassed the problem by outsourcing the reproduction to its drones. This has been theorized by many biologists as plausible, but unlikely. Thus, we are extremely excited to learn more about their control and communication system. Only now, Kara figured out the obvious misconceptions others got about humans. But he did not want the situation to escalate as the two others before that, so he tried to be polite. Well, uh, the matter of fact is uh, they do not actually have a centralized governing structure in the form of a queen or any other biological organism. They are quite decentralized. Instantly, a commotion and whispers started floating around the assembly, everybody present looking completely stunned. But the respected biologist continued speaking. You mean to say they have a decentralized hive mind? Biological one at that. We only ever thought it possible with synthetic organisms. This, this is marvelous. Kara face slapped himself, as he very well knew how hive minds thought slash work. Every species which evolved as a hive mind, always without exception, had a problem with rebellious, isolated drones, and different queens fighting each other was a norm. But evolution, always favoring the queen, which either had better or more numerous armor. But biology had its limits, even when given billions of years to move forward. Respected biologist, Kara went on, as you say, humans are a marvelous species, but I am not sure they would even qualify as a hive mind, because they do not have queens, and their uh, drones are highly autonomous, though they do seem to possess an extraordinary case of collective intelligence. He hoped to steer the topic onto a more friendly ground for the hive minds, and adopted his line of talk accordingly. Like some hive minds, Terrans have a considerable information lag, but far more substantial than any known hive mind. Regardless, they overcome it with high autonomy of their drones, which can build up a large amount of knowledge and experience into their main processing unit. All right, spoke the biologist, but how do they exchange you? Some form of electromagnetic waves, bioluminescence, or, well, actually, Terrans use verbal conversation and only minor gestures to communicate in between. Regardless of the topic, radio waves only came in after they discovered electricity, etc. Verbal conversation? Ah. Oh. The biologist and the hive mind representative slash drones were as confused and as surprised as it gets. Their own respective species all had far faster ways to communicate between biological individuals. It wasn't like they never used sound, but it was always a second or third method of communication, never the first. It is true they were, exchange information and solve problems together using only signals transmitted by sound. Some internal discussion escalated between the few hive minds, debate and arguments about functionality of such biologicals, their advantages and flaws. At first, they all agreed it was certainly a military advantage not to worry about losing a queen, but the tactical performance of the troops, which were not directed in unison, certainly lowered quality of their soldiers' fleets. Still, the biologist voiced over the others and continued, how were they able to avoid so many of the world wars and never attack each other with nuclear weapons? From what I was able to gather, their leaders were always afraid that it would cause a mutual self-destruction, and thus avoided it. Kara answered, Oh, leaders, they do not have queens, but do have individual leaders. So you say they are not hive-minded at all, or due to them being so decentralized, there are individual drones leaders, which act as control nodes for their unified sentience. Hmm, you could say so. But at the moment, I'd put Terran somewhere between the loosened hive mind and individualistic species. What followed next was not expected. The same respected biologist, which was eager to speak, 
suddenly broke out into laughter. <laughs> oh, sir, your sense of humor is extreme. I almost fell for your joke. First you say they are a peaceful civilization. Then they are individualist with collective intelligence. <laughs> Any more oxymoron you can throw at us. Now it's true. When it comes to Terrans, they are able to work together with thousands upon thousands of them to solve the problems of the individual. And while other individualistic species focus solely on the extreme intellect and exceptional individuals, mankind instead tends to work together. Individualistic species were famous slash notorious amongst the hive minds for their exceptional drones, some of which rivaled the intellect of the queens. But they always lacked team and collective reasoning to get most of their main processing unit. Please do not waste our time on this nonsense, the biologist spoke. Individualistic species are dependent on extremely intelligent individuals who accomplish great things. Far above the capabilities of main processing unit the humans have. Yes, they are far smarter than any drone, but compared to you and me, their mental capabilities are wanting to say the least. Now we understood why many of them first thought humans were a high fight species. Immediately after he went over the biology, after all, their main processing unit were barely fit the size of the galactic norm are not very complex or efficient when it comes to advanced biological processing algorithms. The only thing they had going for them was the dismal energy requirements individual Terran main processing units required. I know Terrans do seem too alien, too unrealistic to most, but they do exist, and for our first contact with them is of the extreme importance. Yes, they are not individually intelligent to technically be considered sapient, certainly not when compared to me or any other member of the individualistic species, where only minimal communication is required for transfer of extremely complex ideas, and where a single person can basically come up with everything it needs, learn every skill it deemed necessary on a whim. But our main processing unit is so fine-tuned by a relentless evolution of intelligence that we got too accustomed to those abilities, and I say that we can learn a lot from the Terrans. What could we possibly learn from, as you admit, mentally handicapped species? The biologist erupted. His own species, after all, was one of the most intelligent individualistic organisms in the galaxy. But Kara could not be interrupted. He continued his speech. Imagine if our individualistic species could work together as them to have our own research teams and joint research organizations. Imagine what we could do with our large main processing units if creatures so mentally handicapped like the Terrans could form a space-faring civilization. Then, imagine what we could do. Their main processing unit weighs only around 1.5 kg of organic matter. They can't even do quantum equations in their head, but have built the quantum computers anyway. Preposterous! the biologist erupted. You talk nonsense! How can any individual construct a quantum computer without being able to solve quantum equations? They are clearly a hive mind. The entire assembly erupted. Discussion heated. Biologists started debating each other, the hive minds joining in to recheck the data provided by Kara. But you don't see. It all makes sense. Every species we know in our galaxy evolved through ruthless warfare and purging of inferiors. Humans simply never had that happen in any significant scale. They moved towards technology far before acquiring intelligence we usually see necessary for it. He then pointed at the biologist. Look at yourself. Your own species evolved as super apex predators on your planet even before you knew fire. Both your brain and body developed so you could hunt by yourself, not in a pack. It was not so for the humans. The biologist countered. Well, of course. That is how intelligence rises at individualistic species. Once the single super predator appears able to pursue and outsmart any prey in its biosphere, thus having plenty of energy to power its large brain, or seduce slash mate more females, quickly they end up fighting and outwitting each other. Evolution quickly does the rest. Any animals which hunt in packs have to share its prey, 
Plus, they are always there to help each other. Thus, evolution is not so strict. Even weak and less intelligence have had a chance to reproduce and survive in such an environment. Not really a catalyst for development of intelligence. Following those words, the entire assembly rose up and started to applaud him in their own specific way. But Terrans do exist. They are here. I have data. They are real. And I have discovered them. Few of the hive minds already confirmed with these data was correct, and somewhat stood by Carol, but not overly eager to agree with him on his conclusions. The biologist then replied to all of them, It is clear the Terrans are too lacking in individual intelligence to be considered an individualistic species. Their drones might be highly autonomous, their governing structure decentralized, but I conclude they are still a hive. True, they are unusual, far out of the norm, but hive mine nonetheless. That is simply not true, the rest bug. They are individualistic, but just communicate between themselves a lot, share massive amounts of information and such. Just like hive minds do. What was my point in the first place? The biologist pushed his theory. Well, your species communicates too, is it not? For mating purposes, diplomacy with other species, etc., but not closely to the extent that Terrans do. Data you provided on average communication rate and bandwidth of individual humans more than fits the norm for drones. Without hesitation, the present hive minds agreed in unison. To them too, Terrans seem far more a hive mind than anything else. One of them stating that even the Kura himself said that human drones have the type of collective intelligence. Well, yes. They work together far more than other individualistic species, because they have to. They do not have 13 kilogram heavy main processing unit, nor do they live for 513 years, so they have to rely on each other far more. Just like us hive minds, a few of the drones spoke in unison. Obviously, the biologist rushed in with his opinion. Thus, I'll put forward the suggestion that we officially classify them as a hive mind species and leave it to the hive minds to deal with one of their own. We already fight too much against each other. The last thing we need is a war between individualistic species and hive minds, all due to one confused collective intelligence which is not aware of what it is. We agree. The drones again spoke in unison. And that is basically how the well-known Terran Collective got classified as a hive mind by every other species of the galaxy, except by themselves. Many saw it as the first recorded case of a bipolar hive mind which has serious identity problems. But the facts are the facts, and data is data. End of story. Story number one. Uplifting the human. Written by something touches back. Ambassador Franklin studied his own gloss a bit before answering. They are giving us quite a data dump. Not just technology, but also galactic politics. A little bit of biology and history of the major member species. And recently, they've started introducing us as a sort of non-sentient curiosities that will run into out there. All in all, they seem to be doing everything in their power to uplift us as fast as possible, to the point where we can participate actively in the galactic immunity. But, said President Armon, your words sound good, but your tone and body language say that you are worried. I can't put my finger on it, but my counterpart amongst the Gessel Ambassador Skizrik seems, I don't know, concerned. It's like every time he gives us something new when we talk about it later, he seems uh, surprised at what we did with it. I feel like we are flailing some kind of test or something. But he keeps coming back with more? Yes. Perhaps then we aren't failing his test so much as averting it. What do you mean? President Armand sipped his drink and then sat back a bit. Let me tell you about a cat my family used to have. Snuggles was born a barn cat, but soon enough adapted to indoor-slash-outdoor life of our suburban neighborhood. He was affectionate, well-behaved, and an absolute terror to the local rodent population. But one night, when he was about six or seven years old, 
Snuggles jumped up on our dining table before we had a chance to clear the dinner dishes away. He had never jumped up on the table before, and I wanted to stop that behavior immediately. So I dashed over to the table, scooped him up, and tossed him out onto the porch in the pouring rain. However, the next night he jumped up onto the table again. So again I tossed him out into the wet and cold. This went on for a week. By the end of the week, the cat had learned, and for the rest of his life, whenever he wanted to go outside, he would jump up on the dining room table and stare at me. Ambassador Franklin chuckled. <laughs> Good story. But how does it apply? Ambassador Skizrik may be trying to teach us something with these gifts, and maybe what we are learning isn't what he is intending to teach us. From Ambassador Skrizik, Earth Posting, Liaisons to Humans. To Director Thuzd, Department of New Species Integrations. I regret to inform you that uplifting the humans continues to be a confounding and is veering off plan in unexpected directions. Rather than trying to explain in general terms, allow me to present two examples from which you can draw your conclusions. Example 1. Several rotations of the planet ago, we introduced them to Daugts. Those prolific and vivacious pests that thrive in the small recesses of spacecraft and have doomed many with their destructive chewing of vital systems. We provided the humans with a small breeding population with the hope that they would understand the threat and devise ingenious methodologies with dealing with the infestation of doubts. Today, the human ambassador Franklin thanked me profusely for providing them with such a wonderful, renewable food source for long space missions and assured me that they taste like a human food source called chicken. I recommend that we send out a bulletin making all planets and stations aware that any visiting human spacecraft will probably have a considerable population of doubts on board and should follow necessary containment procedures. Example 2. As per protocol, we presented the humans with designs for the more commonly used FTL field generators, along with their benefits and issues. This included a Type A Arknot generator, with the explanation that, while the design is simple and inexpensive to construct, it should never be attempted due to its inherent instability and propensity to blow up with enough energy to break apart an asteroid. I should have not been surprised when the first thing the humans did was develop a Type A Agnot generator into an effective asteroid mining tool. They seem to be completely unaware of the difference between a warning and a suggestion. Any advice is appreciated, but I must warn you in advance, will probably prove futile. Humans just think differently. End of story. Story number two. Fourth Contact, written by Provisional Rebel. The Rexath were the first to discover humans. They were a primitive people on a cold, desolate world that should not have been able to support. It was only after some observation that it was discovered that the caves they'd returned to were actually some form of ship which was trapped beneath the ice and snow. Scans indicated it was massive, but even with the interference of the ice around it, it was obviously both underpowered and dying, with energy readings declining at a slow but predictable rate, almost a year to a day after their discovery, a subspace transmission was detected from the planet. It read simply, Perdua at Estra Pegasus. After this, no further activity was detected. Research teams discovered the bodies of the last survivors huddled together in the reactor room, having apparently committed suicide together, in the last place of warmth enough to breathe without equipment. Of course, further studies determined the ship had been designed as a sleeper colony, a sublight vessel. This posed a number of issues. First, was there were no planets within a reasonable distance they could have made such a journey from. Second, they obviously had subspace technology, which indicate they must have some understanding of FTL travel. Still, with their deaths, it was a mere curiosity for the Raxeth scientists to ponder as one of the crew's final acts had apparently been to destroy the computer core. Then, humans were discovered for the second time by the Atrai. At least, the shattered hulk of a ship was having apparently crashed during a deceleration maneuver. 
They saw little use in investigating the site, but gave permission for the Raxith scientists to set up a research facility to compare it to the previously discovered colony ship. When the computer core was discovered, it was determined that an attempt to restore and clean information was prudent. Once power had been restored in this attempt, however, a subspace transmitter activated. Power had been lost before it was able to make the final call, which had somehow remained undisturbed in its buffers. It read, Peradu at Astra Shenlong. No useful data was available as computer seemingly disabled itself upon transmission of the message. The third time the humans had been discovered was the first true contact situation. The Malek were expanding into a new sector, conquering planets as necessary when they entered a system that was bristling with activity. They demanded their immediate surrender of the system and were met with a dazzling display of firepower from the native defense fleet. The ensuing action was a decisive defeat for the Malek's navy and the first shots of war which would take 13 standard years to come to a close. The humans were outmanned in almost every engagement, but never outgunned. Still, it was a losing proposition for them. The Malik had a massive industrial base which they used as a blunt tool to match the surgical precision by which the humans had fought. The humans could win every engagement and still lose in the end, as they never seemed able to replace their losses nearly as fast as was necessary to stem the tide. Finally, the humans had been beaten back to their homeworld, and the end had come. They had offered peace throughout the war, but the Malak were too enraged to hear them out. The humans were a clear and present threat to their empire, and could not be allowed to survive. But once the Malak had entered that system, there was no more talk of peace. The humans deployed a horrific weapon that had yet to be seen, which devastated their enemies but it all seemed to have been a final measure taken too late. The final three years of the war occurred exclusively within their home system. At the end, the humans sent out a subspace transmission, a final cry into the dark. It would have been pitiful whimper to mark the dying of a race echoing forever into the universe, but it was noted as different from the previous calls the humans had marked their deaths with. It read Bellum Internesinum Unicorn, Avenge Us. This was followed by some form of encrypted data packet that has yet to be decoded. Now ships have arrived in the Raxeth space, appearing with cataclysmic thunderclap of energy. They claim that they are the United Earth Navy, responding to a transmission from a lost colony ship. End of story. The Last Stand of the Night Written by Chicken Vet. All right, people, talk to me. What have we got? There, uh, uh, not sure, sir. But it's bad, Barry. We're, we're lost contact with five systems in the last month. No traffic in or out. We send scouting sorties, naturally, but they never reported after jumping in. The Ceph are reporting similar incidents, and nothing is coming out of the Voran recovery zone either. Any word from the assembly? No agents and contacts haven't said anything. What about the Ceph's channels? We have few resources, higher places than yours. Officially, there's nothing but unofficially. Member nations across the galaxy are reporting systems going dark. Fleets are being redeployed to the room. The assembly's keeping a lid on it. As your saying goes, they don't want to cause a mass panic. Whatever this is, it's a pan-galactic problem. And then there's what happened yesterday, Colonel. Right. Yes, sir. Nineteen hours ago, Terran Standard, the fleet's second battle group, engaged a large force of unknown composition... So far, only a couple badly damaged stealth frigates have limped home. Frankly, I'm amazed they made more than two jumps, the ship they're in. But that's not the worrying part. They recorded the battle. Yeah. Holy shit. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. By the fates, mother fuck. God help those poor bastards. This is verified. Yes, sir. But there have been developments. Five hours ago, the fleet reported contact with a large fleet of completely unknown type. They've engaged over New Athens and are holding, but just barely. The enemy deployed ground forces minutes after arriving in system. The civilian population was almost completely overwhelmed, but a rushed deployment of orbital drop marines is holding the line in the capital. Twelfth Fleet has been directed to reinforce them with all haste. We need information. The enemy is unknown and we can't fight in the unknown. 
How soon can we get a recon squad on the ground for proper observation? With respect, uh, that might not be enough. We need to send people behind the lines, and we might not even be able to hold the system for more than a few days. Any recon potential is a suicide mission. <clears throat> yes, Advisor Kalther. We may have an agent you can use. He's currently deployed, but we can recall him to have him on New Athens in two days. Can your fleets hold that long? Yes. But we can't guarantee they'll be around to extract this agent. We can work out an extraction plan later. And it's just agent. I see. A nameless. Fine. Send him. Colonel, work with the advisor for to figure out how to get the agent off that rock when he's done. The entire galaxy will need to know whatever he finds. Godspeed, gentlemen. Dismissed. New Athens. Scourge War. Day 7. Zick. Crap, 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 crap. I stumbled to my feet and sprinted across the cratered hellscape that used to be a city park as more bolts of energy launched over my head. They found me. Not good, not good, not good. Oh, fates, be with me. I dove under another stone formation. The hunter drones whizzed in pursuit, blasting at the rock. It wouldn't take them long to find a way in after me. Thankfully, I only needed a few seconds. There! I popped a maintenance hatch open and dove into the tunnels under the city. I'd chosen that particular formation deliberately. For whatever reason, the enemy swarms didn't like to come down here. I didn't know why, but I wasn't complaining. The map I'd pulled up in my ocular implant display let me go wherever I needed to. These tunnels had saved my life a lot over the past few days. After a few minutes of jogging, I ducked into a service room I'd been using for a supply cache. I needed to review the intelligence I'd just gathered. My pickup window was later today. Then I still had to check out what looked like a prison camp to my low-orbit surveillance drone. Current data first, scout later. So far, I had managed to catalogue twelve varieties of planet-side swarm unit, from the little hunter drones that would just chase me, all the way up to the tank-sized armoured behemoths that would bring down an armoured troop ship in one shot. There's gotta be a uh, less cliché name than swarm. I couldn't check the insectoid imagery, though. All of the enemy troops looked like bugs. Well, except the nanite swarms, those don't look like anything. Also, new thing that. As I typed up a new entry, I considered the other find I'd made today, or rather, confirmed. The swarm units definitely had some kind of linked intelligence. Not a hive mind, though. Or if it was, the queen allowed the individuals a great deal of autonomy. But they got smarter when more were nearby, and they could share sensory data. Communications also seemed near instant, at least with ranges of a click or less. Maybe that's why they don't like tunnels. Being underground interferes with that link. Exploitable in the field, maybe. My tablet chimed as I finished the latest addition to my report. Time to go. I grabbed a few ration bars and some spare batteries from my stealth field, then headed towards the edge of the city. There was no swarm units in sight as I exited the tunnels. A nearby building, a few dozen meters tall, offered a good place to scout the prison camp. I'd already checked that it was clear, and I made my way to the top floor quickly. Why did the bug things have a prison camp? They'd always killed everyone they came across before. What were they doing rounding them up now? Maybe they're looking for a physical weakness. No, they overrun the other systems without breaking stride. They know how to kill humans and Seth. I camouflaged myself in the rubble of what had been an office of some kind, and glassed the camp with my rifle scope. Yes, it was definitely a prison camp. The prisoners, mostly human, but a few individuals of other species as well, were left to mill about in the walled area. There were a few roof-like structures on poles, I guess for protection from the elements. As I watched, a group of prisoners were forced into an area separate from the main compound. What were they doing? I dialed up the magnification. This area only had a force field containing the prisoners. I watched, in growing horror, as a cloud of nanites descended into the cage. The prisoners jerked and twitched, screaming, as the swarm did something to them. One by one, they fell to the ground, dead. What the hell was that? As far as executions went, it was terribly inefficient. An experiment. I checked the time. Still two hours until my rescue force would arrive. I turned my attention back to the camp. Another group was being led into the experiment cage. The previous bodies had been cleared away, 
the nanites descended again, and again the prisoners suffered. This time, though, a few of them got back up. Are they still alive? I dialed up the magnification again, and my heart plummeted. They were moving, yes, but I wouldn't call it alive. Their movements were unsteady, shambled. Their bodies were marked by cybernetics, just visible on the surface of their skin. Just like another swarm units, and their eyes. Their eyes glowed, a sickly yellow. Their movements were becoming more sure as they wandered around. Suddenly, I understood. The swarm captured planets, conquering their populations, then repurposed them into new swarm units. This, this enemy will be a scourge on the galaxy. I continued watching the procedure for some time, as sick as it was. I had to record as much as possible to bring back. Fine, my tablet buzzed one hour until the rescuers would arrive. I quietly packed up my nest and made my way back to the street. As I crossed the tunnel, motion caught my eye. A flight of hunter drones rounded the corner. Of course, it was at that moment that the human spirit of chaos decided to act. The battery, powering my stealth field, went dead. Damn you, Murphy! I ran. Energy bolts blasted thunks out of the concrete wall as I slid under the vehicle door. The building itself shook as an anti-personnel high-explosive round detonated in the street. The hunter drones had gotten back up from one of the bigger units. I brought my rifle around, going prone, to check under the door. I sighted down what I figured was the head of the unit, and I'd labeled as a shock trooper. Bam! The shot blasted out one of its eyes. Then it turned to look at me. My eyes widened as it brought its heavy cannon to bear. Oh, crap, 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 crap. I scrambled to my feet and barely managed to leap out of the direct blast. The shockwave still slammed me into the wall. Oh! Luckily, nothing was severely damaged. The designated LZ was only a few blocks away. A few blocks and about a hundred swarm units, maybe more. I was screwed. Then my tablet buzzed again. The rescue force would be arriving right now. I had an emergency beacon in my pack. If I could get it set up, reinforcements could drop on my position and hold off the swarm long enough to get the evac ship. I grabbed my pack and ran for the back of the building, ducking across the street outside. I reached in and grabbed the beacon. The energy bolts blasted over my head as I took cover behind a plant of trees. I keyed in the code for the highest priority with one hand as I blindly returned fire with my pistol. I got lucky as one drone went down. Sometimes you gotta love the aim assist. The beacon set. I dashed to the door of the nearest building. Luckily, the rescue ships had come in hot and there was only a desperate minute of duck and cover before the first squad of orbital drop pods slammed into the ground outside. The hatches burst open on explosive bolts and the marines came out, shooting. Their heavy power armor absorbed the lighter blasts of the hunter drones and their Omni rifles made quick work of the heavier units with bullets, energy blasts, and micro-missiles. I took out a few swarm units with my rifle as they mopped up. A marine with the lieutenant markings came over to my position. Lieutenant Harmon de Deshi, 9th Marines, 3rd Battalion, reporting. I gave a wary laugh. <laughs> By the fates, I'm glad to see you guys. You arrived just in the nick of time, I think to say. More drop pods slammed to the surface, discharging them. Marines. Lieutenant Desi grinned through the faceplate. Yep, that makes us the big damn heroes, or something. But you look like hell, Agent. What's next? Well, my work here is done. And you're the guys with the ship. This is your show now, LT. He looked around as the machine secured the perimeter. Well, we can't stay here for long. The dropship is still coming in the original site. It's the only real option for an extraction under fire. The rest of us grunts should be down soon. We'll need to get over there and I imagine reinforcements are coming. I nodded. I can upload a tactical package if your suits can receive from the Ceph tablet. Should help with some of the battle. Really? That'll be great. You should be able to receive if it is in standard format. He paused, consulting something on his tactical display. we to move, Johnson! He gestured a marine over. Sergeant, take three men and guard this agent here. He gets to that dropship at all costs. Got it? Johnson nodded. Yes, sir. Jenkins, Maruni, and Karuba, form up and me. We're going to make sure this guy doesn't miss the bus, he turned to me. Don't worry, sir. We'll get you and your intel home safe. The relative car was shattered as a heavy artillery pole slammed into the building across the street, raining debris on the marines nearby. Everyone up, Deshi yelled. 
Fighting retreat to the LZ. Double time. Move, move, move. We moved. It was six blocks to the LZ. It took us two hours. The enemy pulled swarm unit after swarm unit at us, and we cut them down. But despite the ferocity of the marines, we were getting cut down too. Private Mulrooney was taken down by a melee unit I dubbed the Thresher, and Specialist Karuba got his leg crushed when it was stepped on by a juggernaut, one of the tank-like units. Johnson and Jenkins hauled me past the defended line as Karuba lay firing his omni-rifle into the underside of the juggernaut. Seconds later, seconds later, the street shook as he overloaded the fuel cells in his armor. The LZ itself had been secured by a separate drop of marines. Our contingent was pinned down about a hundred meters from their perimeter. We were down to 31 marines from the original drop of a hundred. Lieutenant Deshi came over the comms. All right, boys, we all knew this might be a one-way trip. The only one of us that matters here is the agent and the data he's carrying. We need to get him to the rest of our guys. Sergeant Johnson, you and Jenkins get him across no matter what. You hear me? The rest of us will cover you. Got it, sir. Johnson nodded grimly. All right, everyone. In three, two. Jenkins suddenly leapt from cover, charging straight at the enemy, yelling a battle cry. Oh, crap. Everyone, go, go, go. The rest of us charged for right our position. Johnson all but shoved me ahead of him across the gap. God damn it, Jenkins. I heard over the comm. It was a breathless few seconds before we hit the perimeter, followed by a scant few survivors. Lieutenant Desi was not among them. We hunkered down in a blasted out building to regroup. A corporal approached us to update us with the situation. Agent Sarge. Okay, Major Ruiz is overseeing the fallback perimeter around the LZ. He pulled up a map on a hollow display. We're out here at an extreme perimeter. It's mostly covered, but you can see that there are some gaps. And we're pretty sure that there's pockets of the enemy hold up here, here, and here. Once we start pulling in, things are going to get very messy very quickly. We'll probably end up fighting our way to the fallback point, despite our best efforts. The Major has a squad tasked with getting you guys there. They'll follow your lead. Catch your breath while you can, because we're moving out in one minute. It might even be less than that if the damn swarm comes again. We nodded warily as we ran. The new squad joined us, and a moment later the order came to move out. Perhaps sensing weakness, as the enemy moved, the swarm units redoubled their attack, rushing the positions we were abandoning. I watched as the rear guard was eviscerated by close quarter shock units, before my squad pushed me forward. The retreat was chaos. Every energy brass cracked and flashed all around us. Artillery pulses blew out pieces of building, burying squads in debris. We lost two members of my escort when a kamikaze unit exploded a few meters from us. There was no time for a medic. Another three were gunned down when we stumbled across a nest of entrenched anti-personnel units. A barrage of omni-fire made short work of them, but their ambush cost time and lives. We barely made it to the fallback perimeter, managing to take cover around a building as an artillery barrage tore up the street behind us. We made our way straight to the building to be used as an LZ. Major Ruiz met us there. Thank God you made it, boys. Listen, the evac dropship is on its way now, but there's quite a fur bowl going on up here. He pointed to the sky. I thought you came in the stealth ships, I frowned. An artillery strike rocketed the building. Well, yes, Ruiz replied. But the swarm ships found one frigate when we dropped. We jumped in a carrier group to hold them off, but we won't have much of a window. The dropship's coming from the pretty far out, so we'll need to hold for at least 30 minutes. Can you manage for that long? Johnson interjected. We'll hold. We'll have to, Ruaz nodded. I looked out over the battlefield. The command post had good sightlines. Too good. I watched as units of marines were overrun. The perimeter barely hold. I shook my head. There's no way. Even if you do hold. I made a quick tactical assessment. If I get out, none of you do. The two humans looked at each other. Ruiz spoke. Agent, are you familiar with the Battle of Thinopoli? I shook my head, and he continued. Something like 3,000 years ago, an unstoppable empire invaded Greece, the birthplace of one of our greatest civilizations, the ancestor of our modern society. A group of a few thousand Greeks held off an army of 10,000 for three days. One group, the Spartans, covered the retreat after they were betrayed. They stayed to fight. All of them were killed. Johnson picked up the story. They were buying time, and it worked. 
the other Greeks mobilized and beat the invasion. The Spartans died to make sure Greece would live on. I understood then. These marines had never expected to return. They had dropped onto a fully occupied world for the sole purpose of buying time. They were selling their lives to buy the galaxy a fighting chance against the Scourge. Now I knew why we called humanity the hero species. I saluted them then, these heroes. It's been an honor knowing you, Hero Ruiz, Hero Johnson. They returned the salute. The moment was ruined as another artillery barrage brought down a building across the street. We took positions at the edge of the landing site. All right, ladies, Ruiz barked. Dropship inbound in. He checked the display. Twenty-two minutes. The agent is going to be on it. Now these skittering sons of bitches around us are going to do their damnedest to kill us all before then. But I say we're going to take so many of them with us, we won't need fortifications for all the corpses. What do you think? The response thundered around the final holdout. Hoorah! 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 The Major grinned. Let's give them hell! The last stand of the 9th Marines, the battalion, commenced. The swarms kept coming, and we kept firing. When Marines' Omni rifles ran dry, they pulled out plasma charged blades and ran into the enemy, usually taking down at least three units. None of them ever broke. Even if they backed away to a new position, they did so while pouring fire into the enemy. One Marine killed three swarm units as he was torn apart by a fourth. Another was literally devoured by one of the larger units. He armed the grenades on his vest as it happened. None of them broke. All of them fell. The swarm burst onto the rooftop just as the dropship arrived. Ruaz went down under a mountain of them. He was still firing just as Johnson picked me up, sprinted to the open ramp and threw me in. As the ramp closed and the ship took off, I saw him being mobbed by dozens of threshers and other close-quarter units. He fired into them one-handed as his other hand primed a grenade. His last, long, defiant battle cry rang in my ears. Get fecked! From Adam, a memoir of a hero species. End of story. Story number one. A show of force written by a lone donut. Braxia held its breath. Not literally. Very few planets actually breathe, but the population sat in momentary terror. Eyes watched the skies and waited. Four standard months ago, diplomacy had broken down between the human nation of the Alliance and the Braxians. It had started honestly enough. Human raw material exports were destroying Braxian industries. They sought to have the Alliance slow its production and even limit the amount of Alliance-produced resources that could be traded across the Galactic Trade Commission. The rest of the human bloc had opposed this. The Rish's manufacturing sector relied heavily on the constant flow of Alliance materials, and the Nomads regularly sent their citizens to crew the Alliance mining and maintenance platforms. Slowing that industry would have negative impacts across all three exporting human nations. Even the Gaians, known for their peaceful and non-interference in galactic affairs, had joined their kin in protest. Of course, the Commission refused to get involved at first. A lot of other members relied on human exports. Alliance drone ships moved a lot of goods across known space. But as the Braxians rattled their cage and threatened to begin blockading routes through their space in protest, these sections of known space that were heavily used for trade increased pressure. Threats of sanctions bounced around, and formally the Alliance discontinued relations with the Braxians outside of the GTC. The rest of the humans followed suit. And soon, Braxian industries that relied on elements of human trade began to suffer. When the human bloc refused to let up its sanctions, the Braxians turned to state-sanctioned piracy. The first couple of line ships hit were small transports. They would have gone unnoticed if they had kept to them, or at least had hired non-Braxian privateers to handle it. But word got back to the Alliance Council, and the contempt turned to rage. Escorts started traveling with state-aligned transport companies. The Alliance Navy moved in tandem with the various trade routes, until this too drew the ire of other nations. Suddenly, warships, small as they were, were starting to move through other Commission members' space. Given the human capacity for war, this concerned some people. An emergency session was called, and the Commission demanded a resolution. 
the Braxians doubled down and the Alliance threatened war if their industry was targeted. The Braxians called the bluff, swore that the Alliance would never be so bold. Braxia would never bend to such idle threats, their representative had exclaimed. As these things go, it didn't take long for things to get hot. The Braxian privateer happened upon what they thought was an Alliance merchant vessel alone. They descended on their prey, ready for the ambush, and disabled it with ease. Once aboard, they realized their mistake. As the beacon transmitted across space to the distress, and the crew sat on the floor of the cargo hold, the privateers realized their mistake. This wasn't a merchant. It was a medical transport. The powder cake that the Braxians had been building had been lit, and fury flowed forth. Alliance warships arrived in Braxian space, heading outposts on their borders. The attacks were precise, though. Every outpost hit was never destroyed, but its industry ruined. Mining stations and gas extractors were left intact, but their capacity for industry was ruined. The Braxians prepared for a conflict, rallying the troops and preparing to move to defend the room. But then, the Alliance Navy arrived at Braxia. The home fleet was swept aside and battle cruisers took position over capital cities. The general of the fleet broadcast a message in front of the landing craft aboard his flagship, a warning that his people were set to land in the cities of Braxia and burn their infrastructure. It would take a day, if not more, for the Braxian main fleet to return from their outer edges of space, by which time the human ships would have bombarded the planet from orbit. The threat was real, and it was here. And so Braxia held its breath. Not literally, very few planets actually breathe, but the population sat in momentary terror. Eyes watched the skies and waited. The outline of Alliance cruisers in low orbit and the atmosphere crawled with Alliance transports. Loved ones hugged and bunkers became crowded. And just as soon as they arrived, they packed up and departed. Within a day, the skies were once more clear. The people would learn that the Braxian government had offered reparations and to withdraw their claim to sanctioning Alliance resource trades. In return, the Alliance had agreed not to occupy their home planet and to also help them establish newer mining technology to compete more actively. All it took was a small show of force. End of story. Story number two. History Repeats Itself, written by Apophis Pegasus. 2642. The Grasnian pirate ship Skiriuk Sidon floated through the edge of Imperial space, the burnt remains of a pleasure yacht a few dozen light years behind. From that pleasure yacht, they had obtained a cargo so precious that selling it would likely have them sitting pretty on some pleasure planet for the rest of their lives. And to top it all off in the interim, the cargo didn't even seem to mind that he was being kidnapped. Hell, he was even cracking jokes. And then she looked at the honeycomb and said, uh, I'm not sure that's how that works. Rackus laughter reverberated around the hold as the young human regaled the Grasnians with tall tales. Looking at him, you would never guess that he had just been violently taken hostage. In fact, looking at him, you wouldn't think that he was more than a rich patrician son, with too much access to daddy's and maybe a good chunk of mommy's money. But there he was, yucking it up with a bunch of seven-foot-tall, green-skinned murderers like they were old academy buddies. Initially, this had confused the Grasnians. Prisoners usually just begged for mercy, maybe excreted a few fluids. One tried to build a shrine to them of some sort once. But they, like all good pilots, simply shrugged and decided the entertainment was worth any weirdness and gotten him a drink. Besides, it wasn't like the human was a threat. He was so small and squishy. No armor plates, no claws, not even a damned venom gland. Honestly, it was a wonder how they got in their river famous Imperium in the first place. I like you, little human, bellowed the commander drunkenly, clapping a giant hand on the human's back. Shame will be selling you. The human grinned, patting the large Grasnian's hands. Not if I don't slaughter you all first, big buddy, laughed the human in reply. That brought another round of laughter. The human had a deliciously morbid sense of humor. He had been making similar quips all day. 
The human's small stature only added to the hilarity. The human giggled quietly as he shut his eyes, drowning out the cacophony, his neural implants signaling in all directions. There should be at least one outpost near here. Just have to... There! One was! Scrunching his eyebrows, he concentrated. As he did so, the deep voice of his father floated in front of his memory. Armed outposts along our borders, son. <laughs> Very well, but they would be your responsibility. He smiled. When he got back, he would have to thank a father for the funding. A couple thousand kilometers away, an automated station activated. A Class 1 distress signal had been sent out, and the station responded according to the protocol. Panels of its side slid open, and thousands of spather class penetrators swarmed out of the weapon stalls. Simple but effective, these weapons were, consisting of an adamantine-tipped spike on the fore-end, some guidance systems, and a high-level thruster, propelling it for a fraction of the speed of light, making the arm-sized projectiles punch a far above their weight. Milliseconds later, the station coughed out a core class space chute, consisting mainly of nanotech matrix and a ceramic-like substance. It took the form of a compact teardrop shape during the flight, but could unfurl into a skin-tight spacesuit in a matter of seconds. Together, the two sets of technology sped towards the pirate ship, transmitting their ETA to the activator on board. On the ship, the human was beginning to regale the pirates with yet another tale, to the rapt attention of the Grasnians. All right, guys, here's a killer for you. It's about a gruo of guys who just couldn't take a hint. As if on cue, the first penetrator burrowed into the hull, through the commander's face and out through the other side. For half a second, there was silence from the pilots, with the only sound being the atmosphere bleeding from the two holes in the hull. Then all hell broke loose. The remaining penetrators sliced through the outer hull, control panels and bodies of the pirates without breaking velocity, turning the ship into a pitted wreck and its unfortunate crew into hole-filled carcasses in seconds. Miraculously, none of the penetrators appeared to touch the now-grinning human. Exhaling softly in the now-near-vacuum of human waited patiently. Five seconds later, the teardrop-shaped suit floated behind him, attached to his back and expanded into a textured black suit. Floating amongst the wreckage of the ship, penetrators swirled around him like a swarm of agitated hornets. Cages inhaled then let it all go in a maniacal guffaw, lasting a good minutes. Well, that was fun, he smoked underneath his helmet. Shame about the yacht, though. Then he engaged his thrusters and began flying to the outpost station, his entourage of penetrators engaging in a full speed behind him. End of story. Tesseract, written by Graveyard Operations. The sterile room again. Everything was so white, everything was so clean. The fluorescent light that silently hummed above our heads reflected off the pristine white tile floors and the plastic tops of our desks. The room was dead silent. Even the dozen or so people who were with me here didn't make a sound. These people were unfamiliar, different from the groups I had been placed with in the past of this nightmare. That's what it was. It was a nightmare. It was always a nightmare, a recruiting nightmare, actually. I have the ability to lucid dream. The attention of the assortment of faces and people all turned to the masculine voice who spoke. My train of thought interrupted as a man in a pristine, black, finely tailored suit entered through what appeared to be nowhere. His hair was slicked back, styled with a haircut that seemed to be as expensive as the suit he was wearing and just as black. A pair of circular glasses rested lazily on his nose, facial features stern, yet soft enough to suggest youth. The man barely looked to be thirty years old, just blossoming into true adult. That is the phenomena precisely six of the fourteen people in this room are thinking right now. An amused scoff escaped his nose as he moved over to the podium towards the front of the room, where each of us were facing at our desks. It was always the same. These recurring nightmares. I would wake up, sitting in this room with no windows or doors. The room was stark white, the white of a gallon bottle of bleach. The walls seemed to be made of simple plaster. The floor, a polished tile, shimmering in the way two bright fluorescent lights from above. 
The desks would match said reflected tile, only adding to the intrusive brightness from my groggy companions and I. Every age group, every race, every ethnic group was present. If not present today, they were present before. Everyone, from teenagers to the elderly. Our attire always starkly contrasted the room itself. Most of us were in pajamas. Embarrassingly enough, more than one of us was stark naked. No one seemed to pay any mind to the nudity, however, despite one of the older men in the room being one. I confess, my right eye twitched just a tad as I tried my absolute best to keep my attention fixed on the well-dressed, olive-skinned, black-haired man standing behind the reflective white podium before us. Allow me to introduce myself and apologize for the past week of trials and tribulations you have all gone through in your test groups. He cleared his throat. My name is William Garrett. I am a director of organization currently putting you through these paces. Each and every one of you here possess a talent not common amongst the general population. That talent is lucid dreaming. So, uh, like, uh, you're saying you're Leonardo DiCaprio or something. Are you going further into a dream or something? One of the younger members of the attending class chimed in, causing a chuckle out of most of us, myself included. Even Mr. Garrett seemed to chuckle, amused. He raised a hand, signaling all of us to pipe down so that he could speak again. I realize the nature of this congregation may be a bit unsettling, or even silly to most of you. I understand the pop culture ramifications of this impromptu interview. Rest assured, however, the dreaming aspect of our congregation is only the basic qualification for why my organization is interested in you all. Think of it as a building block for what you represent. William reassured in his deep, classy New England voice, a pleasant enough smile on his lips. The organization I represent is known as the Bureau of Dimensional Intelligence, or rather BDI for short. This organization has existed in many names and many titles over its six-century-long tenure. Six centuries? An older woman spoke, her face fretful, unkempt curly gray hair spilling over the sides of her head down to her shoulders and back. She was clad in an adorable pink pajamas with cartoon kittens sprawled across her matching top pants. What's the exact year? she asked. Presently, or at the organization's funding, Presently, it is the 7th of December, 2020, at 0200 hours on the east coast of the United States. Precisely, it is 0249, oh, now it is 0250, though our organization was funded in 1478 AD, in Nice, France. William replied, my eyebrows knit as I leaned forward in my seat, the desk shifting with my new posture. How do you know the time? I asked. This is a dream, right? It is impossible to know the exact time in a dream. It's one of the ways I know if I'm dreaming or not. Dates and times never match well. What's the time right now? My accusatory tone must have amused Mr. Garrett, as an ear-to-ear -ear grin appeared on his lips. 0251 on the east coast of the United States, miss, he answered. However, that is incorrect question to be asking yourself right now. The time matters little, especially in a place like this. In fact... Only one person in this whole room has asked themselves the question that matters most of all. A question I will allow for precisely 90 seconds for all of you to ponder before continuing. That question is, if this room has no doors or windows, how did I get in? I lifted an eyebrow, taking the time to allow my chocolate brown eyes to peer around the room. The stark white walls didn't have any windows, nor did they have any doors. My eyebrows did not. How did this man get in? Even weirder, how come none of us questioned him suddenly appearing? How come he was wearing a suit and not pajamas like the rest of us? I thought I was terribly clever though, and I grinned to match Mr. Garrett's own form to my face. I laced my fingers together, black nails clashing with my gaunt, pale skin, while I crossed one leg over the other. Because you're not real, you're a figment of my imagination, I chimed in smugly. My smug demeanor, however, was washed away by the hearty guffaw Mr. Garrett replied. <laughs> well, valid theory, and a potent one to boot. In any other circumstances, you would be correct. I can assure you, however, that I am not a manifestation of your subconscious, though I am flattered that you would think of me as something your mind would conjure of its own devices. I am quite real. 
And I am quite aware of your thought process, Katie. I am quite aware of all your thought processes, names, life stories, families, addresses, and mental instabilities, he mused. My eyes went wide. He knew my name. That was, nothing is impossible, Katie and Marcus. He nodded to the dark-skinned man sitting next to me. The same perplexed expression blasted on his face as his was my own. Which is precisely why I gathered you all here tonight. The last class to my organization is doing this year for potential recruits. The BDI has a need for those who can operate outside the bounds of common human psyche. Being able to lose a dream is going a good start. Being able to adapt while not in control of said lucid dream is even more profound. Thus, before we begin with the final test, I will allow for those of you who wish not to proceed to leave. He nods to the class. I understand the past week of your testing has been terribly haunting for some of you. You made me watch my parents die in a house fire. Marcus answered, the bald, middle-aged man, growing furious, nose wrinkled. You made me watch! I couldn't wake up, and I always can make myself wake up from nightmares. You made me hear them scream! If I wasn't so sure, getting out of this desk and knocking your fecking teeth in would be a waste of time. You'd be on the fecking ground. I'm not interested in joining your goddamn organization, you fecking monster! I just want to know why, why the feck are you torturing us? The jovial, pleasant demeanor of William shifted at Marcus's accusation. The aggression Marcus possessed seemed to shift as William's two blue eyes peered into the large, angry man's soul. Marcus sank into his seat, as if a child again. The fluorescent lights almost dimmed at how upset William seemed to be. Placing his index finger and thumb over the frame of his glasses, William pushed him up the bridge of his nose and sighed. <sighs> it would be a waste of time, Marcus. William calmly confirmed. The answer to your question is simple enough, however. Should you join our organization, should you choose to be a peer beyond these white walls and to both the lucid dream and waking world, what you will see will shake the very fabric of your sense of self. It is that sense of self that we are attacking. Unfortunately, that requires a uh, tolerance to witnessing the most deranged acts humanly possible. We are not openly malicious, Marcus. But our agents must be capable of a mental fortitude to cope with trauma. Watching your loving parents die for a week straight, over and over, is one of the most barbaric methods we have for testing your result. Your presence here, now, is proof that you are capable of withstanding the onslaught. Perhaps you should ask some of the others in this room now. Oh, it appears many have left during my ranting. I blinked, looking around the room. Three people. Out of the fourteen people that were here, only three people were left. Goosebumps ran up my arms and down my back. I didn't even notice they left. It was just Marcus, that older woman from before, and myself. Everyone else just vanished. I reflexively swallowed down my stomach, sinking low into my seat. Just like Marcus had, the older woman in the pink kitty pajamas wrung her hands together nervously as she watched both of us instead of Willie. Her attention was soothing in a way, as if my own grandma was looking out for me as our most demonic captor fixed his attention on Marcus. You're a sick feck, Marcus barked, albeit meekly, causing William to laugh, shrugging his shoulders in defeat. I suppose so. I am forced to be with potential recruits. It is disappointing that only three of you chose to stay, but I suppose I knew that from the start. It is better than last year's class. None chose to remain in that collective best. I'm shocked, however, you didn't bother asking yourself what your fellow students went through. I can assure you that you were not alone in your trials and tribulations. The old woman and I seemed to look down in unison. My eyes closed at the memories of the torture flooded back, like clockwork, as I began to recall from my own torture at the hands of this bureau. I could hear the buzzing all around. I brushed my long, blue and violet hair behind an ear as I slowly began to remember the agony of the hornet stinging me. I am very allergic to bees. When I was eight, I was put in an emergency room because my throat was swelling up. A week straight of being in a damn room only to have a swarm of hornets cover me, stinging me, unable to wake myself up as my throat began to close and I couldn't breathe. I would have cried right there 
if I didn't think William would get some sort of sick satisfaction from my suffering. I am many things, Miss Holm, but I am not a sadist, William answered my train of thought, walking over to my desk and placing hands on it. The man's very aura was imposing. I take no pleasure in the suffering of this hell week for potential recruits. As I said, it is necessary so that we can gauge your mental fortitude. Dr. McCormick over there had to watch her entire wing of the hospital die. Marcus had to watch his parents burn to death. You had to experience the agony like none other. I, uh, personally, all of those years ago when I went through this, had to watch my wife wither away into dust in my arms. All of our individual suffering is irrelevant when it comes to the threats that we face in the Bureau. William responded. Marcus grunted, scowling, rising up from his desk to stare accusingly at William. Despite the gravity of our discussion, the only thing I thought of as, as the dark-skinned, well-toned, incredibly attractive man stood next to me was how incredibly naked he was. To make the terrible pun, it somewhat took the sting out of all of this. Yeah, you don't think I see enough of that crap as a firefighter. You don't think I don't beat myself up enough about the folk I don't save. You had to make in my parents. Feck you and feck your damn company, Marcus barked. Mr. Bagarrett looked over at the man in distaste. Your response is disappointing, but not unexpected, William retorted, monotone, unflinching, despite Marcus towering at least a foot over him. Though I suppose I know why you specifically are here, Marcus. You say feck my company, but you still can't help but shake the one thought that is blooming in each of your minds. That thought being... If that hell was only training, what was the training for? That I can show you. However, first of all, I would welcome all three of you to a proper in-person interview in one week's time. You'll instinctively know the address to go to. You'll instinctively know the time to attend. None of you will be late, William replied, moving back over to his podium, turning to face each of us with a vicious smile. The Bureau's responsibilities extend far beyond your own personal suffering. The Bureau's humanity's contribution to the needs of society far beyond normal comprehension. For you see, my future agents... William trailed off, snapping his fingers. Just like that, the stark white walls seemed to fade away. And before us, the vastness of an unknown cosmos stretched before us. No ceiling, no walls, just a door, desks, and a podium remain. Behind William spiraled a supermassive black hole of a galaxy, with tendrils of a radiant power expanding out as if to grasp each and every one of us. Entire arms of a spiral galaxy spun around us as each of us looked on in wonder. Every living organism in the cosmos, in this dimension, in our universe experiencing itself, we are the universe aware of its own experience. We are the universe's lucid dreaming we are the aspect of the universe's dream, absolutely aware of its own existence. We do not stare simply into the void. We are the void looking in on itself and beyond to those who dare to. Twenty-two species of intelligent organisms are known to exist in this galaxy alone, and none of them, like humanity, can see what we can see. Humanity alone stands apart to see what horrors lay beyond the third dimension. They see only the face of the Tesseract. We see... With that, the galaxy, the stars, and all the beauty of the cosmos seemed to fall away from us. An insidious blackness appeared, an abyss of emptiness that I cannot even begin to put into words. The buzzing of insects appeared in my ears again, and I began to scream. I couldn't help myself from screaming. The inky blackness cascaded around our feet as the buzzing only grew even louder. Whispers of an insidious nature echoed throughout the buzzing, whispers whispering my life in an instant. Every bit of my twenty-two years of life was spoken to me at once. Every regret, every fear, every hope burned. I screamed. We all screamed, each one of us likely hearing our own tragedies laid out before us as the floor of the room, as well as our feet, became consumed with the darkness. Eyes, dark, violet splits in the vast abyss of emptiness, appeared to look down at us as more and more of our small little plot of sanity was choked up by the dense blackness. I couldn't see anyone anymore. I couldn't see Dr. McCormick. I couldn't see Marcus. I could only barely see William, who stood there unimpressed by the void's gesture. His attention seemed fixed on me, and, slowly, 
As more and more of myself seemed to sink into the inky darkness that surrounded us, he began to laugh. At least, I believe he started to laugh. All I could hear was that damn buzzing. Answer the phone, Katie! What? I called out, reaching a hand out for him desperately as his desk I sat at fell away from under me while I sank lower and lower into the void. Your phone's ringing! What are you talking about? I called out. Help us! I begged just as my head became consumed and I felt myself sinking lower and lower into that terrible, cold emptiness around us. I screamed and screamed and then screamed more, only to be met by that fierce buzzing. I shot up out of my sleep, my hair an absolute mess as I breathed heavily. Once again, I was in my crappy apartment. The darkness of my room was a pleasant surprise compared to that swallowing abyss that I had just experienced. It took me more than a few minutes for my heart to slow down and my panting to slow enough to realize that it was, in fact, just a dream. I groaned as grogginess and awareness creeped back into my mind. The buzzing was my phone as it vibrated on my nightstand, which rested right next to my bed. I rubbed the sleep from my eyes, peering at the screen. Scam like me. My biggest fan. Scam likely must have called at least twice a day. They didn't often call at, uh, at, uh, 0302 in the morning. Chills ran down my spine. Answer the phone, Katie, I repeated to myself, stretching out a shaking hand to my phone and sliding the answer button out, putting it to my ear. Uh, uh, hello? I asked. Caitlin Holm, a woman's voice on the other end asked. Yeah, um, do you, uh, do you have any idea what time it is? Why are you calling? Welcome to the Bureau of Dimensional Intelligence. We'll see you in a week. Click. I pulled my phone away from my ear, staring at it in horror. A hand over my mouth, horrified. It was real. This is all real. Oh, crap. End of story. Story number one. The perils of trying to end the world or Xenu as a bad decade, written by Alex Sylvian. The world came to an end at 9.53 Eastern Standard Time, July 24, 3191. This was considered very odd, because it was supposed to happen seven minutes later. It all started on a cloudy night ten years earlier. All clouds everywhere on a planet Earth disappeared. Then the stars rearranged themselves in the sky. They said, hey guys, I'm getting kind of tired, so, uh, I've decided to end the world, okay? The lead scientists in the world came together to discuss it, and they agreed. There was a 99% chance of it being a coincidence. Very unusual, but nothing to get excited about. Once in a millennium occurrence. The next night, the stars realigned again, saying, It's not a coincidence, you blithering idiots. The scientists convened again. They came forward with a prognosis. There was a 97% chance of it being a coincidence. Then a lot of them were fired. All the leading religions got together and broadcasted into the air. Is that you, God? The answer came back. Nah, Sinu. You know, the Scientologist guys. I revealed the truth to L. Ron Hubbard. But all he wanted to do was make money. The leading Scientologists immediately sued Sinu for presuming how totally legit religion is for money. L. Ron Hubbard's ghost, he said that we could keep the scam going forever. Whoops. And Mr. Mtumba Illaboy, the unluckiest man in the world. Why not? L. Ron Hubbard's ghost was unavailable for comment. Point is, it turned out the people of Earth objected to the whole world ending thing. Zidu shrugged and started it anyway. He soon discovered ending the world was a whole lot harder than he had thought. His first attempt was a meteor strike. No, but no sooner did he let the meteor fly than humanity was already mining it for rare resources. Turns out it was full of black. By the time it reached Earth, it was the size of a very small pebble. The small pebble bounced off the head of Ntumba Illaboy and made him very annoyed. His second attempt was a storm that lasts 1,000 years. But humanity had figured out weather changing machinery back in 2135 and switched it to the light sunshine with occasional breezes and life-giving rain and a rare snow to spice things up that lasts 1,000 years. toy for short. Zenu tore out his scales in frustration. Irritated, Zenu decided to extinguish the sun. 
This bothered the humans for a hot minute, and then they just switched their energy panels to absorb heat from the distant stars instead. They also turned on a lot of radiators. Now truly angered, Xenu opened the gates of hell and commanded the legions of demons to march forth and conquer Earth. Humanity quickly dispatched them with a few well-placed newts, then made a deal with whoever survived. Soon, the Earth was running with twice the energy it had when the sun existed. Halogy was the wave of the future. Frustrated, he decided to unleash the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This did not go as planned. First, it turned out the pestilence had already been hiding on Earth in the guise of a 300-year-old Jenny McCarthy. When her legions of anti-vaxxers found out that she was literally the manifestation of disease, they, uh, didn't change anything. Then they all died an easily curable death, and McCarthy was launched into space. Moore took one step on Earth, looked around, knocked him Tumbi Illaboy to the ground, and said, Well, jeez, how the hell am I supposed to improve on this? He then retired and became a professional wrestler. Bamman actually managed to leave a swath of destruction until she came across an old Jewish grandmother who said, Oi, oh, nothing but skin and bones. Here, yeah, eat a little something. Of course, it is impossible to refuse food from an old Jewish grandmother, so Famine had no choice but to eat, and in doing so, stopped being Famine and had to resign her commission. Death did a pretty good job, as he always had for thousands of years. Seems he'd gotten the wrong memo thousands of centuries earlier, and had started work immediately. He profusely apologized, Good to at least be getting some recognition for my work. I'm kinda swapped. Finally, Zeno sent everything at them at once. Dragon, plague, blood, fire. For a masterstroke, he unleashed Cthulhu. Surely now those bloody humans would perish. Nope. Cthulhu seemed to be friendly, so they just dumped him in the sea world and charged people $9 to see him. Cthulhu was pretty much okay with this though he did have a bit of a bad habit of seizing patrons and launching them 100,000 miles into the air. The dragons, plague and so on, might have been a problem. But Earth's lawyers got on the case, and it was soon discovered that due to a clerical error, they were only allowed to bother Mtumbi Illaboy. He expressed his opinion as extremely bothered. At last, Zeno just stared down at Earth and screamed in impotent rage, You think that you're so smart, humans? Well, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'm gonna kill myself. Then everything will fade into non-existence. Let's see how you like that. Of course, the people of Earth had been preparing for this since day one and activated the DRP, Dimensional Relocation Program. At the stroke of 9.50, the DRP field was activated and Earth was relocated to another dimension, one with less planet-destroying god lizards. There were only three casualties, a bird that had flown too high and escaped the DRP field, a suicidal astronaut who wanted to see what the death of a non-existence felt like, kind of floaty, and Ntumba Alaboy, who by sheer coincidence got thrown by Cthulhu 100,000 miles into the air and hit Zeno plumb in the face. Typical, Zeno said, and died. And that's why the world ended seven minutes early. End of story. Story number two, I Still Stand, written by a teller of tall tales. We still stood after all those awful, bitterly cold battles. After every snowstorm and icy night, we still stood gone. Once a settlement, now a city. Frost Guardia stands tall and glittering in the perpetual winter sun. I remember her infancy, a few enviro hubs and a singular shuttle port to the bustling metropolis that now stood. Yet we still stand guard despite the massive turrets atop the walls making it worse. We still stand, even though we fell. The war was beautiful in a way. The battlefield alight with spatters of technicolor blood, dead men, of many races posed like war heroes in their frozen resting spots. We made it through the first war with few losses. We were ill-prepared for the second wave. But still, we stood in the way of the invaders. They were our friends, our family, our homes. We were protecting. Many have taken the stairway in the centuries since, taking the reaper's hand into that blessed, burning light. More and more have been going each day, sensing no need to protect our beautiful home anymore. In that sense, they were correct. There 
was no need. I watched the shining gateway to the afterlife close. One of my men, a young boy at his time of passing, named Carter, had left today. I don't blame him. Poor kid was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He deserved peace. Yet still I stood, alone with no one but the reaper approaching me. I unslung my rifle and propped it up against my shoulder, holding the buttstock as I snapped a salute to the cloaked figure. All is quiet on this front, sir. I stated as though he were my commanding officer. The hooded figure looked at me blankly with that expressionless skull of a face, before speaking. Come on, dear Slate. I feel I know your answer. But shall I open the gate so you may pass on? I kept my salute. No, sir. I will stay here and stand guard. The reaper nodded slowly. Then he was gone. I slung my rifle back over my shoulder. The wind nipped at my skin still as I stood watch over the frozen tundra. I remember the feeling of the enemy lasers that burned and charred my skin, the kinetic slugs that tore me apart. I remember the cold as it slowly took me away from my people. I heard a soft crunch of snow behind me and turned. He never forgot. My old friend padded up to me, raising his thickly furred head for a ghostly pet. He was well fed, his fur was thick and warm, I didn't know who's taken care of him or me in the ages since I died, but I wanted to thank them. Fur dragons live for thousands of years, and when they bonded with you, they bonded with you for the rest of their life. He sat beside me, staring into the snow-swept landscape. If I'd left, he'd wondered where I'd gone the rest of his life, and I couldn't do that to him. So I still stand until the day me and my longest friend may face eternity together. End of story. A Man Can Dream, written by Wolthy Wonka. Sleep. Amongst the thousands of languages in the galaxy, the word translates reasonably well between most of them. There are some, like the Sekher, who had a hard time first understanding. Their homeworld was a rotational period of three hours. Night lasts as long as it takes to prepare to eat a good meal. Going unconscious as a natural body function is a concept that was foreign to them. Yet, the idea of rest translated as easily as the periodic table. The phrase, deep rest, was all it took for them to grasp the fundamentals of sleep. They are a curious race, and so merely understanding the fundamental was not enough for them. The foreign concept of sleep attracted them like an explorer to an uncharted island. Some say the research and understanding of sleep should be left to those who, well, sleep. Others say that unattached and unbiased were perfectly suited to the task. Regardless of opinion, they have spread throughout the stars in search of complete understanding. And, for a while, they had it. Thousands of races catalogued, studied, and tested. Every part of sleep was understood and written down in a scholarly fashion. Then... An adventurous researcher traveled down the Orion Arm and outwards into the backwater that was mostly devoid of intelligent life. There, the researcher entered a small, isolated empire known as the Soul Republic. He was looking to collect data. What he found would not have a word in any of the 24 languages he spoke. Dream. The researcher was baffled. In his first interview of the new race, one of the humans, as they were called, described participating in events while asleep. How does one do that while unconscious? He stood in the primitive market, contemplating the flow of bipeds that passed by his stand. Not a unique sight, but, he thought, perhaps a unique people. He went back to the spaceport inn and sat down heavily in the high gravity. He learned how to access the human's data net. He was led to a data group called Wikipedia, of which he was impressed by the culmination of a knowledge and small empire had gathered. He was further impressed by the fact the race had progressed from exploration of their own world to interstellar empire in just under a thousand years. Such a timetable was rare, even in the vast encyclopedia of the Sekhe's contacted species. Yet, despite the impressive amount of knowledge collected in a data group, he still did not understand the dream. The colony was small, 
being on the fringe of the empire, and so it had no scholarly institutions. But it was large enough to have a medical complex. From Wikipedia, the researcher knew human medicine was based on science and was as advanced as any other field. Thus, the researcher concluded this was where he could find someone to explain the dream. The researcher was directed towards the room, where he was told to wait. It had a nanobot-based diagnosis machine, a blocky bed, and a jar full of wooden strips. After a while, the door opened, and a Zeno medical specialist was a tall and light man, relative to the rest of its species. Compared to the researcher, he was squat. He introduced himself as Sullivan. Gaily, I correct, or am I butchering that? Gaily adopted an expression of horror. The specialist must have been good at his job, because despite never meeting a member of Gailey's race, he interpreted the expression correctly. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Butcher is a term we use when we pronounce a name incorrectly. I really need to stop saying that. Yeah, I see. Yes, my name is Gailey. Good, good. He checked the state of bed. I hear you're having problems sleeping. No, I have questions about sleep that I hope you can answer. Solomon paused. Questions? I'm sorry, but we don't have your race and record. I can't answer any questions about your sleep. Not my sleep, but yours, Kylie replied. Mine? Solomon seemed at a loss, and vaguely disturbed. Yes, how can humans sleep and conduct activities at the same time? Solomon scratched his head. Well, uh, what do you mean? Are you talking about sleepwalking or... His eyes lit up in understanding. Ah, dreams! You're curious about dreams. You're not the first, you know. Gailey thought about that for a minute. The researcher's hunger for knowledge grew. Yes, I'm curious about dreams. I am a researcher. Solomon sat back. Ah, I see. Well, just so you know, I usually treat patients and answer questions about my race, not just the latter. But I suppose for a researcher, I can spare a few minutes. Ask away. Gailey smiled in his own way. What are dreams? How can a human be unconscious and do things at the same time? Solomon smiled. That's actually a pretty common question I get. You see, we're not actually doing those things. Our brain just makes it up. Kylie let that sink in. Makes it up? Yeah, human minds are very, um, compartmentalized. Not everything that happens, happens within our consciousness. Sometimes, a part of our mind we're not aware of creates something of its own, separate from the part of our mind that is actually conscious. Kylie was only more confused, but as a researcher... He was used to it. So some of your thoughts, um, aren't your thoughts? Solomon laughed. It was apparently a joy that his species baffled the researcher. Pretty much. A good example is when we are convinced a shadow from an object is a person. The part of our mind that isn't us, our subconscious, decides it's a person. Then it tells our consciousness it is. We actually see a person for a fraction of a second before we realize it's just a shadow. Guiney blinked. He was only more confused. But how does that relate to a dream? Well, dreams are what happens when the subconscious, the part of us that isn't us, is given control of the mind. Gaili processed that. Solomon continued, It happens when we're asleep, so we don't actually go and do what our subconscious says to do. Gaili spoke, But you're unconscious, you're asleep. What is there to control? Solomon grinned again. He obviously explained this before, and this was the part where it got good. When we're unconscious, our minds create a world for our subconscious to play in. Gali again processed that. Play in? Solomon nodded, still grinning. Like a child plays in a playground, exercising, experimenting, just like our child might eat a flower to see what happens. In sleep, our mind simulates the situation to see what happens. Simulation? Gali was spending all of his mental energy comprehending this and it was a lot. Solomon continued, Yes, a simulation, like on a computer, how you test something without actually testing it. Sometimes it's, uh, what happens when I try to fight a graphic mercenary? Other times it's, what happens when my wife grows two heads, then the walls aren't walls, and uh, I can put my hand through the table. But Solomon laughed again, still with a mildly terrifying grin on his face. Exactly. Sometimes they don't make sense. Other times, though, they fit the world perfectly. But how? How do you create these dreams? Solomon lifted both shoulders in a gesture. Well, uh, we still don't quite know. Dali sat a little bit straighter. The seed of an idea was planted in his head.
But the best I can explain it is our subconscious grabs past memories and current stimuli and tries its best to make sense of it. Like how it turns a shadow into a person. Then it takes what it made and runs with it. Kylie's confusion began to fade. An understanding paired with all began to take its place. So you mind is two. One is you and the other thinks for itself. Solomon nodded, smiling. And these dreams, they are your uh, subconscious creating a world and uh, learning from it. Solomon's smile grew wider. And uh, each part informs the other, giving you the knowledge gained through both the rational and irrational parts of your mind. Solomon slammed his hands together and laughed, smiling even wider. <laughs> yes, yes, you understand. You are the first, you know. You beautiful bastard. Guyly tried his best to interpret that. He concluded it was a compliment. Solomon spoke through a massive grin. I've had tried so long to get that across. Most Xenos, they smile and nod and pretend they understand. But you, you, uh, who are you? A sick hair. It was Solomon's turn to be awed. A sick hair? I've heard of you. Are you planning to send a research division to our little corner of the galaxy? I uh, believe we are now. Solomon smiled. And thus began the golden age of man. The sick hair did not send just a research division to the Soul Empire. They sent their research, period. Every sick hair wanted a piece of the dream. It was fascinating, and rightfully so. Predictions, inventions, and even victory in battle had been created in sleep, of all things. Commerce followed the flood of inquisitive sick hair, and with that, the Empire of Soul swelled to encompass the entire Orion arm with its influence. At one time, another empire attempted to steal the wealth of the Sekir. Humanity crushed them, and like that, the two races became like sisters. To this day, they are both intertwined as if they both started on the same rock in space. It's a good match. Humanity provides the dream, the Sekir provides the knowledge to make that dream come true. Many say man does not deserve this power, that humanity is nothing special, but they're wrong. A man can dream. End of story. Story number one. The Hero Without Desire. Written by Random 3X. I am invincible! The Mad Empress screeches as I approach my blade at the ready. You're not. I mean, look. I've already lobbed off your hand. I gestured to the bloody limb on the floor. A simple setback with the scepter. I shall be granted what I need. Whether it be a new limb or your very demur. I swing my sword and cut off the hand holding the accursed artifact. Ah, you, you, you! His face was gone ashen now. Understandable, as he's been bleeding heavily since my first strike. One would think that he would do something about this with his magic. But no, he seemed intent on monologue. With a final shaking of his stump at me, he collapses clearly dying, if not already dead. With that, my duty for this job is complete. Vanquish the evil emperor and retrieve his accursed scepter. Reaching down, I pick up the scepter. I pry the still grasping hand free. I can't help but admire the thing. For all its evil, it was truly well made. Something that belonged in a museum of some kind. Alas, it is slated for disposal. Still, I can feel a tug at my subconscious, daring me to gaze into the large crystal atop the scepter. I merely give a single glance, but that's enough for it to seize me. Ah, Sir Hero, I welcome you, my new master. I'm now in a pure white room with a figure that can only be described as a pitch black. No features, nothing discernible. Only humanoid figure made of black smoke and night sky. New master, I repeat, the figure nods. Indeed, sir. You have slain my previous master. So my ownership naturally transfers over to you. I see. Well, uh, that's good. Then we don't need to worry while I transport you for destruction. These words send the figure into a sort of panic. Mates, master, I can grant your very desires. I am, after all, a wish demon. Tell me, master, 
What is it you desire? Meh. I'm okay, thanks. I shrug off its blatant attempts at temptation. Surely you jest, master. How about great riches? As he says this, a mountain of gold appears before me. More money than I've ever seen in my entire life. More than the dragon horde I witnessed when I was just a squire. However, my answer is obvious. Ah, thanks. I wave the deem's offer away, and like a puff of smoke, the gold vanishes. May I ask why, master? The demon seems genuinely curious. Then again, great riches are often atop many wish lists for people. I'm from the Order of Paladins. We have sworn to a life of poverty, outside basic costs. I don't have much need for coin, let alone that much. The demon, for all its lack of features, clearly conveys how stunned it is. Rather, an emotive fellow for a glorified 3D silhouette. Yeah, yes, sir. I see coin doesn't motivate you. Then perhaps all the woman that you could ever want. As before, many women, each of a beauty that would make the nymphs jealous, appeared. Or maybe men. With that added words, numerous men of equal beauty appear. Nah, no thanks. I'm asexual. Don't feel the need. Again, the demon is clearly stunned. Though I suppose I am a tough customer. Wealth, lust. What next sin will he tempt me with, I wonder? How about ultimate power? With those words, the images of beautiful people vanish. And in their place is an image of me slaying the demon lord. I'll admit, this tempted me for a moment. But once again, I shake my head. No, thanks, sir. I am of the opinion strength not gained by your own hands is not real strength. The demon is clearly getting frustrated with me now. Wealth, lust, power, all have failed. How about great fame? All heroes wish to be remembered. Now, uh, my deeds, whether they live on, doesn't matter to me. Only that I've done good. The demon is clearly becoming more and more agitated. How about an empire of your own? Uh, I just struck down the evil emperor on my own. Any ruler who rises up can still be cut down. It'd be the height of arrogance to think that I was the exception. Then, uh, how about an audience with your god? His offer actually gives me pause. You can do such a thing. My question is genuine. Indeed, master. You need only seal the deal. It holds out its hand. It is then I remember the rogue's old saying. A deal too good to be true almost always is. Uh, no thanks. I'll meet him when I die. Can't have you monkeys pawing my wish now, can I? The demon clicks its tongue. It seems I hit the nail on the head. Paladin! What is it you actually want, then? The demon gave up with all pretense of temptation and decided to just outright ask. I have to admire the direct approach. Okay, I'll tell you what, I shall make a wish. You can fulfill anything, right? The demon nods immensely, pleased that the conversation is going the way he likes. Okay, I wish for the full destruction of every single demon and devil in existence on this plane and any other. I also wish that all those with a level of evil in their hearts that would doom them to damnation have their souls banned from entry to the demonic realms. The silhouette figure is frozen. Even without features, I can tell it stuns silence by my wish. I can't do that! Their protest is amusing to me, and I can't help but chuckle. Thought you said you could do anything. I have limits to my power, master. Eliminating all of my brethren is beyond my power by a magnitude, let alone starving off all who may yet reform. Then this negotiation is over. I shall take my leave. Thank you. I start walking away towards where I can make out the edge of the room. Wait! I'll give you everything, anything but that. You can be the greatest hero throughout all time. 
Your story will inspire so many more heroes. The demon is clearly desperate now. As I previously said, I care little about my deeds and remembered, let alone achieving such a goal with my own strength. I thank you for the offer, but I must go. The scepter won't purify itself now. With these last words, I punch through the white wall and exit the mindscape. That was fun. I hope we can do it never again, I say to the scepter as I put it in my seating bag for the trip to the temple. End of story. Story number two. Concierge, written by Zentaps. Search inquiry. Reviews for Trident Warpub. Did you mean Hylox Orbital Station, Sopjanyor 2? Filters. Human Traveler. Reset. Less than 100 words. Ball stars. Excellent service. Friendly staff requested directions to my gate, and they gave me a shuttle ride straight there. Five stars. Had a great time. My flight was delayed, and one of the staff directed me to a spa in the station. They even provided a coupon for a free entry. It was much like a mud bath, but with a green slime mixture. Quite invigorating. Probably not toxic. Would recommend. Three stars. All right. What is going on? When I got to the station, there was a staff member already waiting for me. They guided me to my connecting flight, and when I mentioned I was thirsty, they brought a cart with drinks for me to pick from. It was a little unnerving. Four stars. The Stereosis sells hosted jerk cakes, which taste just like pancakes. Three stars. Do not forget to unpack any food. I got pulled out from a brief interrogation for having a bag of lemons in my carry-on. Luckily, they didn't last long and they were quite understandable. I don't even know how lemons got into my bag. Four stars. Staff attendant was very helpful in arranging a room for me after my flight was cancelled. Meals were brought to my room and my next flight was scheduled for me. The room had access to a variety of entertainment, including translated alien films, highly convenient and part of the great service package. Trident, Warp Hub employee, man. Concierge. The job requires quick thinking and knowledge of human culture. Job description. A concierge's role is to ensure human guests have everything they need during their time at the hub. These needs may include anything from arranging transportation to the connecting flight to reserving reservations at a restaurant or other entertainment facilities. Requests are to be fulfilled promptly and discreetly. A concierge has priority authorization to fulfill their tasks. Humans are to be accompanied at all times and not allowed to become uh, bored. Footnote. The last time a human became bored after a delayed fight, they took a detour and they somehow managed to befriend a bar full of assorted aliens, some of whom held active hostilities with each other, but seemed to disregard those hostilities momentarily under the influence of the human. Initially, there were noise complaints which spiraled into an uncontrolled partying involving improvised pyrotechnics, which resulted in the temporary shutdown of Hangar B. As a result of this incident, humans are to be entertained using regulated station facilities and quickly guided to their outbound destinations. Company policy is to ensure humans are monitored by a concierge at all times in order to avoid boredom. End of story. Story number one. Hospice, written by Wenda Toast. Audio lecture from the head medical examiner of the Galactic Council. Humanity is known for being a sporadic, superstitious, and chaotic people. They have also shown this on many occasions with their actions within this interstellar community. With this preface, you can understand my hesitation when entering their medical field for this report. It was with a breath of fresh air when I first visited one of their major medical stations within their home system. It was one of the first off-planet facilities that they constructed, the first being a mining outpost on their moon. The facility I visited was set up as a hospital for the injured miners and grew to the population into a massive campus that it is today. The staff even claims that they are significantly lower gravity on the moon assists with physical therapy and recovery. Now, listing of how humans handled trauma and catastrophic injuries has been done to death. If you wish to read about that, I recommend that you review those reports. In summary, they handle them the same way all other mammalian races do. 
though they are better outcomes due to their innate durability. No, I will not be reporting on their terminal illness and end-of-life procedures. All the races in this castle have their own unique procedures, from the desire for a warrior's death in battle, self-termination, when obsolescence is declared, or even recycling of organs and biological material. We all enter the next life differently. The humans, however, are unique. They are so far the only species that practices the concept of hospice care. Let me explain what exactly hospice care is. Hospice care, as opposed to the palliative care, makes the individual comfortable. It does not try to cure the ailment that they are afflicted with, though treatment is provided if it helps ease their pain. This premise may shock many of you, a simple fact that resources were being wasted on individuals who were terminal shocked me the most. Why would you provide medical care to someone that will only end up dead? Why not provide them with a simple method of self or assisted euthanasia, as many other species do? These questions were answered when I began reading about humanity's dead customs, though they are fractured and belligerent people. With many different cultures, they all similarly treat death. It is inevitable, something that should be avoided but not feared, something that is even celebrated in some cultures. For example, the human holiday known as Dia de los Muertos is held in the people of Mexican Federation, one of their major players in humanity's political sphere. The holiday features a celebration and remembrance of lost lovers, family, relatives, and public figures. It is a time of happiness and mourning, and it is one of the best examples I can give you how humans treat death. It is simply a fact of life for them. Now to get back on track, what is the point of wasting resources on a dying person? It is to give them what I've seen as a good death, and to console those affected by the death. You heard me correctly. Hospice care does not just care for the individual, but also the family as well. This is through therapy and financial support. Let me explain to you humanity's modern concept of good death, because throughout their history it is wildly varied. To my shock, it has even fallen in line with some of the other races of this interstellar community. A good death, by humanity's current standards, is one surrounded by friends and family as painless as possible, and not leaving any affairs unattended. But simply, the person is dying with peace of body and mind. My colleague, a Piluvian, found this to be cowardly. These people are one of those who view death in battle or by combat to be the supposed true good death. But upon attending a viewing of a human known as Michael's death, his opinion changed. Michael was a standard family man who had a large family of five children, a loving wife, brother, sister, and many friends. He was also diagnosed with a neurological condition known as ALS. Michael could have had it treated with a rather high rate of success, but it ran the risk of all but obliterating his memories. My colleague scoffed when he learned that Michael had turned down the treatment, thinking that the human was afraid the possibility, but was put into a state of existential dread upon listening to the human's explanation. My memories are who I am. The Piluvian did not have a witty comeback after that. We witnessed how hospice functioned firsthand with Michael, how the nurses and doctors worked tirelessly in their care, making sure Michael was well fed, groomed, entertained, and that his pain was managed adequately. We also witnessed how human lawyers made sure his affairs were in order and watched as the human religious figures known as priests made sure that he was at peace with himself. Over the span of six months, we watched Michael waste away before our eyes. First, it was little things, having trouble tying his shoes, fumbling with a pen here, a fork there. Then, things began to decline even more so. As the disease spread, he slowly lost the ability to eat properly, dressing and grooming himself. Then the higher order functions left him. He was bound to a wheelchair, lost the ability to speak, and eventually was bedridden, being a shell of his former self. As per Michael's orders, no extrinsic measures were used to keep him alive, 
not wanting his children to see their father like that. In his final moments, he was surrounded by those who loved him and cared about him, free from any pain, and assured that they would be cared for. He died in the embrace of his family and friends. He died the good death. End of story. Story number two. Peace by the Sword. Written by Weirdo5255. We are peaceful out of necessity. And because of it, we are the most powerful race in this galaxy. For a human to kill another takes but a moment, a sharp knife, or even just a few ounces of pressure, and a man can be easily killed. His corpse discarded as a worthless sack of meat. Indeed, if there has been one constant throughout human's history, it is that they always found new and more creative ways to kill one another. Ways to kill one another more quickly. We invented the spear, the sling, the bow and arrow, the cannon, the musket, bombs and nuclear weapons. Our latest achievement is the power to simply snuff out a star, thus condemning an entire solar system to death. We are a violent, vengeful species. Yet throughout our wars and bloodshed, ever evolving, we spawned another weapon. Honor, brotherhood, a place to belong, and a reason to fight. Once we fought to feed our bellies and rut with our mates in the dirt. And we still do on occasion. Now, though, we fight for grander ideas. We fight not for ourselves, but for those whom do not wish to fight. And those who can no longer fight. The bonds we form with one another, those not of our lineage, whom we call brother and friend. It is not a pact we enter lightly, nor one we toss aside with ease. The eunuch of the Mordanon were perhaps the most powerful species in this world. Indeed, on our first encounter with them in deep space, our ships and troops were easily dispatched and destroyed in gouts of plasmonic fire. Like in our past, we held our hands out to them in kinship, as humanity has done for every enemy in history. We do not wish to march towards war. We would rather have our pacts and vows ring empty in the air. The eunuch laughed, saying that they did not need a friend. Indeed, even amongst themselves, the eunuch were a violent race, much like the entities of every other race in this chamber's survival of the fittest. Every single culture here is based on that principle except my own. The eunuch fought within their own ranks constantly. The strongest was the leader. The Ryan followed much the same principle, if only more subtly poisoning and forming temporary packs, only to betray one another for personal advantage. The High Clue literally absorbed their weaker peers, taking their memories and experiences, adding it to their own. Every race in this quadrant is constantly at war, not only with everyone else, but with themselves. Each member of the race only cooperating for their individual benefit, their individual advancement. So yes, humanity is the most peaceful species in this room. We do not stab one another in the back. We do not fight for ourselves. We fight for those who do battle beside us and those who are behind us. The eunuch did not understand this, and for that error they paid the price of meeting on the battlefield an enemy that did not waver and through sheer force of will destroyed them. The eunuch are no more for their simple fact that humanity has weaponized peace. We fight so that we might return to peace, return to our brothers in arms, and to our families. With our weaponized peace, the more you try to fight us, the more powerful we will become, if only to return to it. So I ask this assembly, who among you is willing to make peace with Humanity. End of story. Story number one. It's the Little Things, written by Swegler. Command Log 2178. Day one of new crew trials. I am Captain Ugrak, in command of the expeditionary vessel Discoveries of the Stars and its crew of 100. I am recording this log in regards to a new crew member named Dave Hudson, a human 
from the newly discovered planet Earth in the locally named Sol system. While I would not usually have to record a specific log in regards to a new crew member, I feel that this is a special case owing to the relative newness of the species and the goal of our mission, which is primarily system exploration and survey. Dave is one of the first human researchers to join such a mission with the Compact Science Council and should be interesting what his viewpoints shall be. Command Log 2186, Day 8, Human Terms of New Crew Trials Despite the relative newness of a human to the galactic scene, our resident Dave appears to have fit in well, despite the minor issues with the food replicators and flavor enhancement. Dave has taken it upon himself to go over prior data from planetary surveys and reports to familiarize himself with the typical styles of all life forms found and their dangers. A commendable action, in my opinion, as it always helps to be prepared. Command Log 2216, Day 38 of New Crew Trials After nearly a month of travel, in human terms, our ship is beginning to near an unsurveyed Class 4 system, and our scanners have picked up the following preliminary results. A low-energy red star with three planets in the life zone, a healthy outer asteroid belt and a couple of small gas giants. Overall, a promising system, both in terms of potential for life and resources for the fledgling colony. Of our newest crew member, the integration to the wider crew of my vessel appears to have gone well, in large thanks to the extensive courses he attended prior to joining the crew and his relaxed nature, helping to ease Dave into a shipboard community. On a personal note, I do have some concern on how the extended voyage has affected his morale, as I've heard rumors of him asking some of the engineering crew why the trip is taking so long, and if there are ways of going faster. As much as I agree in regards of making the trips faster, we do not have the space to fit in a more powerful reactors of the Zerter class frigate in our vessel to power faster FTL drive, as much as I would like to. As of recording this log, I find his concerns, well, normal for any species first jaunt in our position, to have happened rather quickly, potentially hinting at some impatience. However, I take from that the desire to explore and do its job. Command Log 2225, Day 47 of New Crew Trials I commend the engineering team on finding a degraded power conduit leading to the FTL drive during their routine inspections and have ordered a temporary halt in our calls to be able to fully repair the issue and ensure that we will not be stranded due to the damaged FTL drive or related issue. My team has reported that it will take around five days to complete repairs and inspections of other critical systems, which I am pleased with. As the captain of this vessel, I wish to ensure that we are prepared and safe for whatever we may encounter, as well as so that we do not end up stranded between systems in a crippled vessel. As some of my more rash fellows appear to have done, at least according to their recovered logs. On the topic of the crew trials, it appears that Dave has taken this news well, but appears agitated and withdrawn over the delays, preferring to stay in his quarters and research surveyed fauna and flora, as well as watch hollow recordings of planets this vessel has landed on. While I wish to ensure that every crew trial I host goes well, I have to ensure that the safety of my entire crew and vessel come first. Command Log 2246, Day 68 of the New Crew Trials We have reached the edge of the outer asteroid belt of the system, and with that we have been able to make full use of our senses. We have confirmed that the asteroid belt has a good distribution of heavy, light, and rare elements. The gas giants are suitable for ship fuel and atmosphere siphoning. The inner system has an asteroid belt with a similar distribution of elements and that the three planets in the green zone appear to sport lower-level life forms as indicated by atmospheric readings hinting at no industrial output or even fires used for cooking, nor any artificial emissions to speak of. We are heading in system after offloading some automated drones to further survey and mark specific asteroids for any future colony. We are headed for the largest of these three habitable planets in order to sit down and do an in-depth survey on the life to be found there and the suitability for known races. On the topic of the crude trials, it seems that Dave is happy about the confirmation that there is life to be surveyed and documented, but still appears somewhat withdrawn about the news. Hopefully, some first-hand experience will improve things. Command Log 2250, Day 72 of New Crew Trials 
We have chosen a suitable landing site on one of the four continents of what we call Planet Intar, and landed safely. Atmospheric readings indicate that this is safe for the majority of crew members to disembark. However, some of the crew will have to wear protective suits or breathers due to the pollen and organic matter in the air. Scans show that there is few signs of fauna large enough to be a threat. Most appear to be herbivorous in Class 1 species, with a few Class 3 predators resulting in population balances. While most fled during the landing, they returned fairly quickly to what we can consider their territory or habitats, which makes it easier for study, but does raise some concerns about attacks from unwary predators. Dave appears to be happier down in the mud, as he says he's doing his research and has already documented several species of flora and fauna, namely some of the less timid herbivores, I'm personally glad, as the issues that were starting to present gave me concern for his species' future in space exploration, and specifically Dave, as his work itself is a good quality and has the potential of being a valued permanent member of the crew. Command Log 2252, Day 74 of New Crew Trials Documentation and survey of the landing site has been progressing well with geological, biological, and suitability data coming in nicely. The crew are appreciating working on a planet's surface, despite the efforts of shipboard indemnities to stimulate that same environment. Morale is up, and the crew is overall happy. The only sap in my fur is that some nervousness some of the researchers' teams feel about Dave's hand-on approach to the fauna research. Rather than observe and record from a distance, or safely sedate the fauna to study, he approaches it and attempts to gain trust and have the creature approach him. Dave states, that humanity has been doing this with fauna on his home planet since the pre-agricultural times, and he feels safe doing it. I thought that this was a little odd, as that kind of interaction is rare with non-sentient creatures in the galactic community. It appears to increase Dave's morale interacting with these creatures. It was when one of the creatures he had been attempting to gain his trust have approached him and allowed Dave to touch it, he began petting the small furry herbivore that had clicked for me. Out of all the possible things to explore on this planet, it was the hands-on interactions that made him happy. It was the fact that he could physically find and gain the trust of a small creature from this planet and be able to pet it and interact with it. It's the little things that makes humans happy. End of story. Story number two. Enough! Written by the missing thing. We have observed your race for a long time. When you discovered how to create bonds and use this knowledge to create swords, we did not interfere, although we knew hundreds would die. When you developed iron and steel and used it to create better swords, we stayed silent, although we knew thousands more would die. As a result, when you discovered gunpowder and used it to create projectile weapons, we said nothing, though we knew the cost would be in the hundreds of thousands. When you developed high explosives and used them to rain bombs on your fellow man, still we didn't speak, though the death toll would be in the millions. When you learned the secrets of the atom and created nuclear missiles of incredible destructive power, we still did not intercede, despite the potential to kill billions. We are silent no more. When we beg you to stop your current research, know that it is because the consequences will be catastrophic beyond your understanding. Enough is enough. End of story. The Swordsman's Wish, written by Hidden Fox. Clash of Steel. The roar of the crowd. A lone swordsman approaches the tournament grounds. A late entry. The tournament and a ready gun. The ring of metal on metal. Ahead, the cheering of the crowd. The first round ended. The swordsman approached the entry booth. The lone goblin there was preoccupied reading a book barely sparing the swordsman a glance. The swordsman stood there for a moment, waiting for the goblin. The goblin ignored him. The swordsman slammed down with both hands on the table between them. 
the goblin jumped, their book flying across the tent. The hell do you want? The goblin sputtered. The swordsman pointed at the advertisement for the tournament hanging on the booth. What? You want to prove yourself, ain't you a human? The swordsman pulled his sword belt off and dropped it onto the table. The scabbard was quite thin. Fine, if you want to get crushed by an orc, that's up to you. The entry fee is five canera. The swordsman pulled five round coins from a pocket placing each of the gold rim cobalt coins on top of each other. The goblin swiped them off the table, checking their weight. Fine, you can be in. Here's your token. Don't lose it. The goblin slid a small silver square across the table. The swordsman snatched it up, shoving it in his pocket as he readjusted the sword belt. The hell do you think you're doing? Ain't humans bloody pacifists? The goblin said to no one in particular. The swordsman entered the waiting tent. The satire, wearing an official sash, was off in the corner, talking with one of the fighters. He headed over to them. Halfway across the tent, an elf stepped up to him. Hey, Ewan, what are you selling? The elf half jeered, half asked. The swordsman glared at the elf and pulled out the fighter's token. A human fighter? (laughs) This human's going to try and fight. The elf laughed. His voice rang across the tent. His laughter was quickly joined by the other fighters. I'll crush him between me fists. Look how small he is. An orc fighter bellowed. He's not going to be able to hit me. I'll run him down, a center yelled. He's got that armor. I'll take him down in a single blow. The heavily armored dwarf yelled across the room. What's he going to do? Eel us until we yield, the goblin fighter jeered. The swordsman gripped his hilt, charred wood, leaving ashy imprints. The king's tournament was huge, massive, really. Hundreds of fighters, thousands of guests. The booths and tents took up what land outside the Alvin capital city left. The tournament was to celebrate the marriage between the Alvin prince and the dwarven prince. The two largest, most powerful kingdoms united. And so the Elvish king held a grand celebration, and its crowning feature, the tournament. It wasn't just the spectacle that the fighters fought for, though many did. It was that the Elvish king offered the winner one wish. Anything that the winner asked, the king would grant. So the fighters came for glory, for fame, for wealth, but not the swordsman. The first fight would be melee, ten fight, and one winner. As the nine other fighters emerged into the ring, shouting and gloating, the swordsman said nothing. Gripping his sword hilt and standing against the arena's wall, he waited. When the ball of fire thrown to the sky exploded, the fighters charged to the center of the arena. But not the swordsman. The fighters attacked each other with mithril blades and oracalcum fists. Death was possible, but to kill your opponent would bring a penalty. So death was typically avoided. In the melee, fighter after fighter fell until only an orc berserker remained, standing on the bodies of other fighters. He roared his assumed victory. The swordsman walked up quietly and punched the orc in the base of his skull. The orc crumbled to the ground, unconscious. The duels began. The others were of no concern to the swordsman. They only focused on preparing themselves further, physically and mentally. When the swordsman's turn finally came, it was with relief that they stepped into the ring with not fear or anxiety. Their opponent, a centaur, roared a challenge. The swordsman did not respond. The fire mage on the judge's stand launched a fireball into the air. It burst, and as its wisps of flame fell to the dusty earth, the centaur charged. The swordsman gripped the hilt of his sword, still in his sheath and stood. The centaur grew closer and closer, its hooves leaving imprints in the dirt. It leveled its long scimitar and prepared to swing. The swordsman stared directly in the centaur's eyes, impassive. At the last moment, the swordsman jumped to the centaur's right. Two quick flashes of light and the waves of unease disseminated through the crowd as the centaur collapsed. 
Zentor screamed, its right leg nearly severed. Heels rushed onto the field. The swordsmen rubbed their left palm, ash, leaving their marks on his thumb. A new jewel, a new bow. The elvish blade singer faced down the swordsman. Dedication was hard set in the elf's face. But the tinge of anxiety dashed across their brow. They had seen the centaur. The fireball burst. The blade singer began their prayer. Their words filled the arena. Their mithril blade danced in their hands. The swordsman felt the familiar channels of the sword's grip. He moved towards the elf, slow. Closing the distance, the elf and the swordsman orbited each other, waiting for the other to strike. The crowd, larger than the centaur duel, watched with glee, hoping for a good fight. The elf's prayer hit its peak, and they lunged forward, their blades swinging down. With a clash, a loud clang, a slight unease, the elf's blade was stopped. Another flash, and a gash of pale green formed above the elf's knee. The blade singer swung at the swordsman, trying to hit him. Another flash, another clang. The swordsman jumped behind the elf, cutting up his back. Every swing from the swordsman started and ended the same way, in the sheath. No one had seen the swordsman's blade. One final slash. The elf toppled over, back shredded, legs bleeding, sword arm open from elbow to shore. Night. Each fighter was given a small tent, and the swordsman was in heat. Facing away from the entrance, he read an old, leather-bound book. It was old, cracked, and worn. The pages were yellowed, ripped, and the ink had run in some places. The swordsman read each word row by row, as he did every night. The tent flap rustled. You're not supposed to be here. A thick accent of man's language was unforgettable. The swordsman pivoted, drawing his blade. In a moment, the tip of the sword was a hair away from the neck of the intruder. The intruder. Or as many knew her, the chief apothecary of the king was unfazed. You know they'll be coming for you. You know what you have done. We're supposed to be pacifists. The apothecary was a rarity, even in the capital city of one of the largest empires. A human. So why? Why are you doing this? The swordsman tilted his blade, exposing its black core. The apothecary read the glyphs running down the blade. The names. They saw the charred grip. They read through the lines. A mithril edge coating. I assume it's insulated with a gold layer. Outside, a load mage vomited. This is a warning. They're coming. Don't do this. The apothecary left, and the swordsman sheathed his blade. He knew they were coming. He didn't care. Ten fighters remained. The swordsman entered the arena. His opponent, a goblin spear, was ready. The opponent cheered. The fireball burst. The swordsman sprinted at the goblin. The goblin leveled the spear and held their ground. The swordsman entered the spear's reach. With a flash, he cut the spear in half and kicked the goblin firmly in the head. The goblin fell down, but drew a knife and got back up. This time, the goblin charged. The swordsman jumped to the side, slashing open the back of the goblin's neck. The goblin spun, lunging at the swordsman. The swordsman sliced open the goblin's brow. Brown blood dripping to its eyes. The goblin tried to find the swordsman, but was blinded by their own blood. The swordsman kicked the goblin in the ribs, and the goblin flew back, landing hard, and did not get back up. The swordsman turned back and left the arena. Why fight? Another duel will happen now, and he would face the victor. The swordsman walked to the fighter's resting tent. The workers and healers milled around waiting for the next fight, or the next customer. Oi, hear me! Someone slurred. The swordsman ignored it. Oi, hear me! You listen when someone speaks to you! Another voice slurred. The swordsman turned, and three particularly drunk owls staggered towards him. I heard that you heard the blade singer. And the swordsman said nothing. You're gonna have to pay for that, the tall ass elf said and threw a punch directly at the swordsman's face. The swordsman stepped to the side, grabbed the elf's arm, and snapped it over his knee. The elf held in pain. The swordsman kicked another of the drunks in the forehead, and then kicked out the legs of the last. 
The pile of owls yelled in pain, anger, or just pure drunkenness. The next fighter was a satyr. While magic was technically forbidden, you can't really tell a forest creature to not connect to the forest. It was practically impossible not to do. This particular satyr used the loophole of having living wood armor. The wood would automatically shift and harden depending on where the satyr hid it, all while staying relatively light. The fireball burst, and the fight was on. The satyr was cautious, but still overconfident in the living wood. The swordsman and satyr slowly closed in on each other, circling the center of the arena. They stared directly into their eyes. The satai broke eye contact and the swordsman struck. A slash ended on the living wood, a cut rapidly healing itself. The swordsman's blade could not cut it. A slash at the ankles, the wood surged to meet the blade. The small flowers and moss of the armor wilted. The satai swung the club, catching the swordsman on the right shore. The swordsman staggered. A flash and the swordsman's blade hit the satai's pauldron. Not a slash, however. The flat of the blade hit the wood and it died. The satire was caught off balance due to the sudden added weight. The swordsman saw an opportunity. Slashing at the flesh just beneath the pauldron, a spray of blue blood flew out. The swordsman swept at satire's legs out, whacking the living wood chest piece with the flat of the blade. It too died. Two flashes and growing unease in the crowd, and two long cuts spewed blue blood of the satire's stomach and collar. The strong kick to the head and the satire stayed down. The last duel. The crowd surged with excitement for the last duel. The swordsman had prepared for this fight. Working on his blade, he stripped off the mithril edge. The last fighter, the heavily armored dwarf that had been mocking the swordsman, roared to the crowd. The crowd roared back. Some of the dwarf's most loyal supporters began to chant his name. And the swordsman entered the arena. There were no cheers for him, no chants, just uneasy silence and the occasional anti-human slur. The elvish king rose to address the crowd. My wondrous people, my fantastical creatures, I resent the final duel. Our first contestant, the mighty Maldon himself, Donorath Hillshaker. The dwarf roared again, and so did the crowd. And the final contestant, the mysterious man, the human swordsman. The swordsman said nothing, and so did the crowd. Let the duel begin! All across the arena, mages threw fireballs into the sky, bursting at the same moment. The dwarf readied his warhammer and lumbered forth. The swordsman gripped his hilt and let go, bringing both hands in front of him. He walked towards the dwarf. The dwarf swung his mighty warhammer and missed. The ground where the swordsman had been was now empty. A kick came from the dwarf's left, firm on the ribs. The swordsman jumped behind him and grabbed the dwarf's shoulders and shoved. The crowd gasped as the dwarf fell flat. The crowd cheered when he got back up, but now the swordsman held the warhammer. The dwarf charged the sword. The swordsman dodged to the side and kicked the dwarf in the back of the knee. The dwarf stumped. The dwarf stood and lunged at the swordsman's sword, grasping the hilt. The dwarf pulled it slightly. Right. The dwarf jumped back from the swordsman and opened his mouth to scream. But he never did. The swordsman kicked his chest hard, pushing him down on his back, swinging the mighty warhammer. It hit the dwarf's helmet with a sound like a bell. The dwarf did not get up. The king's booming voice filled the arena. We have a winner! Come forth, swordsman! What is thy wish? The swordsman ascended the stairs on the side of the arena, formed by mages around the arena. The swordsman knelt before the king. He raised a single finger. His hand was turned white as it gripped the sword. The swordsman spoke. Vengeance. Several things happened at once. The mighty doors of the arena flew open. The swordsman drew his blade and cut twice. The king's advisor passed out. Several mages vomited. 
The king's box was painted a pale green with his blood. His first cut sliced his neck open, the flesh quickly turning grey. The second cut, his head off. The princess shrieked. Five heavily armored humans rode into the arena. All but the first were wearing a strange swirled metal. The first was wearing a light blue cloak, studded with mithril. Large bands covered their wrists. The swordsman did not sheathe his blade. He held it for all to see. It was not mithril or aurichalcum, nor cobalt or gold or silver. It was black iron. Iron, the metallic bane of magic. The forbidden material. The waves of her knees turned to fear. The king's bodyguard rushed the salt. In the name of Queen Delea, surrender your arms, Malachi of Cavendai. The first human yelled. The crowd, those still paying attention, was shocked. The humans had a prince, not a queen. Queens weren't meant to rule. The first human stood their steed, their armored horse. They nearly collapsed, dropping the thick bands on their wrists. The major still conscious and those magically intoned felt a great magical strength. The swordsman turned to the first human. In a voice that was full of rage, they screamed, Kevin die is gone! Everyone but me is gone! This man killed them all! I have orders to take you back, dead if need be. Do not resist, Maliki! The swordsman screamed and lunged at the first human. Another human. This one covered in a strange world armor rode in front of the first human and swung their halberd. It struck the swordsman on the left wrist, shearing it off. The iron sword fell to the ground. The first human cast a spell, and the swordsman's wrist froze before it could spill blood. The same happened to his legs. A mage regaining his composure launched a fireball at one of the armored humans. The fireball impacted and fizzled. Only then did the remaining people realize the iron fear came from the mounted humans. The swordsman leapt for his sword in a desperate attempt. In a spray of red, he lost his head. End of story. Transcript, Assembly Speech, War and Terror, written by Alpha Beetle. 4,261st year, first season, first rotation. The warlord climbs the speaker's pillar. Assemble dignitaries, my fellow warlords, my people. While it may be presumptuous of me to do so, I will begin my assuming and I am no longer need to introduce myself at any length. I also hope that you will forgive me for any wariness I may display. I have just arrived from the taxing battle against the marauders of the center ward regions. Cumbersome titles and warriors' prowess aside, for the duration of the speech, I stand before you simply as a veteran. Three rotations ago, I was formally asked by the assembly speaker to appear in front of you. From our long association, I assume the speaker is hoping I will weigh on the side of aggression, decisively tipping the scales for military action against the children of terror. This is understandable seeing as he knows as much as, or as little, of the actual events in the Three Seasons War as anyone else on the home front. I will do no such thing. In fact, and although my position as a warlord would forbid it, I will actively speak against such action. Sit down, Lord Speaker. I'm speaking from the pillar, and no one in this assembly, not even you, has the right to interrupt me until I've finished. Audience chatter. Pauses while the assembly speaker is reseated. You seem shocked, but don't be. If it has to save my people from their own stupidity, I am more than willing to throw my position and repute away. I have spoken with my fellow surviving warlords from the Three Seasons War, and they support my decision. We, veterans of that long series of relatively minor fleet actions, which is what it really was, not a war, want to bring a dire warning to you all. Also, though it is against custom, today we want to tell you publicly what happened during those three seasons. The warlord indicates the true remembrance. We disdained the humans when we met them, all of us, to a lord. Ever since we first found them, the children of terror did nothing but quarrel amongst themselves. They have never, never lived under a species unifying rule, not to mention such a piece. 
They will quarrel over the most trifling of reasons, over resources where there is no need, over pride where there was no insult, and over differences in interpretation so small that they are irrelevant. In the early days, we often fought the valiant inside the human territories, our fleets skirmishing through their space, a detail they hardly seemed to care about. In fact, for reasons obscured by the Byzantine self-contradicting ideologies that they would sometimes even ask us to fight close to certain other human settlements in hopes of scoring collateral damage on their enemies. Naturally, we did not hold the humans in very high regard. Whatever one may think of their primitive ways, this has to be said, however. The children of terror are traders in heart and soul. Perhaps this is exactly because of their splintered nature as a species. Who can know? Although their technology couldn't match ours, they could offer abundant resources and an endless pool of cheap, efficient, and crafty labor. We happily let them repair and restock our ships for what was, for us, a laughable price. Soon, even the valley, as disgusted as they were with the humans' barbaric obsessions with commerce, were docking their ships at the human outposts. We may never know if that particular cultural schism was the main reason the Valiant eventually started seeing the humans as exploitable, but I am sure that that was at least part of it. Collateral damage turned into accidents due to bad intelligence. Accidents turned into incidents. Eventually, incidents became raids. At every step of the way, the Valiant was spurred on by shocking lethargy of the human race as a whole. I will admit, I was at the time quite disgusted myself. A fifth of a season into the systematic raiding, only the neighboring polities had even cared to send any supplies to the victimized outposts. Some of the more cutthroat cliques of the region even capitalized on the opportunity and attacked their weakened neighbors, seeing the spoils of the Valiant were gathering. My war council was actually contemplating an offensive into human space. If the Valiant were gaining so much from smiting the barbarians, why should we not? Only my warrior's pride made me shy away from attacking so defenseless an opponent. Defenseless. Words are inadequate to describe how lucky that hesitation was. Exactly halfway into the season, the Valiant made their terrible strategic mistake. I expect that only a very few select watching or listening to my speech will recognize the name Pillars of Hope. Hope is, was, a large human settlement, the largest outside of the human's own solar system. After a particularly bad string of defeats at the hand of our fleets, the main valiant battle group was pushed deep into human space and fell into orbit around at this point, the Valiant openly despised the weak humans and expressed it all across their empire. The humans were, to them, animals, the butt of a cosmic joke. The camaraderie of the Valiant battle group was the epitome of what we would call the military class. It was strong, prideful, the tempered in the thousands of battles, and it was already furious about the success of defeats to our it demanded the resources that its battle group needed, and its rage only grew when the inferior humans had the gall to demand trade on equal terms. Score, the commandieri had several orbital superstructures obliterated by its humans. The humans did not take the swell, and a few of the diverse autonomous polities in the settlement initiated forceful actions against the hostile battle group, the Valley. Not understanding the lack of coordination in human culture, or not caring about it, responded with extreme prejudice. Bombing the settlement's surface, killing tens of thousands of humans, the situation escalated into chaos within a quarter of rotation. Somehow, the children of terror managed to bring down one of the battle group's ships of the line. The valley responded with exterminant weapons, cities were razed to the ground, Escaping civilian ships were destroyed in space. Millions died. It was a tragedy. Finally, the Valiant salvaged what they needed to repair their ships and left. And I hesitated for the second time. Finding spoils gained by senseless destruction, such as that wrought as hope, even less appealing than before. 
This hesitation may also admit freely in front of you all at the cost of some of my warlord's pride. The humans came to us a tenth of a season later, asking for a military pact. I had, at this point, put a hope out of my mind and occupied myself with other concerns, so I did not pay much attention to the delegation at first. I had to keep myself from laughing when the envoys presented themselves as speakers for all of humanity. I wasn't the least convinced that the children of terror had learned to cooperate. I accepted their bargain flippantly, thinking that the humans' help might at least lend us a logistics edge now that their attitudes to the Valiant had soured. A logistical edge, I thought. The warlord indicates regret over a grave miscalculation. From what I've learned of humans, and I would like to think that I've learned quite a lot, for one of my species, the primary reason they act so irrationally is because of their fierce individuality. Consensus is always something vague and approximate in human cultures, never different. Ideologies spread, mutate like a disease, and each human is a mix of a million ideas, often self-contradictory, and somehow they still muddle through. I once asked a human leader I got to know, called Raddy, about this seeming paradox. After laughing and thinking about it, she answered me this. I understand the idea may seem funny to you, but we actually consider ourselves quite good at cooperation. It happens all the time, but simply at lower levels than your species is used to. Consider the ocean. It is a hodgepodge of creatures and forces, but just sometimes, under the right circumstances, the waters all move in the same direction. And then, no land touching the water is safe. Every time I meditate on the war, I still remember that analogy, and the glittering of those small predatory eyes that had watched the pillars of hope burn. At first, the war continued unaffected. We didn't expect much when the human fleet sprang into action, and so stayed aloof, expecting the humans to suffer a humiliating defeat. Then reports started coming in of some early successes. I attributed these to luck, surprise, and tactical retreats by the valley, but did not wish to spurn such a generous gift of fate, and so we also attacked. In what was later dubbed the Third Spring Offensive, we pushed well into Valiant territory, still arrogantly attributing our victories to our warriors' acumen. As we reached the first major Valiant installations, the humans again sought an audience with me. They asked for our permission to spearhead the assault on the Valiant settlements, a proposition I gladly accepted, as I had been considering a way to minimize the casualties from such an action. Why not let the humans soften up the worlds first, we thought. As the humans were still waiting for reinforcements, I took the time to visit their fleet and study their data. I was appalled at first. I thought they were simply lying to my face. On board their flagship, the humans presented maps showing how they had successfully ousted valiant battle groups from the entirety of their territory. I did not believe them. How could such a thing even be possible for such a technologically undeveloped race? I became convinced that I was being held for as a fool as I was led around to inspect their arsenal. Not even their flagship carried the energy projection weapons. The bulk of their weapons were the incoherent mix of simple rocketry and nuclear fission or chemical warheads. Brute explosives. Using such primitive weaponry to earn any effect would require minute orchestration of entire fleets something that I was completely convinced the humans could never pull off for the duration of the Valiant campaign. I returned to my ship, fuming, and immediately ordered my own troops into action. Soon thereafter, the rotation of the battle began. Against the humans' objections, I had ordered my fleet into the first wave, rather than have them be delayed by the humans' wreckage. And so, already before the human reinforcements started moving, we moved against the Valiant settlements, we dispatched the orbital installations in short order and began to descend upon to the military outposts. It was heavily defended. I had expected the battle to be hard but glorious, and it was. We were the first on the ground, performing the elegant dance we had done so many times before with the valley troops, flanking, attacking, retreating, exchanging fire here and there, attempting to outmaneuver the enemy, and then drive them back out of the territory. 
Then uh, the children of terror came. The warlord indicates a foul omen. One thing I understood at that moment, why minute orchestration was not necessary for human warfare. I cannot adequately describe the scale of what happened during that rotation. Around us, the skies literally darkened with their dropships. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of humans with their simplistic slug throwers and their ridiculous chemical-powered vehicles. The first ones to touch down were no match for the valley who swiftly cleared a path for themselves and retreated into a walled bunkers. They were so sure in their victory, so superior to the smallish weak bipedals in every conceivable way, so arrogant and so sorely mistaken. I learned only later that the destruction of hope had done something across all of human space, flipped some kind of ancient behavioral switch. As I told you before, the humans are fiercely independent creatures, but hope had accomplished what thousands of seasons of human history had been unable to. It united the vast majority of the species under a cause, and precisely because of what I witnessed in a nameless valiant installation, I shall never forget Rani's words, and I advise you to do not either. When the ocean moves as one, no land touching the water is safe. To grasp what it was like, imagine a skitterer hive, aggressive and hungry, frightening, certainly, but never a real threat to our species, despite the occasional frontier wars. Why? Because the skitterers, in actual fact, are very few in number, and most of them are by far non-sentient workers, which obey and die blindly. They are easy to outmaneuver and outgun, even in great numbers. But the humans are different. United in purpose, they become like a hive. Hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of warriors, but sentient. Every one of them, sentient. A skitterer warrior will lose its limbs, limp around harmlessly, and die. A human warriors will stop, administer medical aid, and continue to fight. They will drag their wounded comrades off the field to be treated, down to the last one. They can operate completely autonomously. And finally, under the right circumstances, they are willing to die for victory. We, the warrior class, fought the Valiant for glory and repute, always in small numbers, always leaving an escape vector open. The humans fought to annihilate. We watched in horror as the humans, with their strange alien ways of thinking, completely ignored generations' worth of military orthodoxy, and succeeded beyond our wildest nightmares. There was no elegance or efficiency, only effect. When the Valiant moved too far away, the humans would tear into them with massed rocket attacks. When they came too close, a wave upon wave of warriors would spill over them, heedless of their own safety. When they hunkered down in buildings or tunnels, the humans had flushed them out with mad, primitive equipment, barely worthy to be called weapons. Can you imagine a weapon that sprays barely controllable incendiary fluids through a hose? Or a weapon that releases toxic gas or burns hot as a star surface when thrown at the enemy? The children of Terra used these, and many, many more. And when all of these would fail, they would throw themselves at the valley, twice their size, with metal blades fixed to their slug throwers. A sixth of a rotation later, the installation was gone. By the time I returned to the fleet, the battle was almost over. The entire system was being overrun by constellations of clumsy human carriers. A cold dripped my soul, and all my limbs tingled in horror as I realized that everything I had seen on the human flagships had been true. I knew then that the Valiant Empire was already defeated, and their armies in ruins. The Three Seasons War ended less than half a season later. This is the truth of that war. The Valiant are now a remnant of their former empire. Their defeat was total. We fought well, and we would have won in the long run. But the truth of the matter is that the Children of Terror united 
did in a season what we were unable to even dream of in five. Had they not joined the war, it might have well been known as a posterity as the Seven Seasons War. Ironic, once it was clear that the war was over, the mighty human fleet immediately fractured. The first falling out actually happened inside the Valiant home system, only three rotations after the Valiant's unconditional surrender. Because of some unfathomable political reason, two smaller ships opened fire on each other, forcing the crews to scuttle both craft and be ferried home aboard another human ship. A long time has passed since the war, and the humans behave as if it never was. In fact, trade with the former Valiant Empire is flourishing. But now I hear some of our younger generations, matured after the war, clamor for victories and honor in battle. They use the same words as the Valiant did, that humans are uncivilized and barbaric, that they are weak and do not deserve their elevated position. Some of those younger will perhaps decry my speech as cowardly or weak. To those doubters I say only this, I have been a warlord for my entire matured life cycle. As I mentioned in the beginning of my speech, I come before you directly from a skirmish at the central border. If you wish to test my courage and warrior skills, I welcome you to try. But do not disrespect my experience. To date, I cannot say I fully understand what bizarre laws human coalitions are born and reneged on. But since the war, I spent much time in their mad cities, learning to know their ways and I've caught a glimpse of cooperation here and there. And the most important lesson that I've learned, and that I wish to impart upon you all, is this. Do not give the children of terror a common enemy. And if you must, make absolutely sure that it is not you. The warlord climbs down the pillar. The audience remains silent. End of transcript. Not so different, after all, written by scientific theory. Edward was a nice boy. He had a bright blonde hair, chubby cheeks, and piercing blue eyes. He made his first friend when they poked his cheeks and said he looked funny. Growing up, he wanted nothing more than to relax on the farm and watch the roads work. He went his entire life without so much as a fist fight. Had peace with the world and the people around him. Edward had never wanted to hurt anyone. Unfortunately, the universe didn't much care for what he wanted. I suppose that's just the way things go, he thought to himself, looking over at Sarah. She'd always been gorgeous, a wild soul. They'd made fast friends in childhood and had never quite grown up. She was the one who had convinced him to follow his family's military tradition and join the civilian defense force when hostilities had exploded seemingly overnight. He nudged her with his leg as she rolled over, a soft sound escaping her throat. He stared for a moment, thinking back on the near two decades they'd known each other, the trouble that they'd been in together, the time that they'd tried dating, but both found themselves more comfortable as friends. He rolled her back over, hair cascading over the rear of her face. Plasma pistol, he guessed judging from the dead Arvine whose blade was still buried in her stomach. Not that a killer had fared any better. Her assault rifle had carved a bloody path all the way through it. Him? He won. Edward sat up, or rather, Edward tried to sit up. There was a particularly nasty laser wound that seemed to have glanced through his left kidney. Had the doctor survived the unfriendly suggestions crash landing, he likely would have been concerned. At least, it's cauterized. Little victories. Edward sat up and screamed into this desolate wasteland they had fallen from the sky to die in. His howl rang out alone. Things went back for a moment. He came back, fuzzily remembering he had lost his kit in his crash. Careful not to disturb her, he slowly rifled through Sarah's loadout until he found her medical pack. No spare kidneys. Yes, I'll have to settle. The thought Riley lingered while he popped the needle cap and pressed it into his stomach. 
the excruciating agony of these worlds gently faded to a dull, grinding pulse. Taking a moment to look around, he gazed over the battlefield. The unfriendly suggestion had crashed about a quarter of a mile to his left, and the alien vessel had slammed down a nearly equal distance to his right. A brief crash in the sky, and both the converted mining vessels and the Arvine Corvette fell onto this barren world that had nothing more to offer than a surprisingly breathable atmosphere. Both marooned on an empty planet, and we just had to run and over and kill each other. For what? The both of the bodies lay scattered carelessly, like so many forgotten toys. His breath was the only disruption of the tomb-like silence that had settled so heavily upon him. Looking down, his gaze settled on the trenching tool, neatly collapsed, as though it was waiting to be put away. I guess that's a start, he thought to himself. Hours later, he sat back against a rock looking at a field around him. Don't much like this sort of planting, he panted heavily. As he'd worked his way through the field, he'd tried to treat himself using the now discarded field kits. But after a while, the wound on his stomach had just split and blood began steadily leaking from it. Still, Edward was happy. He'd been able to bury all the unjustly dead, able to give them some semblance of respect. Looking up again, shovel propped on shoulder, he smiled at the orderly rows that now marred the endless waste. Everybody had place, shallow throw it may be. His was above ground against this rock, and that was okay. Things went black for a bit. A sound disturbed him. Looking up, he frowned as he noticed one body was out of place. That's not right, he thought as it strode towards him. Edward's bright blonde hair was streaked with blood and dirt, the chubby cheeks white with blood loss. His once piercing blue eyes tried to focus through the haze. And Arvine, hadn't he buried them all? Gathering the last of his strength, he spoke to the phantom. Sorry, mister. I don't think I can rightly dig a spot for you. He gestured at the graves, and everything else is taken. He paused and shuddered for a moment. Guess you'll just have to grab a spot here. The phantom stared at him for a moment, before looking out at the field. Two battered ships framed in an endless brown vista, breathtaking in its vastness. So open, it had almost pulled the breath from your lungs. Edward coughed for a moment, and the phantom looked back down, flint black eyes taking in the shovel leaning against his shoulder. Sorry, Dad. I don't think I'm coming home. With that last thought, Edward let go. The Arvine stared at his body, wispy blonde hair ruffled by the wind, soft smile on his lips. It looked back at the graves, unmarked and unnamed, only distinguished by either a human or an Arvine weapon laid at its feet. Unsure what to do, it took pictures of the scene and walked back to its ship to send a report. The distress beacon had claimed life in danger so recently, now only marked a grave. There was a place on a planet where a peace accord had been struck, despite the bitterness held by some. After the confused and disorganized fighting, it was widely celebrated. The two sides tentatively reached out, and finding each other so similar, grasping tightly, that they might never slip apart. A day to remember. A memorial was born. At this place on this planet, where the peace had finally been found, a monument was built. At first, it had confused many, for it was not a grand or glorious, nor was there any clear connection between the species other than a human sculpted by Arvine hands. It was a simple stone statue of a young man with a shovel, leaning back against the large stone block. On closer examination, one could notice a poorly bandaged wound on his stomach and a faint smile on his face. In explanation, there was a small plaque next to him. This is to remember the unnamed man who gazed upon a carelessness of death and willingly took up its weight. He was found on a forgotten planet in a little notice system where he brought dignity and honor to the undignified war. This 
is to remember those uncounted souls that we buried in our folly. To remember so that we may never again add to their ranks. Those who bought peace for others and paid in blood. To recognize that we buried our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters, together. For the dead whose war has ended, take a moment to remember their lives, spent with valor and distinction for a cause greater than themselves. Though gone, they live on in the world they've left behind. For the living whose wounds still bear down on them, rest for a moment with one who also understood, who knew what it was to carry a great weight. He may no longer be able to take another's burden, but perhaps he can still help lift it for a time. May we never again raise an arm in violence that doesn't carry justice in its fist. Later, a young woman would visit the memorial and recognize the contented expression from another time and another field. And through tears, another plaque was added to commemorate her once older brother, Edward T. Huxley. He would have been happy. He had never wanted to forget anyone either. End of story. Story number two. Glorious, written by Weijin Warrior. You should have seen it, one of the bar patrons vocalized, gesturing with several forelimbs. It was glorious! Well, up to a point. The colors, another intoned after putting an empty vessel down. The flapping banners in green and purple, the gleaming steel, the, the gore and blood. A voice from a corner interjected. The gleaming steel, the second patron repeated. The disciplined ranks of 10,000 soldiers bedecked with pink lace. Glorious, the first patron of green. Glorious and brave. Stupid, stupid and suicidal, the voice of the corner pointed out, ignored by the other patrons. Pink and violet, another patron hissed, all lined up in a geometrical perfection around the enemy stronghold. Magnificent. Not like their enemy, the first patron exclaimed. Who were dressed to hide? And hide they did. Aye, in the holes in the ground. Shameful, to hide where the 3D crews of half the galaxy were streaming directly. And the general, the first patron stated after emptying another glass. The bravado, the courage, as he walked out in front of his army. Oh, the taunts that he flung at the enemy for hiding. All legs spread wide, the hissing patron said. Four ray guns in his hands as he challenged the enemy commander. I recall it vividly, the second patron added. He had positioned himself so the light caught him, just so the 3D crews to capture the glorious detail. And then, the human in the corner said, as he stood up and tossed the glass on the floor, one of our boys put a bullet through both of his brains, and we dropped mortar rounds in the whole army which the stream showed in glorious detail, I might add. The rest of the patrons watched as the human strolled out, everyone taking a step back to give the biped more space. The first patron accepted a new drink from the bar spot. It was glorious, he repeated, up to a point. End of story. Story number one. I thought I saw you somewhere before. Written by Admiral Marsupial Three. Alan looked at the room he suddenly found himself in, and would have probably crapped himself if this wasn't a dream. He looked around the LSD-inspired fortress that reminded him of a D&D castle model he used as a kid that had been fed through a kaleidoscope. He could see row upon row of what could only be described as steampunk owls set to attention with weapons at their side. Alan turned to where they were all focused on their gaze and saw what must obviously be their leader. The glowing eyes and burning horns gave it away. The King Steam Elf Punk looked at Alan and spoke in a voice clearly inspired by every generic fantasy big bad leader ever. I have summoned you to my fortress to meet your doom once I have broken your body. 
I will use the Holy Spirit prison to rip out your soul, and I can torment it for the rest of time. The KSEP, as Alan had come to shortly to, drew a weird glowy sword that looked like it was made with glass and swung it at his head. Captain Alan Richards woke up. He decided that since he was awake now, he may as well check in with the bridge crew to see if there were any updates while he slept. And he knew Lieutenant Moore ran 40k sessions, and his dreams had given him an RPG fantasy itch. He checked if the ETA had changed. No, sir. We were about to wake you. One hour to target. He wondered what they would find at these mysterious coordinates in the void between the stars. All he knew was that one of those projects that he had never existed had found what could be the source of the mysterious psychic attacks that had plagued the galaxy for millennia. The Heike had been suffering particularly bad recently. They were considered humanity's closest allies, having lost the planet as a result of coming to humanity's aid during our first and so far only interstellar war. As a result of this, and humans' lack of psychic presence, Humanity had said they would pursue this for the high key, who wouldn't even be able to approach these coordinates without dying. What horror would they find in the void? Arkit emerged from the chronology scanner with a harsh gasp as he stunned look at his eyes. It couldn't be. How could such a chaotic primitive eight threaten the ancient Tuwu? Grand mechanical priest Arkit would have executed any biological being who said such a thing to him out loud, but even he couldn't question the holy time seer. He had seen a species his kind had never felt, only observed through the eyes of psychic cattle across the galaxy as the two fed. They were the one of the mundane races, no psychic powers, so of little interest to the two who, as they were not thought to be advanced or strong enough to be a threat. But the vision said the specific one would find the Tuwu homeworld. Tuwu Prime and its 13 colonies had remained hidden from the galaxy for 300,000 years, and who suspected its existence never even began to look for the right place. And the few that stumbled upon the right place path, through dumb luck, never survived long enough. If this human found them, others would follow quickly. The Time Seer had showed him these humans destroying the God Crystal of Mount Tila. If that happened, the psychic shock would kill most of the Tuwu on the homeworld instantly. The sudden discomfort of the God Crystal, along with the distance from the Harmony Choir on Tuwu Prime, would kill all those on the colonies, just slower and more painful. Arkit decided to end this problem now. It would have seemed a massively excessive use of force against such an undeveloped primate just hours ago, but he connected himself to the great dream snatcher, another one of the holy machines of the two. The strength of this vision had convinced him that humans were not to be underestimated, and it seemed to fit the divine plan. One holy machine to destroy the threat identified by another. No matter how great the warrior this human may be in his armor, with his weapons in hand, no matter how great a pilot he may be with his warship at his command, Arkland won. No matter how they would destroy him while awake, while they were asleep, he could teleport them to him, completely unarmed. He could then easily defeat them while he had all the advantages of his weapons, his armor, his troops. The Dream Snatcher hummed as it synchronized with Arkland's mind using the vision's figure burned in his mind to reach out to the attached soul, and allowed Arkit to drag even this mundane through the psychic plane to him. Arkit stared at the spot that had just contained the bipedal ape, prophesied to bring ruin to his people, one that after being summoned across the void of space against its will and surrounded by a thousand warriors and the grand mechanical priest, most powerful of the ancient Tuwu, and just looked around with a disinterested expression on its dopey-looking face, completely ignored his threat to tear out his soul, then disappeared unharmed as the soul prison hit him, the divine blade not tasting life essence upon being swung for the first time since its creation eons ago. Arkit was so stunned by this turn of events, he never noticed the proximity warning. Not quick enough, 
Anyway. End of story. Story number two. The Seven Deadly Strengths, written by Hilaria. In several human religions, there is a notion that there are seven deadly sins, which are vices that are considered immoral. However, I would argue that these emotions are not man's great sins, but strengths. Pride. In those religions, pride is the idea that one is worth more than they really are. But that idea is not without merit. It is with good reason that human engineers are amongst the most sought after in the galaxy. It is with good reason that humans have a near-perfect military record. It is with good reason humans can take pride in their work, not from an inflated ego, but from prior proven results. Greed Greed is the human desire for more, even if it would endanger or take away from someone else. Now, if a species is confined to one planet, with the very limited resources, this is terrible. However, now that humanity has reached the stars, there are now enough planets for every single human, Zlop, Tiru, and every other sentient being to each have their own planet, which creates near-limitless resources. Instead of hindering them, humanity's greed has led them to control vast swaths of resource-rich territory, turning them into an economic powerhouse. Lust. Lust is most commonly used to describe the desire for a sexual relationship with another human. It is, in short, what allows human colonies to grow exponentially large in a very short amount of time, going from a population of a few dozens to several billion in record times. It is also a key part of compassion, which we discussed in another interview. Envy. Envy is, in my opinion, the most important of the sins or strengths. It is the sentiment that this felt when human desires something that someone or something else has. Before humanity reached the stars, this was often confined to objects. Then humanity met the flying Zlop. And then humanity met the unaging Yeth. Then humanity met the Wazd. Gluttony. You may think that the desire to eat more couldn't possibly be a strength, and then you realize that there have been multiple cases of humans growing so large that their fat alone was enough to stop a bullet. Wrath. I don't see any Taruk around here. Do you? Sloth. In a third great galactic war, Admiral Trent of the human navy was so lazy that he routinely avoided traps by them drifting out of position before he arrived. Or, if the traps were manned, his enemies getting convinced that he must have gone around them. On a side note, have you seen an actual sloth? Those things should not exist. End of story. Story number three. Angels, written by a glass of whiskey. There had been foretelling, ancient tales of mystical beings, in appearance beyond comprehension to mortal minds. Sometimes, bringers of terrible wrath. Sometimes, a hand of help in desperate times. The land itself was shaped by their mere presence. Every person in the village lifted their eyes and beheld the being descending from the sky. His body was the color of the purest snow, face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs gleamed red by the color of the dawning sun. In everybody's minds, there was only one thought, one possible response. The being's voice was heavy as lead. I have come to... Ah, ah, would you... Ah, please, uh, could you... Ah, ju ju just stop screaming? Soft thuds were heard when they fell to the ground as lungs were expelled of air. Their brain shouldered the mantle of responsibility and continued to screaming internally, paralyzing them. Some of the small children who didn't understand what all the fuss was about now saw their parents falling down, for all the apparent reason killed by the foreign creature, and out of a mixture of fear and terror started to cry. Soft sobbing. Good! Now I have come to... <coughs> as soon as he started, the rest followed suit, until there was like an orchestra of badly played violins. Oh, for crying out loud, I give up! said the foreign creature and ascended again into the sky, after having spread its message of fear and terror. 
First contact would have to wait until another time. End of story. A new game written by Storm the Castle. Amon Durst, the communication officer. Say Lifkist, who has surprisingly few interactions with the humans that other humans referred to affectionately as a resident nerd. But what she had seen was confusing. While not physically imposing like many of the other creatures, honestly resembling their females more than what she knew their males looked like, he was nonetheless well regarded and commanded a certain amount of respect, even from a captain who commended the highest respect of the warrior turned worker Sai Li, or Kissy, as her co workers had started calling her. On top of that, he was a standoffish, frequently ducking others in order to do whatever it was he did. But when problems came up with the function of the ship, he was often the first called as opposed to the engineering where she worked. Moreover, he often ended up being the only one called, as he frequently resolved the issues. Whatever they were, more confusing still, he was stronger than her, stronger than the clan Ifa. Her people were one of the only that outsized humans in height and bulk, and while she wasn't the strongest of her species, she still boasted a warrior's prowess. However, one day she'd entered a physical improvement room on the ship earlier than usual, only to come across Amon as he lifted the impossible metal plates, as many on the ship did for exercise and recreation. He'd taken one look at her, rap and bolted, as though in fear which she should have understood if, following his departure, she had found herself unable to replicate the feat. Even with only three of the four arms she'd been born with still present, the fact that the tiny man had managed to trounce her in matters of strength drove her, as the captain would say, up the wall. However, she would now get a resolution to her confusion. Say, Lif had been driven from her home world for two reasons. One, She'd been mutilated in battle, but failed to die. By the captain, ironically, and so had no place amongst her people as a free citizen. Second, they had been born a mutant. The soft protrusions on her thoracic region, which took the place of otherwise hard and durable carapace that covered the rest of her, resembled the memories of human females. And since the clan Ifa had no tradition to cover up their chests, since they weren't supposed to have anything worth covering up, say lift often found herself being stared at by human males, their face red as they tried to reconcile her fairly human appearance with the fact that she didn't actually have the so-called memories. Amon, in particular, was susceptible to this quirk of her physiology, which she was now using to her advantage to more or less pin him in place. Two of her hands on the wall near the side of his head, and her remaining one on her hip, forcing him to look at either of her chest which he found fascinating, apparently, or a face, the two of which he had switching between regularly. Well, what, uh, 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 how, wow, you, you are something, I mean, um, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's going on, Kissy? he asked. Satisfied her mutations were finally doing something helpful for a change, Zaylif answered him. Human Ammon, I joined this crew because your captain defeated and mutilated me in the war between our species. It was the only place one of my sort could theoretically have come to, though, admittedly, I have expected to be a slave. Amon nodded his recognition, recalling the spectacle she made of herself when she first showed up. However, much to my consternation, I have come to the conclusion that you are regarded by the humans of the ship in much the same way as I regard the captain, in spite of the dramatic difference between you. I want to know why. Are you a warrior? Is your mind and physique some sort of deception? Why is it that you seem to command so much respect amongst your peers, in spite of the fact that you seem to be outclassed by them in every way? Oh, uh, is that all? He asked, seeming surprised. Actually, he and I... He stopped mid-sentence, and she could tell that he'd fallen into thought. Ammon's eyes narrowed, and he bared his teeth at her, which she had come to learn was a smile though its meaning could be just as malicious as it could be positive. This one felt malicious. Actually, what do you do for recreation, Kissy? He asked. Off put by the dramatic shift in topic, she nonetheless answered, though with a suspicious air to her. Even putting away in case he intended to attack, 
Nothing really. But the clan Ifa do not commonly practice recreation, preferring to make full use of the time we are given in service to our masters or people. Salif had found the stretches of time during which she had no assigned tasks maddening at first, but she had recently come to appreciate the peace and had taken up meditation. As the clan Ifa, consular, a wise man, would and had found it rewarding practice. For what do you ask? I've got a trade to offer for you. That's why. Salif was in a room with Ammon and fairly recently recruited operator Thrust, the chief of security, Mr. Neeson, and a young human male she didn't know, but had introduced themselves as Alan. In front of them was a computer screen preloaded with a series of information from a game that she had been asked to participate in. The trade Ammon had offered was as follows. He would tell her anything she wanted to know about himself and even the crew members, within the bounds of personal space, of course. And in exchange, she would participate in their game as their missing fourth player. The other three had apparently been playing with Ammon for almost six months, only for that tale to end and a new tale to require a fourth. Games in human society last months on end. Even their pastimes are incredible. No wonder we lost. Human Ammon, this game you call Jail and Lizards, Dungeons and Dragons, he corrected. Her translator was still saying the same thing, so she just mimicked him. Dungeons and Dragons. You say the purpose is to pretend to be a member of another species and act out the story, as though we were with this person, and it is unscripted? Correct. It's difficult to explain the draw. You either get it or you don't, and the only way to find out is to play. We can't play effectively without a fourth player, not until level 5 at least. So if you can come to our sessions, I'll tell you three things you want to know about anyone you want, myself included, so long as it isn't a violation of HIPAA. I see, she didn't actually. And this story, uh, this scary chair, Eldritch Throne, he corrected. Right, it is a story you wrote yourself and want us to play through, right? This won't make a lot of sense, but it's a combo of Lovecraft and high fantasy. I'll walk you through during the character creation. Silov was apprehensive about the game and its concept, that not at least of which was due to the fact that her people weren't known for having vivid imaginations, and another being that she didn't understand half of what was being said. However, her curiosity outweighed the her trepidations, and so she tentatively agreed, very well, but I will abide no snickering should I experience issues, and I demand you explain the list of races. Many seem human-based, and yet humans are apparently the last of them. What is this? Oh, those are just... A small human male attempted to answer, only for Mr. Neeson to cover his mouth. Extinct species, he answered, and the reaction from the two non-humans of the group was dramatic. Extinct? Austras, the Chitin. What do you mean? The powers listed for them are to possess their lifespans. How could such races be anything but dominant? A question Seelif wanted answered herself. The descriptions of some of the more human-like races, like elves and dwarves, were understandable, with longer lifespans or higher physical strengths. But the command of the others had a primordial forces called magic at their reading. In particular, the race called Tiefling, which resembled an elf psi of the greater elf empire, had her worried, and she resolved to investigate the elf Psy in private, to find out if they had powers and were in fact formerly fellow death wilders alongside humanity. That's cause humanity had two things none of them could compete with, numbers and progress, declared the thickly built man. His hand still slapped to cover what was perhaps his young spawn's face. But we outdeveloped them faster than we could compensate for, and those that didn't join the heredry line of humanity were wiped out. Ammon, a pained look on his face with a clenched fist illustrating her sorrow over the truth of humanity, said, A tragedy of our sordid past. Just imagine what we could have accomplished alongside the Draglins or the Nephilim had we but settled our differences peacefully. Mr. Neeson nodded solemnly, and both Russ and Seedliff could feel the tragic sorrow by the falling of their ancestors expressed here, and both joining the humans in a moment of silence for their loss. It wouldn't be the first time a sapient species had competed for dominance on its own world with another, resulting in the losing side being removed from history. But for this many races to have been lost, truly, 
humanity's ruthlessness was a terror to behold. Just as the compassion could be equal shocking. Now then, before that, Amon suddenly seemed to want to change the subject. What three questions do you have for me today? He asked. And she immediately answered with the three that had been burning her the longest. Yes, first, why are you regarded so highly on a crew that seems to value physicality? Second, how is it that you are so strong in spite of your physique? Finally, why does the captain defer to you so often, even when the issue is apparently an engineering issue? All right, here's the questions, here's the answers, he said, and stretched his neck. First, the captain and I were in the marines together. I was actually his superior officer. Then he had the rest of the crew put a lot of stock in my logistical and tactical insight. It saved more than a few of their lives in the past, including against you. I grew disillusioned with command and let him run the boat, but he still asked me for advice a lot. Second, I am a competitive bodybuilder. Humans consider physical strength to be a matter of competition and sport, but unlike bulkier competitors, I am not an eternal cut. My muscles are three times denser than a normal person, so the only crewmate who can outlift me is the captain, who is a professional strongman. A similar competition with different goals and practices. Finally, on top of what I told you earlier, the ship is fairly new age, and everyone knows that running it is a matter of software management more than anything, which I am specialized in. I can fix most of the ships remotely through bypassing a theoretical routing change. Slightly dazed by the sudden knowledge that the small human she'd all but written off was actually one of the strongest, most dangerous men on the vessel, say Lyft was quiet for the rest of the session, which was a planning phase for everyone's character. She chose an orcish wizard. What the hell do you mean my fireballs haven't recovered? We're just long rested, demanded a furious three-armed clan Ifa of a tiny steel muscle DM. Cthulhu's eyes on you, he shot back, just as hotly. You can't get long rest. You can't rest at all when an outer god who controls the dream realm is fucking glaring at you. Why is he looking at us? We have the protection of Hastar, don't we? You sold the golden statue. It was an effigy of the Yellow King, an effigy of Hastar. He doesn't have your back anymore. No one does. Captain Darius sighed as he watched the recording sent to him in an email titled, Another One Has Joined the Coven, from his buddy in engineering. Colonel Durst had apparently converted another one. First the bug, then the blue giant. God, it's like he wants to spread it to the whole damned galaxy. He frowned deeply. She'd sent him a box of hand-rolled cigars, ones she'd made herself, which happened to be his absolute favorite thing. How in the hell had she known about that? Then of story. Story number one. Humanity doesn't submit. Written by Fox Corp. Picture this. You're an aspiring emperor with a massive shoes to fill. Big guns, big money, big aspirations. Now stop imagining and learn of the crag and pure. They laid claim to the biggest empire ever known. With the biggest ship, the biggest guns, and a brand new emperor with unlimited power. After his father's death, Primus ruled Dolphus, so the eager ascended to the throne. It was from here that he began a relentless campaign of war against much of the known galaxy. And he won with every step. The ancients of Sagittarius, the wise of Norma, and the mighty of Perseus. Each had mighty fleet, but when faced with the fury of the crag battlecruiser, all surrendered to avoid terrible loss. When a small and disjointed union of systems within Orion was encountered, the Council of Emperor Rudolphus wasn't even called. Small strike groups were sent to make vassals of the mere hundreds of worlds controlled by, you guessed it, the humans. Before I get ahead of myself, let me explain how warfare commonly occurred within the Milky Way. Opposing fleets would meet each other on the battlefield, all lining up in an honorable display of might. The two fleets would approach in massive broadside lines, firing the full fury of their arsenal while still within visual range. This form of combat was intended to minimize the casualties of unpredictable stellar warfare and limit collateral damage. Not only that, battles often lasted only hours and wars only days. It was seen as cheaper to become a vassal to a superior force than to lose expensive trade. 
fleets attacked each other until one side was placed at an obvious disadvantage. After this, the losing fleet would surrender and retreat for repairs. This process repeats until the winning fleet reaches a substantial system from which the losing fleet doesn't retreat, finally fully surrendering. In most cases, this is the end of hostilities. Now, these tactics weren't used during the first contact, but played a critical role in the Crag Human War. The galaxy had never seen war last more than a year. No doctrine ever foresaw a possibility of such a horrid war. Logistics were planning accordingly, only enough for a minor conflict with minimal casualties. No one, not even the first contact species, was willing or able to fight a substantial conflict. The mentality of most species was simple. Strike first, strike fast, and don't get struck. From every world, only those who had adapted to such strategies would thrive, and the tactics of galactic nations reflected this. Humanity went in an entirely different direction from the beginning. It was as if they had forged to be perfect machines of war. It didn't matter if a human was struck. If they struck first, or if they were slow to act, any species that challenged humanity was destined for if you struck them, they would strike you with everything they had, giving no regard to casualty, only wishing to spite your attempt to come out victorious. After sacrificing everything, they would strike you over and over until your ability to fight was completely shattered, and your empire left a smoldering ruin. As soon as the Crag Imperium decided to attack humanity, their fate had been sealed. Humanity sacrificed every last ship within the system called the Haven just to prevent the capture of the planet Bastion. The sub-faction of humans living within the system were outcasts from the authoritarian nation-state within the greater banner of the United Nations of Man. The freedom-loving humans fought to the last in a spiteful attempt to prevent their capture, and it succeeded with a terrible cost. The small subjugation fleet was destroyed in full but the humans lost over one million souls for every ship they managed to destroy. I will now play a recording of what is now widely regarded as the most influential speech of all time, the Promise of Vengeance speech, delivered by then-President Julian Starman of the Free State of Bastion. When we gaze to the stars, humanity has always seen a land of endless opportunity. After the tragic events today, only fear and uncertainty can be seen. When unknown vessels come to our bastion of liberty, we attempt to greet these aliens with all of the hospitality, generosity, and kindness humanity can give. We received only a torrent of plasma once our diplomats reached visual range. Long-range communications picked up only these words in response. Do you submit? The answer was no. Ships began to fire from longer ranges towards our planet. They fired indiscriminately, seemingly going so far as to target civilians. Our brave defenders charged their fleet time and time again until all that remained of these aliens were burning heaps of steel. 15,275,300 and 95 of our citizens were killed. Millions more are still missing. 99% of the deaths were civilian, even as we fought them in the void of space. Their weapons continued to fire towards the helpless on the surface. Even as our ships split theirs clean in two, they kept repeating, Do you submit? We would only respond with gun. Their cries got more and more desperate, yet they never ceased their bombardment. To anyone who can hear this, Mastion will not submit. Humanity will not submit. Our ships will not submit. Until every last individual involved in the deaths of innocent civilians have been brought to justice. No matter how long it takes, no matter how many of these aliens get in the way, justice will be achieved. Let it be known, well, the cosmos, humanity will never submit. 
It took hundreds of years to truly manifest, but the effects of the speech reverberated through the Milky Way for the rest of time. Humanity turned its loose union of independent planets into a singular entity, focused on the protection of all mankind. The Krag Imperium resisted, of course. Thousands of the mightiest ships in the galaxy rampaged through human space for decades, but each eventually fell to death by a million cuts. Humans could lose billions of people, thousands of ships, and dozens of systems, yet the resource strain was simply too much for the Krag Imperium to bear. The previously loyal vassals sprang up in rebellion, turning the Imperium's fleet against itself. Internal opposition within Krag systems wrought havoc upon the Emperor's ability to control his population, and many dozens of worlds declared themselves independent. All the while, humanity festered and grew strong. The wreckage of the Krag ships was broken down and scrutinized for every last atom by human scientists eager to learn their secrets. It wasn't long before the reverse engineering secrets of the once mighty empire came to cast destruction upon the last remaining crag battle groups in human space. Primus Rudolphus the Eager could only watch in terror as the ancients of Sagittarius, the wise of Norma, and the mighty of Perseus, alongside their new found human allies, charged into the crown system. His once mighty and revered fleets, still clinging to their honor-bound doctrine of warfare, were cut down like a field of grass. He could only sit on his throne in shame as a human strike group infiltrated his palace and stormed the royal chamber. As he was dragged off to his throne in chains, he stared towards the great murals and portraits of past emperors, wondering if he would be the last. When standing trial for his crimes, he asked the now old and decrepit president, Julian Starman, Why, didn't you just submit like all the rest? Julian Starman mastered this as a response. Submission is the acceptance of defeat. There was still light at the end of our tunnel. As long as even one human remains alive in this galaxy, that light will never go out. Humanity will never accept defeat. And if humanity remains undefeated, humanity shall never submit. Prisoner Rudolphus the Shameful lived out the rest of his days in a prison situated in orbit of Bastion. Every day that passed, he would stare at the ever-growing lights on the surface and slowly come to terms with the fact that his reign was over. The era of humanity had begun, and his was but a footnote within the history of humanity's ascendancy to the stars. End of story. Story number one. When the gods stopped singing. Written by Hicks Kem. The gods have long watched over our world. Every child knows the comfort and tranquility of falling asleep under the night sky. Seeing our many gods twinkling as they pass over. Crossing the wide star paths in their own unique ways. We know them not to be stars themselves because the ancients struck their path and saw how they wove between them. As they watched over us for hundreds and thousands of years, a few of our wisest souls sought to know them better. They learned to shape glass to bring the light closer, that we might see the true shape of God. They shared the gift with the people, and we saw their gleaming wings drinking up sunlight and moonlight and starlight. Sometimes, when the gods saw us seeking them through the curved glass, they would shake their little starlight off at us, in beautiful reds and blues and greens and whites. And for a time, it was good. The years went, and the wiser souls turned to the shaping of metal into ears, for surely, if the working of glass would allow people to see faces of the gods, surely other workings might let people hear their voices. And so the wisers toiled for years and years, and at long last they learned to listen well. At first they heard only chirps and beeps, as though the gods were calling like the many feathered flyers across the land. And so the people came to treat the flyers with respect, for surely the voices of the gods matched those of the flyers, then the flyers must be revered as well. And still the wisest toiled and searched, 
seeking ever deeper truths in the gods. And when at last the people had grown and raised children with respect for the flyers and peace in their hearts, did they at long last hear the secret melodies hidden behind the chirps and beats? They listened to the beautiful, powerful, ethereal music of the gods, the songs that played endlessly to any who wished to listen. The people learned to capture this music and repeat it back for each other, and cities rose to the sounds of joyous song. And for a time, it was good. The people learned to create their own music in offering to the gods, and again, the wisest one worked and toiled and learned to speak with the voices of the many gods and sent their songs up to them in gratitude and adoration. The gods, hearing the wonderful songs the people given so freely, took the songs and wove them into their own, and the gods and the people sang together for many glorious years. As the people sang new songs to the gods, so too did the gods sing more songs to the people. And the wisest listened and learned from these new songs, and lifted themselves up from the land, and explored beneath the black water, and found all the wonders of their world that the gods hinted at. And the people sang new songs of the new wonders, and the gods twinkled with joy in the skies, and sang ever brighter songs for the people. And for a time... It was good, until suddenly it wasn't. Bright rage burned through the skies from the darkness beyond the gods and struck the people's homes. The rage roared, drowning out the voices of the gods, leaving people alone in the darkness. The rage lashed out at the gods and turned their forms mortal, casting burning, flaming, metallic god flesh down into the world. And the gods stopped. Singing. No more could the people hear the voices of the gods, nor could they see them in their beds. And with the falling of the gods, the gates of hell opened above, and demons in the service to the rage poured from the blackness of the sky, and the demons sowed such suffering that the people knew the harvest of souls would soon be a great bounty for the demons. The wisest of the people took on the aspects of the bravest of the people and worked in hidden places where the demons had not yet found them. And they, they composed one last song to beg for intervention of any god that yet remained to listen. They cast the song upwards into the skies, a mournful, heartbreaking song, part desperate pair, part requiem. And as the song left the lands, the demons found the last hidden place and destroyed the singing machines, the wisest. Boom. There would never again be a song to the gods, the people. And so the people despaired, bowing to the demons that they might spare the children or elders some small bit of... The people cried silent that night at the loss of their gods and of their dignity and of their souls to the rage and its demons from the blackness beyond one's home of the lost gods. Then, in the darkest of night, as the demons cackled over the sorrows of the peoples, the gods returned with a mighty and powerful song, and every city and village heard every singing box awaken to the new songs of the vengeful gods. Above, the gods' bodies were larger and brighter and stronger than before, and the gods sent legions of their angels down upon the world to stand among the people. Pillars of holy flame struck the ground and gave way to reveal towering figures holding implements of wrath of many gods. And with these implements, the angels wrapped the god flesh metal laid waste to the demons, placed themselves between the people and their oppressors, and soaked in the rage of the demons as though it were nothing to them. And the angels, so filled with fury at the demons' treatment of the people, cast aside their implements of wrath and tore at the corrupt flesh with divine and righteous strength. The bravest of the people stepped forward 
and worked to lift the implement from the dirt, that they might aid these angels. And so, with the people finding their souls restored by the presence of the divine, they joined against the demons, and with the oldest of the god songs rising from every voice, they yet drew breath, angels and people crushed and broke the demons. When the fighting was done, the angels stripped away the god flesh coverings and showed their true forms. The people looked at these strange angels with their faces so different, and yet somehow familiar, and sang a song of thanks. The angels, holding up the tiniest of gods close, spoke strange quiet sounds, and the tiny gods sang the words to the people. We are humans, and you're safe now. And with no more words, the angels put back their god flesh upon their bodies and rose away on their pillars of flame to hunt demons across the stars. And as they left, the larger, wrath-filled bodies of the gods returned to the joy, light, singing bodies of the people had loved and lost and finally regained. And the song sang a new song to them, mixed with all their old familiar ones. When you are ready... We will be waiting. End of story. Story number two. Preventative maintenance written by Joe2 underscore zero. Would you stop oiling that thing? It's got to be half a thousand cycles old. No amount of oil is going to keep it going. The youngest Volcor among them said, waving its hand at the point fifty BMG machine gun that sat foremost in the sandbag in place. One of their Terran auxiliaries looked up from his much newer looking battle rifle. Excuse me, he said, but did I just hear you talking shit about Ma? The Volker looked confused as the grayer muzzle around him chuckled. The Terran continued, I'll have you know that Ma, sweet old Darlene over there, has carried us through thick and thin, so I think you ought to apologize. The young Volker blinked, unsure as to what had just happened. Instead of an apology the Terran had demanded, he replied flatly, It's a gun. The Terran growled. He had never heard a Terran growl, and it was among the most disconcerting things that he had heard from any of them attached to his company. She may well be a gun, but she's our gun, goddammit, so you apologize to Ma, or I swear I'll put some sense into your mutt. The young Volker was startled by the Terran's arguments, and he complied, He's almost centaur-like form sliding over to the heavy machine gun and muttering a short apology. Now kiss her cheek, the Terran said, and the Volcor shot him a look to kill, but the Terran just smiled smugly, lacking any of other resource. He pressed his muzzle up against the M2's faded but well-oiled side receiver, where the parkerization was nearly gone, and made a smacking noise. Hey guys! The shout caught him off guard as he jumped up. It was their assistant gunner. A Volcor, nearly younger than himself. I found the headspace gauges. He sat on his haunches, dumbfounded. It had to be a coincidence. Just dumb luck. He looked over at the Terran, who just looked even more smug than before. Told ya! End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.